Barbecue Blunder, Book 3 of the Camping Girl Cozy Mystery Series, written by Josephine Bintema, narrated by Josephine Bintema. Chapter 1. August. I eyed the enemy. It was big, green, and smelly. It was past time to drain the swamp. Are you sure you don't want me to do it? asked a concerned Bertie Sellers. Bertie had loaned me the two big hip waders that I now wore. I had stuffed extra socks into the toes of the boots so that they would somewhat fit. Correction, I had put socks down one boot. The other boot had fit over my air cast, which I was now allowed to walk on for small distances since I had broken my ankle last month. I eyed the algae mess at the Happy Camper Resort pool and took a deep breath. While Bernie's offer to do this for me was sweet, he was also elderly, and letting him drain the swimming pool was a risk I was not willing to take. I can do this. Taking careful steps down the pool ladder, I reflected that I hadn't expected to get up close and personal with the pool problem when I had inherited my grandmother's derelict campground a couple of months ago. However, money constraints had me dealing with the issue, rather than hiring someone to take care of the swimming pool. Slowly, I was improving the happy camper resort, trying to restore the campground to the condition I remembered during my childhood visits. Something slipped past me in the water, and I jumped, glaring at the offending frog. Here! Bernie leaned over, extending a pole that was shaped specifically to open the drain at the bottom of the end of the pool. The drain is over at the deep end! Near the middle! Great! I mustered up a smile, took the pole, and carefully moved through the sludgy water. Truthfully, I should have taken care of the pool a while ago. At the time, I had felt that the leaking roofs, crumbling boardwalk, and cleaning the beach area by the lake were more important. Now I needed to get this done, as the camping season was in full swing, and visitors to my campground expected a pool to be available in the sweltering heat. The reviews from my campground were starting to reflect this, and I couldn't afford the negativity. Swatting away some knots, I winced as the water started getting closer to my waist. At five foot two, I was not exactly the tallest of people. The hip waders were hitched under my armpits. The suspenders had been intricately tied to make up for my lack of height. While it was not full, the pool was getting deeper than I would like. You're getting close, called out Bertie. You should be able to feel around with your foot and find it. Searching blindly through the opaque water, I carefully towed the bottom of the pool, trying to feel for an indent where the drain might be. To your left, shouted Conrad, adjusting his glasses. It's to the right, corrected B, hands on her ample hips as she watched from the edge of the pool. A crowd of voices disagreed with one another as I shuffled around through the swampy pool near the center of the deep end. There. I stopped, feeling with my foot an indent and what felt like something sticking up just a little. Ignoring the group of onlookers, I dunked my pole into the water and did my best to locate the drain with it. Sliding, angling, rotating, finally the pole clicked into place. Did you find it? questioned an anxious birdie. I found it, I replied. Taking the bent pole with both hands, I shoved on it. Remember? "'Righty tidy, lefty Lucy chimed in Thelma from the crowd that had gathered to watch the pool be drained. I sighed, ignoring them. While I would take advice when warranted, I was an adult and knew the basics of opening a drain. Pushing and straining, I fought against the drain which did not budge. Finally, I looked up at Bertie. "'Is there a trick to it?' "'Are you sure the pole has latched on?' he wondered. "'I felt it click into place.' I gestured to the pole, which now stood upright on its own, now that it was hooked into the drain cap. It should just turn, a confused birdie said. Maybe it's stuck, advised Conrad. He pursed his lips and fingered one of his suspenders. Despite the heat, Conrad still wore a button-up shirt and faded dress pants. It has been a few years since anyone has tried to open the pool. You might need some muscle to help you, chimed in Thelma. Great, I muttered eyeing the offending pole which would not budge. Grabbing it again, I pushed with everything I had until I felt my bad ankle twinge, and I decided I did not need to re-injure myself. With a huff, I let go and stood back. Maybe there's a way to get more leverage? You should have let me do it, nodded Bertie. A little thing like yourself doesn't have enough muscle. I wanted to point out that while Bertie was taller, he was also no longer used to physical labor. 
The most he did was comb the beaches with his metal detector. Instead, I bit my tongue. Need a hand? asked a male voice before I heard a splash into the pool. Topher stood in his swim trunks, his thin pale form looking in disgust at the algae that surrounded him. This is grosser than I thought. Topher, I said in dismay, you shouldn't be in here. It's not exactly hygienic. Topher had a sheepish shrug as he slogged toward me through the sludge. If we get this done quickly, I can get hosed off. Okay, I agreed reluctantly. I really did need the help, and he was here now. Topher had come to the campground last month with a group of friends to camp in tents for a week. The friends had left, but Topher stuck around. He was starting to become a staple of the community, playing checkers and backgammon with the older gentlemen. I wondered how long he planned on lingering, yet, since he was paying for his site faithfully and I needed the revenue, I was not about to kick him out. We both pushed on the pole, and slowly it began to budge. "'Come on, we got this!' encouraged Topher, putting more of an effort into turning the pole. "'Don't break it!' cautioned Conrad. "'We don't have another pole, and no one sells them anymore!' It's stuck. Push a little harder, grunted Topher, muscles straining. I put everything I had into it, and suddenly the pole gave way. Unbalanced, I took a step forward too far, and green slimy water slushed over the edge of the hip waders, oozing down my body. Oh, my word, I squeaked. It was cold and uncomfortable. Everyone was clapping, and I looked back to see Topher holding the pole and drain plug aloft like a prize. It's unplugged, grinned Topher. Now what? You have to strain the pool, Bertie held up a couple of nets. Get all the debris out. I have got some garbage bags ready. You're kidding me, I looked at him in shock. I thought I would just unplug the pool and it would be drained. No one said anything about staying in the swampy goo any longer than necessary. If you don't, the drain hole will plug up and be useless, shrugged an unapologetic Bertie. If the pipe gets plugged, it will take a plumber to get the water moving again, and could cost a lot of money. Holding in a frustrated sigh, I waded to the edge of the pool. Bertie handed me a net. Topher grabbed one, too. Topher, you really don't need to do this, I assured him. He was a paying guest. You should get cleaned up before you catch something from the algae. It's all good, smiled Topher boyishly as he scooped a pile of muck up with his net. I can't let you battle the frogs alone. I shuddered. I hoped frogs were the only wildlife that we were about to encounter. If this were anything that even resembled a snake or spider, I was going to be out of this pool faster than an Olympic track medalist. We scooped for the better part of an hour, getting all the nasty, decaying leaves out of the pool. Topher happily evicted the majority of the frogs. Finally, we crawled up the ladder. Bertie and Topher helped me to shed the two big hip waders. Thankfully, the majority of the crowd had departed, going about their business. Bored by the sight of us repeatedly, handing up pails of debris to be dumped in the dumpster by Bertie. I am going to have a shower, I sighed. My foot hurt, and all I could smell was the swampy water on me. Hose me down, a cheerful Topher asked of Bertie, who happily complied, aiming a garden hose at him. Thank you for your help. I waved to both of them before grabbing my cane, courtesy of one of the many senior citizens who graced my campground. I made my way to my vintage camper. It was a Shasta trailer, of dubious years that had held up pretty well over time. Last month I had managed to get the leaky roof solved. Now I had settled quite comfortably into the old camper that my grandmother had left me, along with her two Boston Terriers, Cupcake and Cookie. The camper was painted a cheery green and yellow. I had two blue Muskoka chairs to welcome me on the tiny lot that was bordered by blue, pink, and purple flowers. I had spent a lot of my summers at the Happy Camper Resort with my grandmother while growing up. We had fallen out of touch, which is why it had been a surprise when, after her death, I had inherited everything of hers, including the outstanding and delinquent bills. Grandma had not been the best with finances, yet now the tourist season was going full swing, I was finally making headway on the overdue bills. Topher had convinced me to get an automated reservation system. His friend had set me up with a new computer and program, all for wholesale price as long as I left him a great review. I was happy to do so, considering what I would have spent on a program far more pricey and complicated. The reservation software had been steadily filling spots in the campground as fast as my new electrician, Evan Miller, had been able to replace the electrical outlets at each lot. With a steady stream of revenue, things were looking up. It helped that my best friend Molly and I had started a catering business called Happy Catering, 
we baked out of the licensed kitchen at the Happy Camper Resort and delivered all over the nearby town of Oaks Crossing. Plus, we had tapped into a few customers here at the resort as well. On Saturdays, we manned a baking booth at the local farmer's market, which took over the park in the center of town. For the first time in a while, I felt like I had a little breathing room in my finances. Too bad I couldn't breathe in too deep right now, I reflected, sniffing the stench of the swamp on my clothes. Once I had showered, I grabbed my basket full of dirty laundry. The campground boasted a miracle of seven working dryers and one broken one. The problem was the washers. The second last working washer had quit the previous week, leaving the one working washing machine very overworked. It had gotten so bad, B had drawn up a chart for the regular camper so that everyone would have their turn to get clean clothes. My initials were slotted for this afternoon, and after two weeks without laundry, I was happy to get my spot. Walking into the laundry room, I noticed the washing machine was happily running, as was a single dryer. I plunked my basket onto the folding table and looked at the schedule, wondering if I had mixed up the time. Right there, in black and white, were my initials. I. C. T. I frowned as I realized the washing machine still had 27 minutes on the cycle time. Someone had just started a load. The owner of this place really needs to get the washing machines fixed, a voice behind me said. Better yet, replace the almond and whatever green that is grandma's appliances. I'm surprised they don't have a ringer attached. Startled, eyes turned to see a suntanned, middle-aged man grab a filthy t-shirt, tossing it into the large plastic laundry sink. He flipped graying brown hair out of his bearded face as he grabbed a scrub brush and began scraping mud off of faded denim jeans into the nearby garbage. Um, I collected my thoughts away from the stranger. I'm the owner. I'm also scheduled to be doing my laundry right now. He straightened up, looking down at me. Raising an eyebrow in amusement, he shook his head. He might be the owner, but you need to take your turn, just like the rest of us. I pasted an insincere smile on my face. Those are my initials on the schedule. ICT stands for Ivy Cherise Thurman. Bearded guy paused. Dropping the jeans into the tub, he turned to face me fully. Placing his hands on his hips, his lip ticked up in a slightly amused look. Huh, this is not a funny coincidence. Excuse me? I was not in the best mood. My foot was sore, and I really just wanted clean clothes. The way the heat had been acting up lately, I had been going through my wardrobe a lot, trying to stay dry and clean. The air conditioning unit in my camper was not working, nor was it available at the clubhouse or office, and fans were not cutting the muggy air. I needed clean clothes, or I would be living in my bathing suit soon. He held out a hand, dirty from the mud he had been removing from his jeans. Ivan Carlton Thomas. The washing machine is reserved for regulars, I pointed at the sign on the door. I haven't seen you around here before. That's because I'm usually working, noted Ivan, keeping a waiting hand out in greeting. I assure you I do pay my rent on time. I just happen to put it in your mail slot rather than handing it over in person. I have lot 13. Oh, I deflated a little bit as I took his proffered hand. Nice to meet you. You as well, grunted Ivan. When are we getting new washing machines? when I can afford them, I remarked dryly, dropping his hand. Limping back to the schedule, I looked at the grid, hoping to find my name somewhere in B's fancy script. Otherwise, I was going to have to use the coin laundry in town, which I really didn't want to do. I was on a tight budget and preferred to keep my cash for groceries since I loved to eat. Look, I will do you a solid, decided Evan, eyes crinkling. You can throw your laundry in with mine. I'd pre-wash all the nasty stuff anyway, so it shouldn't get any grease on your things. Just make sure you get all your stuff out when done. I really can't wear any of your thongs. Hmm, your offer is just so tempting, I murmured, pretending to think about it. Potential grease stains and underwear theft. I will pass. Grabbing my basket, I thumped along with my cane, heading for the exit. As I left, I could hear him chuckle. See yourself, princess. Jerk. I muttered under my breath. Making my way to Bee's trailer, I dumped my heavy laundry basket on her patio table before taking a seat. You look fit to be tied. Bee pursed her lips, setting down the latest crime novel she was reading. She had on a bright new red lipstick. I guess she and Thelma had gone shopping for makeup. Her white hair was neatly combed into a straight short bob, and I wondered if she was wearing mascara. 
Are you wearing eyeshadow? I asked, looking at her curiously. V blushed. Just a little. Now, never you mind. I want to know what's got you in such a tizzy. Privately, I wondered if B had a crush on someone. Deciding I would get the details out of Thelma later, I sighed. When you made the washing schedule, did you remember there are two people in the campground with the initials I.C.T.? B's face scrunched up before it cleared in realization. Oh, you must have met Ivan. Yes, I muttered darkly. B laughed in amusement. He's a bit of a pill, but when you two get to know him, he's a good fellow. He's a jerk, I repeated my earlier words to myself. He keeps the lawns mowed and trimmed, advised B. I wouldn't get on his bad side. The campground lawnmower is older than me, and Ivan keeps it running. I had wondered who was the man with a death wish who mows the lawn at five in the morning. I cocked my head to the side, remembering how I hadn't been impressed to be woken so early. Even Cookie and Cupcake had barely raised an eye, just growling a little and stretching out to try to get some more sleep before the lawnmower had gone by. Now, Ivy, tissed B. Ivan works two jobs and helps out here. He's a busy man. Well, he's using the washing machine, I grumbled. I suppose I will have to use the one in town. Or you could get an appliance person out to see what is really wrong with them machines, a pert B replied. They're as near old as the lawnmower. A lot of things are old around here, I sighed. However, I'm doing the best I can. This weekend we are booked full. Once I have the money from that, I can get a washing machine or two fixed, which will help a lot. However, we all need to make do until then. Ivy! hollered Molly as she came up the dirt road. I waved, waiting for her to come over. You will never believe it, danced Molly in excitement as she grinned. We have the biggest order ever! What is it for? A wedding? A birthday? I asked hopefully. Our fledgling catering business could use all the publicity we could get. The more people who came to the event and sampled our baking, the more likely we were to get future orders. Even better, exclaimed Molly in delight. The mayor has asked us to bake for his booth at the barbecue fest happening in town this weekend. Whitcomb wants to hand out cupcakes to the kids as he smoozes their parents for votes in his election campaign. He wants us to bake the cupcakes? I questioned in growing excitement. This is big. Can we put up a sign saying we baked them? Better than that, we get to do the entire display. It's only for our cupcakes, squealed Molly. We can put up a sign, leave our business cards, and make it as pretty as we want. All he asks is that we use green icing to match his campaign. I was thinking a cascade of different greens. Wait. I put the brakes to our enthusiasm. Are we the only ones baking? Just how many cupcakes are we talking about? Oh, a few, shrugged an unconcerned Molly. We're going to make bank. For this weekend? That's not that far away, I gulped, wondering just what my friend had gotten us into. How many cupcakes did Mayor Whitcomb order, Molly? Twenty-four, revealed Molly in an offhand manner. Twenty-four dozen? I relaxed. We could pull off two hundred and eighty-eight cupcakes easily. Twenty-four hundred, smiled Molly. I told you we are going to make some serious cash. I groaned. Laundry was going to have to wait. Chapter 2. Working Hard Hi, thee! I paused as a person walked up to me. This time it was a mother of four, dragging her two youngest with her while the other two children lugged beach chairs, towels, toys, and whatever else Mom had deemed necessary to take to the lake. I pasted on a smile. Hi, can I help you? I certainly hope so, she puffed, a perfectly manicured hand wiping her bleached hair out of her face. Her locks had seen a straightener recently, unlike my own unruly locks which were frizzing due to the humidity. When will the pool be open? <laughs> when it's full of water, I sweetly replied. We are doing the best we can. In fact, I had a chore chart recently displayed in the office. Full-time residents of the campground could keep their rents lower by signing up for tasks which helped me out since I wouldn't need to hire anyone to get the extra work done. It was all smaller things so that none of my residents would find it too strenuous since most of them were senior citizens. Right now, I knew Bertie, Lenny, and Oliver were cleaning the pool with some old brooms, biodegradable soap, and a couple of garden hoses. Once it was clean and the equipment was inspected by the pool guy I had coming, then we would fill it. 
this campground is really lacking, she told me in a disapproving voice. I'm going to put this on my Instagram account. When you booked, you acknowledged that there was no pool available. I had made it a requirement of the booking program so that I wouldn't have to explain it over and over again to temporary campers. This is ridiculous. It's August, she huffed. The pool should be open. I'm very sorry, I smiled. I hope you have fun at the lake. Giving me a last glare, she hustled the kids down the path. Ivy! What now? I muttered. I had just come to check if I had any more cupcake pans in my camper, plus grab any ingredients I needed before Molly and I started our cupcake-making marathon. I paced the smile back in place and turned to find Evan Miller walking towards me. The electrician was in black tee and shorts, carrying a small bag of supplies. His auburn hair glinted in the sun, and his friendly green eyes crinkled at the corners. How's it going today? I'm about to throttle my friend Molly for making me bake in a super-hot kitchen. I relaxed, grinning. How is your day going? Another three lots ready as soon as the grass is mown. Another ten to go before starting on the regular camping lots. It sure is muggy, acknowledged Evan, looking toward the sky. I bet it will storm later tonight. I hope so, I murmured. Maybe we'll take the heat with it. I could look at the air conditioning in the clubhouse, offered Evan. Then you might be a little more comfortable while you do your baking. I hesitated. It was a great offer, and I was very tempted. I wish, but the priority is the lots. We are booked up for the weekend, and I would hate for anyone not to have electricity at their site. No worry, I will get the lots done, Evan assured me. Don't work so hard you get heat stroke. You too, I told him with a smile. I watched Evan go down the path for a moment before going to my camper. He was a nice guy and a hard worker. I rather thought it might be nice to go on a date with a guy like him although part of me wondered if I was just attracted to the fact that he had skills that would come in very handy at the campground. The image of Detective Armand came into my head, banishing Evan Miller. Luca Armand was the local homicide detective and could be considered handsome with his tan, sun-kissed looks and blue eyes. He and I had burgers while we discussed the case of Bart Baker when Baker had died in the Tasty Treats Bakery. That had happened last month, and he hadn't called me since. While the idea of going on a date with Evan was nice, the idea of dating Luca was a rather exciting thought. One which was probably not going to happen since we had a bad habit of figuratively butting heads. Rolling my eyes at my own absurdity, I grabbed whatever I could out of my camper that I thought might be useful for making the crazy order of cupcakes which Molly had accepted. We were going to be doing a lot of baking. Shoving my ingredients and cupcake tins in a bag, I made my way back to the kitchen where Molly was already mixing up a batch of batter. I can't believe you did this. I shook my head at her. This is a lot of cupcakes. The good thing is that since the barbecue fest is going, there won't be any farmer's market this weekend, pointed out Molly. We don't need to bake our other food booth because everything is going to be taken over by the food eating competition and the other events. Food eating competition? I said in surprise. Do you not read the flyers from the town? huffed Molly. They are going to have some serious competitions. A few of the contestants are world champions both in the food eating competition and in the barbecue competitions. It's a big deal, and thousands are coming to town this weekend because of this festival. You should have heard about it. I groaned. I am too busy running a campground. Well, getting some extra money from the good mayor of Oaks Crossing will help, chirped Molly as she put cupcake sleeves in the tray. Boy, it sure is hot in here, grunted Chaz Bison as he pulled an industrial-sized fan into the kitchen from outside. Chaz? I questioned, giving Molly a look of concern. Can I help you? Chaz owned the Mighty Oaks Christian Campground. The town of Oaks Crossing was situated on a lake. The lake was surrounded by four campgrounds, a golf course with a resort, and a nature reserve forest. Molly had a thing for Chaz, despite the fact the tall, ginger-haired man was a devout Christian. By contrast, Molly had a checkered past, wild blue balayage hair, a nose piercing, a butterfly tattoo, and expertly done makeup. Molly mentioned the two of you were going to do some baking, and I thought it might get a little hot in the kitchen, an innocent Chaz mentioned. I had an extra fan lying around, so I thought I would bring it here, and hopefully both of you can use it. That's very nice of you, I replied, pleased that he was so thoughtful. However, I was a little concerned that Molly and he were spending quite so much time together. I had previously warned her that it might not be a good idea to pursue Chaz, 
but Molly didn't seem to be listening. Isn't it? sweetly smiled Molly. Chaz is thoughtful like that. Chaz shrugged, obviously uncomfortable with the gratitude. I just like to help out where I can. Thank you, I responded. We really do appreciate it. Is over here okay? asked Chaz, angling the fan toward us. Perfect, Molly practically purred. I tried not to choke on my astonishment. Molly was a flirt, but this was laying it on thick. Chaz just smiled. He plugged in the large fan, flipping the switch on the machine to get it started. The blades rumbled before suddenly everything went dark in the kitchen. What happened? cried Molly. Old electrical systems, I spoke dampeningly. Just another thing to get fixed. It probably just overloaded the circuit, mentioned Chaz, switching off the fan. He took out his phone, using the flashlight app. I can flip the breaker and you'll be back in business. We waited while Chaz found the breaker panel. Soon enough, electricity was restored. Thank goodness. Relieved, I sorted out ingredients for a recipe. For a moment, I thought we were going to have to cancel the order for the mare. Don't talk such nonsense, warned Molly. We are going to do this. Have a little faith, Ivy, a pleasant Chaz encouraged as he came back with an extension cord, plugging in the fan again. I'm sure with a little help, everything will work out in the end. I sat myself on a kitchen stool. Pulling another stool close, I propped up my ankle. 2,400 cupcakes is a lot to bake. Then it's good you'll have some help, nodded Chaz as he turned on the fan. The lights went out again. I took in a stabilizing breath. A lot of circuits appear to be overloaded. I should probably get Evan to have a look at it. However, I can't afford that just yet. Don't worry, a confident Chaz said. I'll just flip the next breaker. At some point, we'll find an outlet that has enough juice to run the fan. As Chaz left again, I put on my own phone flashlight. Eyeing Molly, I kept adding ingredients to my bowl. So, how did Chaz decide to come by and drop off a fan? I may have met him in town shortly after talking to the mayor, shrugged Molly. I guess I was just so excited to have the order, I blabbed the whole thing to Chaz. He knew that we don't have air conditioning here, and he just volunteered the fan. He's nice like that. He is nice, I agreed. I felt there might be a little more to the story than what Molly was telling me, but decided not to press for now. If Chaz was going to loan us a fan, then who was I to complain? Just make sure you don't abuse his generosity. Hey, pouted Molly. Give me a little credit. The lights came back on. Third time is the charm, smiled Chaz as he returned. I was not holding my breath as he flipped the switch to turn on the fan yet again. This time, though, the lights stayed on and the fan rumbled continuously, moving the hot and humid air. Success, grinned Chaz as he eyed Molly, who was smiling back. I cleared my throat. Thank you, Chaz. We appreciate it. Well, I suppose I better get back to the Mighty Oaks, Chaz acknowledged, lingering just a little. Things to do. Are you going to the barbecue fest? blurted Molly. Yeah, Chaz perked up. I actually compete with a group from my campground. We usually do okay in the barbecue burgers category. This year, I think I have perfected the recipe. We could use another helper if you're interested. All our proceeds go to charity. I would love to help, confirmed Molly. Great. I will text you the details, beamed Chaz. He gave me a wave. See you later, Ivy. Bye, I waved back. The moment he left, I turned to Molly. Text? You have his phone number? Molly raised a shoulder delicately as she put a tray of cupcakes into an oven. After Chaz cleaned up the tree that put the hole in the clubhouse, he offered to give me his number, just in case we ever needed some help around here or wanted another tree down. This was far more serious than I had thought. Molly, play nice with Chaz. He's a sweet guy and a little naive. Turning back to me, Molly put her hands on her hips and let out a huff of air. I know. That's what I like about him. The last guy I was in a relationship was selfish. It was all about him. It's nice to have the possibility of a guy who is a real good guy. Someone who likes to take care of other people. I really want to see if this will work between us. Chaz is so great and I feel like he makes me a better person. I sighed. Maybe it would be different this time with Chaz. As long as Molly didn't get bored of him and his niceness. Okay. We worked in silence for a little while before I changed the subject. Did the mayor say anything about the types of flavors he wants for the cupcakes? Any fillings? Nope, 
That is all in our capable hands, a smug Molly stated. We have got complete artistic license as long as the icing is shades of green. Nice, I agreed easily. This meant that we could stretch ingredients and enjoy the process a lot more. It was going to be fun coming up with ideas and creations. Hours later, we were heartily sick of baking cupcakes, and were just over halfway through the order. We still needed to ice and fill. These need to be done tomorrow at three in the afternoon, I moaned, looking at the time. We can do it, a stubborn Molly voice as she wiped sweat from her face on a towel. I'm going to take an hour break and then come back for another round. How is it that you still have makeup on, I wondered. It was hot enough to bake us in this kitchen, and yet Molly still looked perfect. I had long since washed and wiped off any makeup that was on my face. In this heat, there was no point. It's tattooed on, confided Molly, and I have super sticky glue for the false eyelashes. Oh dear, I thought, and she's interested in the conservative Christian guy. I will see you in an hour, I agreed, putting a newly scrubbed bowl to the side to air dry. It will be nice to get out of the kitchen for a little while. We both exited the kitchen. Molly went down the path toward Ethel Murley's old trailer. When Ethel had died, she had left her trailer and some money to me on the condition that I use the cash to revitalize the Happy Camper Resort. Molly was currently renting the camper from me, not that I was charging her much. When she had broken up with her boyfriend, been fired from her job, and needed a place to stay, I couldn't turn her down. I was not certain what Molly's plans were, but right now we were both enjoying our new catering venture. I enjoyed having her around and hoped she would stay. Deciding to check on the progress with the pool, I headed in that direction. The sun was already starting to set, and most of my campers were enjoying the evening, sitting around fire pits and chatting with each other. I waved at a few people, declining to stop and chat. I reflected that I should have commandeered one of the many whiny golf carts that we had. The pool was finally free of the green, nasty swamp look. Now it looked forlorn, empty with a few abandoned brooms in the bottom. Some of the algae had been scrubbed away, but there were still green staining the cement walls. I should probably invest in some pool paint, I decided. However, it would mean that the opening of the pool would be delayed. I had hoped that it would happen for this weekend, since we were all booked up. Ivy! came Conrad's thin voice. I turned to see Conrad hurrying up the dirt road to me. Is everything okay? It most certainly is not, puffed the elderly man. He leaned against the pool fence for a moment to catch his breath. That computer system you have is junk. We should be doing it the old way. What's wrong with pen and paper? Conrad, I explained again. The computer will help us be more organized, and it automatically takes online bookings so we don't have to. Well, you have a real mess at the office, announced Conrad. That computer has gone crazy, and there are dozens of people set to show up tomorrow for spots that don't exist. What do you mean? I asked, stunned. We're overbooked. Conrad's hands flailed in frustration. There are people showing up now that are booked for the same lots. You need to come and sort this out. Okay. I hoped that Conrad was overreacting. He had been in charge of the office at the campground for a long time and didn't appreciate the changes that had been taking place lately. I will come with you and have a look. We made our way back to the office to find a lineup of vehicles waiting to come into the Happy Camper Resort. They are early, I murmured. I thought most of our new arrivals weren't meant to come until tomorrow. Ha! You are in for a surprise, a dour Conrad told me. A good number of the reservations want to be here before the barbecue fest starts so that they can get settled. The problem is, we have too many reservations. We have a total of 60 lots, I explained patiently. 25 are taken up by full-time campers. We have less than 10 lots for Evan to finish the electricity on for the part-time slots, which he promised would be done by 1 tomorrow. 12 lots are taken right now by temporary campers, 5 of which are expected to leave tomorrow. That means we have 13 lots available tonight, and tomorrow another 15 become available. We should have 28 reservations in total. Conrad just snorted as he held the door to the office open for me. Are you the owner? A beefy man asked. Yes, I smiled in greeting. Apparently there may have been a bit of a glitch in our computer system. However, I'm going to help sort it all out. I apologize that checking you in is taking a little longer than normal. I'm supposed to be on lot 27, a woman asserted. We're on site 27, 
another woman sniffed. She looked like she might have been a newly retired school teacher. Grabbing a printout from a computer, she shoved past the beefy guy and put it on the counter. See? Right there it says Lot 27. I have it on my phone, the other woman chimed in, holding up her cell and pointing to the screen. Lot 27. Can I just register and get set up? the beefy man moaned. These two are giving me a headache, and I need to be up early tomorrow to get ready for the barbecue fest. I'm in the rib competition. I remember you from last year, nodded Conrad, brightening. You sure had some spicy ribs. Beefy guy smiled in appreciation. Stop by my grill tomorrow. I've been perfecting the recipe. I certainly will, promised Conrad. I thought you were working tomorrow, I glanced at Conrad as I tried to navigate the computer reservation system. Not when the barbecue fest is happening, replied Conrad as he had the new arrivals sign waivers. I never work this weekend. I looked at him in dismay. You are scheduled on the chore chart. We both looked at the large chart on the wall that I had made up. Sure enough, Conrad's name was prominently displayed for tomorrow and Saturday. Well, harumped Conrad, ain't that a pickle? I'm still not available. We all go to the barbecue fest as a group. It's tradition. You signed up to work, I gently reminded him. I was not certain whether I could get anyone to replace him on such short notice. I did that a month ago. I must have forgotten the barbecue fest was this weekend, shrugged Conrad. He put away the signed waivers and ran Beefy Guy's credit card through the card reader. I'm still not working. What about Site 27? the impatient schoolteacher asked. You can have 27, I said firmly. Turning to the woman with the cell phone, I told her, You can have lot 40. It's right by the picnic area, and the electrical has just been redone just today. Is it the same price? She wheedled, a sharp look in her eye. Because I really think with all the inconvenience, I should get a discount for having to change sites. Gritting my teeth, I replied as sweetly as I could manage. We are all booked up. It's your choice to have lot 40 at the quoted price or find another campground. Considering that it is the height of the tourist season and there is a festival going on in town, I highly doubt that any other spots are available. Fine, she grumbled. I have already prepaid. I double-checked to be certain, then gave her a little map of the campground, using a pen to show her where her lot is. Here, happy camping. Scowling, she took the map and left. Some people, muttered the schoolteacher type to the beefy guy who just gave her a disbelieving look. See you at the cook-off beefy guy told Conrad before taking his leave. I rang the last customer through, pleased that finally the Happer Camper Resort was starting to see some decent revenue. Looking at the computer, I was startled by the number of bookings. How is this possible? See what I mean? crowed Conrad as he hovered over my shoulder. It's all messed up. You have ten lots still left tonight, but we have eighteen more booked. We're short by eight lots. Oh, dear, I muttered, trying to decipher the numbers across the screen. If this is true, then we will have to put eight people in the old electrical spots and hope they don't mind being inconvenienced by upgrades tomorrow. What do we do with tomorrow's campers? pointed out Conrad. Deal with them tomorrow, I frowned at the computer. Why is Site 27 booked nine times? Chapter 3. Welcome, Campers. This wouldn't have happened if you had just stuck to pen and paper, muttered Conrad. I bit my cheek in an effort not to say anything rude. Once we get this glitch worked out, the program will save us time in the long run. Grabbing a pen and one of the complimentary maps we had printed, I began writing down names of people who had reserved the overbooked Site 27, spreading them around the campground depending on what sort of camper they had, trying to reorganize them in the best spots. "'What is your pet policy again?' wondered a man as he came in. "'Hush!' his wife admonished as she followed him. "'Some campgrounds don't allow pets.' "'We do,' I mentioned, giving them a smile and greeting. "'Welcome to the Happy Camper Resort. "'Pets must be leashed at all times. "'You're responsible for picking up after them and keeping them under your control.' "'Oh, good,' he said in obvious relief. "'What about the age of the camper?' I hear some campgrounds have restrictions on allowing campers to over a certain year. Not us, I assured him as Conrad laid out another waiver form to be signed. We accept vintage campers. As long as you're able to bring them in and out in one piece, you are welcome to camp with us. 
Honey, why don't you just get the forms done? It's getting late, and I would like to get settled in after such a long drive, the wife commented, trying to stifle his questioning. I know we should have researched everything before, the man confided as he signed the form with a flourish. However, everything was booked so fast for this weekend. It was a last-minute decision to come through the barbecue fest and see the shops. My wife loves the small-town atmosphere. I heard there's a quilting shop, she confided. I just love quilts. I buy them for my kids and other family members. Someone said there was an art gallery in town as well. You should check out the Crafty Corner, I recommended my friend Ava's shop. Recently, she and Jackson Grubbs, owner of the Grubbs Fresh Farm Food, had started dating. Their relationship had come about after I had helped clear Jackson of charges of poisoning Bart Baker. The owner has all sorts of arts and craft items. Some of them are one of a kind. How lovely, she smiled in appreciation. We're going to have a great weekend with the good food and shopping. Do you think there will be a lot of people, he wondered. I hope there aren't too many lineups. It's a busy time in Oaks Crossing, I noted. However, I'm sure the organizers of the event have figured out the best way to handle any crowds. What site are you supposed to be on? 27, he told me. Can I ask you something? His wife groaned. Sure. I nodded, waiting to see what he wanted to know. Is it possible to get a site without electrical? He questioned. We have solar power. All we really need is the ability to fill our water tanks on occasion. Could we get a cheaper site since we really don't need the electricity? I blinked in surprise. Sure, Conrad quickly capitalized on the idea. We can shave a little off the price. Here, you can have Lot 30 Side B. It's the primitive camping area. When you need to fill up with water, just bring your hose over to Lot 30, Side A. I'm right there, and with both our hoses, I'm sure we can reach and get you set for water without even moving your camper. Conrad showed him on the map while I ran their credit card through the machine at the slightly discounted rate. Once they had left, I turned to Conrad. There is no Lot 30, Side B. Is the grass even mowed beside you? There's enough area for a lot, just no hydro to the spot. It will suit them fine, an unconcerned Conrad said. There's lots of sun for their solar, and the grass was mowed this morning. I had thought to use it for tent campers if we needed it, but this will work too. Then where are we going to put the extra tent campers that are coming? I questioned, looking at the map. The other site that we had designed for them was now filled up. If I stuck even one more tent in the patch of grass, they would start tripping over one another. Right here, Conrad pointed. It's a little area beside the beach. They'll love having a view of the lake. You can charge premium for the spot. All you need to do is get Ivan to mow it and clear the area before the morning checks in. Tomorrow, I have a group of twelve tenters arriving. I suppose I will go talk to Ivan then, I mumbled, realizing that I was not looking forward to the conversation. Get Topher too, ordered Conrad as he glared at the computer screen, which updated to show another booking. Now there's another booking for Site 27. He needs to get his friend to fix this before we have to stack people on top of one another. Taking a deep breath, I agreed. I will go talk to them. Maybe there's a way to shut down the reservations for now. You'd better hurry, Conrad pointed to the screen. 27 just got booked again. Hi, we're here to sign in. A man and two kids came in. I'm surprised the office is open this late. It's uncommon, groused Conrad, laying another form on the counter with a pen. Don't get used to it. Welcome to Happy Camper Resort, I mentioned as I quickly passed them, leaving Conrad to sort out where this new camper was staying. Making a beeline for the tenting area where I knew Topher was most likely to be, I headed down the dirt road. Hi, V! An agitated Agatha waved her cane in the air from her cluttered front yard. I need to speak to you! With a sigh, I passed the cheap and fading Christmas decorations to get to her camper. Agatha had put out a multitude of chintzy tinsel decor some year long ago, which hadn't been taken down since. A motion-censored Santa let out a garbled ho-ho-ho as I passed it. Hi, Agatha, I mustered up a smile. What can I help you with? Agatha motioned for me to come closer, whispering in a voice that was nearly as loud as her regular talking voice. I don't know who is in charge of what people go to what lot, but they need some lessons. Is there a problem with your neighbors? I gently questioned. They'll likely only be here for the weekend. They are a bit, she hesitated, rowdy. Would you like me to have a word with them? I offered. 
I can ask them to quiet down. Oh, no, gasped Agatha. I would never ask you to do that. You're just an itty-bitty thing, Ivy. You can't go talking to strange men, trying to tell them what to do. Since I own the campground, I rather think I can, I said dryly. Just let me talk to them. Ivy! And a gasped Agatha got up out of her chair, her cane thumping along as she followed me to the camper next door. Marching up to the door of the camper as best as I could in an air cast with a cane, I knocked briskly on the door. There was some heavy music going on inside, so I knocked harder. Ivy! hissed Agatha. We should just leave them alone. I don't want any trouble. It's no trouble, I blithely assured her as the outside light of the camper came on, illuminating four motorcycles. The door swung open. A muscled, tattooed man wearing leather and with a beer in his hand ducked his head through the opening. What? I gulped and privately decided Agatha might be right not to want to take on this group. Hi, I'm Ivy. I own the campground, and I was wondering if you could keep down the noise a little. He motioned for those inside to turn down the music. Coming out of the camper, he towered over me. I couldn't quite hear you. What did you say? His buddies piled out of the camper, all of them looking more tough than the one in front of me. I could feel Agatha lay a hand on my arm. Straightening up, I drew in a breath to fight the nervousness I felt. I'm Ivy, the owner of the Happy Camper Resort. It's getting close to ten o'clock, and I was wondering if you could lower your music a little. We have a lot of senior citizens here, and they appreciate the quiet after a certain hour. He frowned as he looked at Agatha. It was clear to me that he was making the connection that Agatha had been the one to complain. I was about to explain that was not the case, hoping to take the heat off her, even though I was the worst liar I knew, when his face broke out in a huge grin. Mrs. Agatha Symes, it's been a coon's age. Agatha looked at him, clearly confused. Tim Waller, you would know me as little Timmy, he explained. Boys, take off your hats. This here is my Sunday school teacher, Mrs. Symes. The men quickly took off their caps and bandanas in respect. They chorched a respectful Mrs. Symes. Oh, dear, Timmy Waller, chuckled Agatha. My, how you have grown. Then again, the Wallers always were a tall bunch. Don't be fooled, men. This little lady was a tyrant, laughed Tim. She didn't let us get away with anything. You were a troublesome boy, admitted Agatha. Now tell me all of what happened to you since those days. Would you believe I married Betty? he asked her. The brown-haired girl with the glasses and the braids with the bow ties. Really? she questioned with obvious delight. Now that Agatha was obviously at ease with her new neighbors, I decided I should return to my original mission. Wishing them all a good night, as they carefully seated the elderly Agatha at their picnic table to chat, I continued on to the tent area. Finding Topher's tent, I stood impatiently outside. Hey, Topher, are you there? We need to talk. I think he went down to the beach party, another tenter said, poking her head out of nearby tent. Beach party? I wondered. What beach party? Yeah, at the beach, she unhelpfully supplied. Thanks, I muttered. This was the first I had heard of a beach party. I wondered who had decided to have the party. On my way to the little beach that was part of the campground, I heard a whiny golf cart approaching. Sticking up my thumb like a hitchhiker, I flagged down Herb. Can I get a ride? Sure thing, Ivy, agreed Herb readily. The tan retired dentist spent most of the time either dog-sitting for me, fishing, or golfing with his buddies. Get on in. I have a few more people to pick up and drop off as well. "'Excuse me?' I questioned as I carefully brought my injured foot inside the golf cart. "'I'm making a bit of extra cash ferrying people back and forth throughout the campground,' explained Herb, flooring the gas pedal as always. We zipped along the road. "'Kind of like a taxi service.' "'People are paying you for this?' I wondered in concern. "'Is that legal?' Herb shrugged, slowing down to pick up a couple from Lot 14. "'No idea.' Thanks for the ride, the woman said, setting a camping chair and beach bag against her. It would have been tiresome to carry this all down to the beach. Here you go, the man leaned forward, handing Herb a five-dollar bill. Happy to be of service at the Happy Camper Resort, returned the cheery Herb, pocketing the money before flooring it again. I grabbed the seat of the golf cart as we bounced over a pothole. The owner of this campground really should think about fixing the roads, mentioned the woman in irritation. They could use some gravel or paving. I decided to keep quiet on that little criticism. Road conditions were the least of my worries at the moment. 
new owner is making improvements, Herb responded in my defense. It just takes a little time. I heard the pool was not open, complained the man. What sort of campground doesn't have a pool? This one, I mentioned with gritted teeth. The pool is coming soon. Not soon enough, mentioned the woman. The weather promises to be sweltering all weekend. Good thing there is a lake, I pointed out. With no lifeguard, tutted the woman. Is that even safe? Speaking of the beach, Herb put on the brakes. Here we are. Have a good time at the party. The beach looked packed with people. Most were hanging out on blankets or in camping chairs. Near the leaning kayak shack, a stage had been set up, and some was playing a guitar while singing a soft ballad. What is going on here? I wondered. I felt like as the campground got busier, I was consulted less, and my group of senior citizens were full of surprises that weren't necessarily welcome. It's open mic night, advised Herb. We thought it'd be a great way to keep some of the campers entertained. Everyone signs up and shows off their talents. It's drawn quite a crowd. Is that Mabel? I watched a gray-haired woman handing something out to a child from a large canvas bag she wore before collecting money. What is she doing? Selling treats, explained Herb. You know, candy bars, chips, peanut packs, those sorts of things. I think Lionel's around selling cold cans of soda. We are taking turns to make it a success. There goes Loretta. She's selling extra hoodies in case anyone gets cool as the evening wears on. While the Happy Camper Resort did have a venue and events license, I was not certain if this qualified. Shaking my head, I just hoped no one would report us. Herb, are you available to watch The Office for a while this weekend? Nope, replied Herb. I'm gonna make some sweet barbecue wings. I'm in the competition and will be busy all weekend long. Wait, what about changing those outdoor light bulbs around the campground? I asked in concern. You said you would get those done so we could have more light around here at night. That'll have to wait until next weekend, shrugged Herb. I rented the machine that lifts people to the height of the lamps, I said in dismay. And someone else will have to help you, responded Herb. I'm sorry, Ivy, but I've got a real shot at winning in my category this year. I sighed. Fine, I will figure it out. Spying Topher as he went up on stage with a guitar, I left Herb and weaved my way through the crowd. This is a, for a special lady who has stolen my heart, Topher said into the microphone before he began strumming on the guitar. He really was not that good of a player, alternating between two chords. His pale, thin form seemed a little overexposed under the spotlight that someone had set up. Topher warbled on about some girl who was petite and sweet, yet a boss who could do it all. I hope the object of his affections appreciated his effort. There was a polite clapping after he was done. As he came off the stage, his face lit up. Ivy, you heard the song. Yeah, it was nice, I complimented him. Are you free a moment? The computer program you set me up with seems to be having a problem. Sure, I can have a look, he replied. I don't know much about computers, but if there's an issue, I can call my friend. I'm sure he will help us out. Great, I said in relief. For some reason, it keeps booking Site 27 over and over again. Sounds like a glitch, observed Topher. A bad one, I agreed, a little distracted as someone tried to rap out a poem. We made our way back from the beach toward the main dirt road. As we walked, Topher asked, So, what did you think about the song? Um, I hedged. I'm sure any girl would be happy to have a song written about her. Whoever she is, she must be quite happy. It's romantic. Topher's shoulders drooped. Whoever she is? You mean you don't know who the song was about? Was I supposed to? I questioned, racking my brain for any idea of who Topher might know around the area. It was fairly new, and I was not certain how many people he had met. I hoped the song was not about Molly, otherwise poor Topher was about to have his heart broken. Kind of, he muttered beside me. I was saved from answering by Thelma rushing down the trail to meet us. Yoo-hoo! Ivy! Hi, Thelma, I replied in surprise. Thelma's thin form was wrapped in a silk robe. She had fluffy bunny slippers on her feet, and her hair in curlers. A green face mask graced her aging features, clashing with her brightly dyed red hair. Is everything okay? Something needs to be done, gasped Thelma, a hand to her chest. Her other hand fluttered in the air, showing her distress. Why don't you tell me what happened, I said soothingly. It's that washing machine, she cried. Oh, Pooh, I can't even describe it. You'll just have to see it for yourself. 
Okay, yeah, I can do that, I agreed. Topher, would you mind going to the office and helping Conrad with the bookings on the computer? I need to take care of this. Oh, sure, a subdued Topher replied. Thelma was waiting until Topher was out of earshot before asking me, What is wrong with that boy? He looks like he lost his best friend. I have no idea, I shrugged. Something about a song about a girl? He asked my opinion. I tried to be nice about it, but honestly, it was not a very good song. Oh, honey, murmured Thelma, putting a hand to her mouth. That boy likes you, and you are totally oblivious. Thelma was always trying to matchmake. I rolled my eyes. I highly doubt that. Topher is a nice guy and very helpful, but he doesn't like me in that way. He is sweet on you, insisted Thelma. Why else would he follow you around all the time? That boy will do anything you ask him to. I gave her a doubtful look. He helped you to fix your leaking camper roof. He helped you to get the computer reservation program on wholesale price. He helped you in the pool. Thelma ticked off her fingers. Topher has a mad crush on you. I slumped a little. Topher is nice, but I don't like him that way. Then you're going to have to find a way to let the boy down easy, tutted Thelma. I sighed, wondering what I was going to do when we entered the laundry room. I could hear a high-pitched squealing coming from the washing machine. Putting my hands over my ears, I looked at Thelma in shock. What is wrong with it? She shook her head and gestured at the washer, which was practically dancing in a tight circle. It was halfway out from the line of other washing machines that had already given up the ghost. It vibrated with a terrifying wail. I came in to do my load of laundry and found it like this. Is that smoke? I yelled in disbelief. Maybe my eyes were playing tricks on me, yet it certainly looked like it could be a wisp of gray coming from the back of the machine. It was difficult to see with all the shaking the washer was doing. Oh, goodness gracious, shouted Thelma in alarm. Where's the fire extinguisher? Tossing my cane to the side, I grabbed the old and heavy fire extinguisher from the wall. Yanking the pin out, I pointed the nozzle at the machine and squeezed the trigger. Nothing. What? I exclaimed, incredulous the extinguisher was not working. Repeating my actions, I achieved the same result. Tapping the pressure gauge, I noted there was no pressure whatsoever in the chamber. Is this used? Who does that? Who uses a fire extinguisher, then doesn't replace it? Suddenly, I was pushed out of the way. Stumbling a little, I dropped the heavy fire extinguisher, breaking a tile on the laundry room floor as I grabbed the large folding table to stay upright. The wailing of the washing machine stopped abruptly as a frowning Ivan held up the now unplugged electrical cord. Chapter 4 Bees at the Barbecue Oh, Ivan, honey, sighed a relieved Thelma. Thank you so much. That washer was just acting crazy. I think the laundry room is officially closed, observed Ivan. He walked past me, crunching across the broken tile to open the closet door, grabbing a small black bag. Bringing it back, he plucked out a screwdriver. Pulling the washing machine away from the wall, he looked at me. You might want to get your wet clothes out before I start taking the machine apart. I will see if I can fix it. It's not my laundry, I mentioned. I grabbed an empty laundry basket and came forward, opening the machine door. Soon the machine was empty. I put the wet clothes back on the table. I have a favor to ask you. We don't know each other that well, Ivan dryly remarked. He had already taken the back panel off of the washing machine. I need the area beside the beach, just beyond the kayak shack, mowed before noon tomorrow. We have a bunch of tent campers coming and nowhere to put them, I explained, ignoring his reluctance. I'm willing to take a little off next month's rent if you will do it. Ivan grunted, pulling the parts out of the machine. I hoped he knew what he was doing. Fifty dollars. Fifty, I exclaimed in dismay. For a patch of grass? How badly do you need it done? He negotiated. I have enough work to do without adding a washing machine and more grass mowing to my list. Fifty, if you'll also replace all the outdoor lights for me this weekend, I bargained. I have the light bulbs and the lift machine rented. Done, he agreed. He held up a mangled piece of metal. And so is the washing machine. We have no working laundry machines? questioned Thelma in dismay. Nope, agreed Ivan. He set down the metal and held up a very greasy thong. Princess, your underwear killed the machine. It must have slipped between the drum and the agitator, made its way along the belt to get jammed in the motor. 
It needs a new motor, I stated baldly. I decided not to argue about whose clothing had been responsible for the demise of the washer. I had my suspicions it was Molly's load as she was the only person at the campground I knew who wore that type of underwear. I certainly did not, and I really hoped none of the seniors did. Shaking away the mental picture, I asked, How much is that going to cost? By the time you pay for a motor and installation, you might as well buy a new machine, advised Ivan, tossing the parts back in the washer. Great, I sighed. I eyed Thelma. Would you be able to work in the office this weekend? This weekend? echoed Thelma, blinking in surprise at the change of subject. I'm sorry, but now I need to do laundry in town. I have a date with George tomorrow at the barbecue fest. It's going to take me most of the morning to get ready. Plus, I promised B to do a little shopping. You have a date with George? I questioned. Thelma had been making eyes at the Silver Fox for some time now. Apparently, they had been high school sweethearts. Now George was the widower, and the pair had been spending more time together. Good for you. Thank you, a smug Thelma replied. If you ladies are done talking about your love lives, Ivan returned the bag of tools to the closet, then I'm going to put a sign on the machine stating it's out of order and call it a night. Thelma grabbed her laundry basket, leaving the wet clothes from the machine sitting on the folding table. I grabbed my cane, we said good night, and I headed back to the office. There, crowed Conrad. It just booked another one under Site 27. I don't understand, frowned Topher as he stared at the screen in confusion. The parameters have been set. This shouldn't be happening. Well, it is, a disgruntled Conrad told him. It needs to stop. We don't have any more room to put up all these people. Any luck? I asked without much hope. My friend is remotely looking at the program, informed Topher. He's going through the software right now to see if we can find the error that is causing all these bookings at the same site. It just happened again, exclaimed Conrad, pointing to the screen. I estimate we have at least a dozen overbookings on that spot. Is the computer just overbooking 27, or are there any other lots affected, I wondered. It appears to just be 27, a disembodied voice spoke up from a phone that was lying on the counter. I'm canceling any bookings that happened in the last half hour. Hopefully, those campers will see the cancellation before coming into your resort. I'm also temporarily removing Lot 27, and we'll replace it with Lot 27A. That should solve the problem until I can get a better look at why the algorithm failed. <laughs> that is Ben, introduced Topher. He's the go-to guy when it comes to technology. I told you before, and I will tell you again, started Conrad. Paper and pencil never fail. The computer will work once the glitch is fixed, Ben spoke up. There, I've got the temporary solution in place, and once I have time to run all the full diagnostics, I'll be able to sort out the problem. How many extra campers were booked through 27, I asked. We're going to have to figure out where to put everyone. Um, Ben paused as he did a calculation. I just canceled six. That means there's about an extra 15? 15, I moaned. I've already put one there, Conrad pointed. Another solar guy who can generate his own power registered at the office, so he's over by B, who will share a hose when needed. One camper is already in lot 27, so that means we have an even dozen to spread out around the campground somewhere. The smaller campers could share lots at a discount, I suggested, knowing that people were not going to be happy to share hydro and water. How are we going to make this work? Does the electrician have a friend who can help him wire up some half-lots? proposed Topher. Then you could have large lots for large campers and smaller lots for smaller campers. What about the water? I thought about it. Having smaller lots would increase revenue. I could just have more campers. Just use a hose splitter with a couple of turn-off valves, grumbled Conrad. You can get those at the handy hardware store. Okay, I nodded, liking the plan. I grabbed a map and pen. Here will be our split sites. We only need six in total to be split into two. I'll talk to Evan first thing tomorrow to see if it can be done. If he okays it, then I'll grab the hardware we need from the store. Otherwise, we're going to have to turn away some more people. When are you going to make a run into town? questioned Conrad. Did you find someone to mind the office for the weekend? I will figure that out, I improvised. Maybe I can get Molly to do a few hours. I doubt it, snorted Conrad. I heard she volunteered to help Team Mighty Oaks at the competition. Bit of a traitor, your friend. She should be on Team Happy Camper for the Barbecue Fest competitions. There are cash prizes to be won. 
Who all is on your team for the competition? I wondered how I had forgotten that Molly had volunteered for her Saturday to Chaz. There was too much going on lately that my mind didn't feel like it was keeping up. If everyone is at the town festival, how am I going to staff the office? Beats me, shrugged Conrad. The majority of us are going to be there. I groaned. I could watch the office for a little while, volunteered Topher. That is nice, Topher, but you really don't have to. I regretfully turned down his offer of help. You're a paying guest. I can't ask you to work here. That's no problem, insisted Topher. I don't mind helping. I could do a few hours each day. Sucker, came Ben's disembodied voice. Ben, have you got it bad. I'm running out of battery, improvised Topher as he ended the call on his friend. Never mind, Ben. He gets weird ideas sometimes. Now I felt like I might be taking advantage of Topher. Seeing my hesitation, Topher grabbed a pen. He put his name on the schedule. I insist. Okay, I capitulated. Thank you. I really do appreciate it. I can give you some baked goods in return if you'd like. Absolutely, Topher's face lit up at the mention of baking. That would be great. I'll show you the ropes, offered Conrad. Hi, a voice interrupted us. A woman came into the office. I'm sorry I'm a little late. I got lost looking for the campground. Do I register for check-in here? Welcome to the Happy Camper Resort, I replied. We are happy to have you. Conrad will get you registered. What lot did you sign for? asked Conrad as he handed over the liability form for her to sign. Twenty-seven, she supplied. With a wave, I left Conrad to sort out her accommodations. Rejoining Molly in the kitchen, I gratefully sank onto the stool. I think your wet laundry is sitting in a wet basket in the laundry room, I tiredly told her. The machine broke today. Molly whisked a bowl of batter intensely. The stand mixer also continued to do its work. Hey, is something wrong? I asked her. If it's because I'm late getting back, I had to deal with your underwear killing my last washing machine. Melinda Stratton is on Team Mighty Oaks, burst out an angry Molly. Melinda Stratton? I echoed. Melinda was Oaks Crossing's former beauty queen. She still coached for pageants and ran the town's annual beauty competition. She's supposed to be in love with Tristan Towns. I wouldn't worry about her. Tristan left town. He got a gig in a show and has left Melinda behind, sniffed Molly. Miss Stratton is now looking for Tristan's replacement and has her eyes set on my Irish cream dream. I knew that Molly liked to call people by food descriptions sometimes. Irish cream dream was code for the ginger-haired, muscly Chaz Bison. I looked at her in surprise. Maybe Molly really was serious about Chaz. You really do like Chaz. You're all jealous. I am not going to let her get her claws into him, decided Molly. Good for you. I eyed the bowl she was still whisking. I think the batter is ready. It really doesn't need to be overmixed. Oh, Molly looked at the bowl in her arm and whisked like she was seeing them for the first time. Oops. How are we doing with the cupcake order? I grabbed a measuring cup and began adding dry ingredients to a clean bowl. Molly looked at a list that she had drawn up. We are done with the fantastic fudge cupcakes. That means we still have the pudding delights, raspberry swirls, and blueberry bonanzas to do. We're going to be here past midnight, I predicted. Then up early tomorrow to ice them all, chimed in Molly. Delivery and done. No, I corrected her. We have to put out a display of some sort. Something that will catch people's attention and make them think of hiring us. We debated the merits of a tier of cupcakes and finally settled on a design idea. True to my prediction, it was a little after midnight before we finished the baking process and cleaned up the kitchen. I yawned. See you later this morning. Make sure I don't sleep through my alarms, groaned Molly as she left to deal with her soggy laundry. I walked through the dark. Soft, glowing lights from various campers gave enough definition to the path to make it easy enough to traverse. The crickets merrily sang their chirpy songs. While most people were safely sleeping, I could still hear the occasional group chatting softly around fires, enjoying their time away from home. I smiled. This is what I remember from my childhood visits to the Happy Camper Resort. I had loved visiting my grandmother. We always used to bake together. I would go swimming in the pool or the lake. We had sandcastle competitions at the beach, or would go hiking. Sometimes we kayaked in the lake. Then at night, we would sit around a campfire as we talked with Grandma's friends. Now, many of her friends were mine. It was a lovely feeling. The campground felt like a home. I really felt like I was doing something important here, taking care of my little band of seniors. 
I set my cell phone alarm for the all-too-early hour of six in the morning. Thankfully, B had agreed to look after Cookie and Cupcake till about noon tomorrow. Hopefully I would be done at the barbecue fest by then. Afterward, I suspected the doggies and I would be manning the office. The chore chart had been working well up until this weekend, I reflected. In the future, I would have to plan for the eventuality that festivals or town-wide events would probably affect my somewhat volunteering staff schedules. Once at my camper, I changed straight into pajamas. Since it was so muggy, the ooze consisted of a tank top and shorts. Flopping onto my bed, I flicked on the fan to create some air movement, hoping to grab the slightly cooler air from outside. Before next summer, I told myself firmly, I was getting the air conditioning unit in this camper fixed. I drifted off into a restless sleep. It felt like mere minutes before my alarm went off. A wailing siren that had me sitting up in bed, one hand clutched to my chest to still my thumping heart. Long ago, Molly and I had discovered that we could sleep through multiple alarms, making us late for all sorts of appointments or jobs. While Molly could still sleep through anything, I had hit upon the fact that if a police car or a fire truck was loud enough, it would wake me up instantly. Thanks to the app store, I had downloaded a handy alarm that was a loud siren. It proved more than effective in jolting me awake every time. Stumbling out of bed, I grabbed my last set of fresh shorts and a tea before heading to my cramped shower. Once again, I shoved my laundry on top of the tower of dirties in the laundry basket. It teetered precariously before settling. The good news is that the laundromat in Oaks Crossing was open around the clock. Tonight, after the Happy Camper Resort office closed, I was going to get some clean clothes. As it was, I was wearing my second-last clean tee, which had proudly emblazoned across my chest, Cupcake Queen of 2018. I had entered a contest a couple years ago, and all I got was the lousy t-shirt for my efforts. However, it was better than my only other clean t-shirt, which had three holes in it and splashes of paint for my helping to redecorate my mother's house. I tugged at the tee. It was a little tight, and I wondered if I had gained some weight. More likely, it had just shrunk in the wash, I fibbed to myself. Calling Molly, I put her on speaker as I drove my orange Volkswagen Beetle to the clubhouse. I chose to drive so that we could just load the car when it was time, and I wouldn't have to travel back to the camper to fetch it. Molly, you had better be up. I am up and at the kitchen, a tired voice returned on the phone. Ugh, whose idea was this? Yours, I sang sweetly to her. We are going to make bank, remember? We are going to make bank, agreed a sleepy Molly as she yawned. Once we get these cupcakes there, Mary Whitcomb is going to give us a check that will make it all worthwhile. It certainly will, I allowed as I shut off the car. I'm here. I ended the phone call and locked up the car before heading into the clubhouse kitchen. Molly had already had the doors open and the industrial fan borrowed from Chaz going at full speed. "'Can you believe how hot it's supposed to get today?' moaned Molly as she piped pudding into some of our cupcakes. we are going to have to make everything very stiff so the icing doesn't melt.' "'Well, we'll need to use the vegetable shortening recipe,' I decided. Most buttercream icing recipes use butter. Using a recipe that contains vegetable shortening can keep the icing more stiff and less likely to melt in high humidity situations. We worked diligently for the next few hours concentrating on the tasks at hand. The heat rose steadily. Molly offered to let me bring the first set of cupcakes to the festival, since I would have to be in the office for the afternoon. In a bid to escape the hot kitchen, I gratefully agreed. Not that I was going to be much cooler in the car. My vintage bug didn't have air conditioning, leaving me only with the option of open windows. Vintage might look nice, but sometimes it was a little inconvenient. Loading up the car with hundreds of green iced cupcakes in their trays, I headed for the small town of Oaks Crossing. It was a five-minute drive from my campground to the outskirts of the picturesque town. Old brick-and-mortar shops lined the downtown area. There were beautiful flower arrangements hanging from the street lamps. Having come from the city, I appreciated the small-town atmosphere and the views. It was nice to know the people who lived here. Many waved and greeted each other by name. It made me feel like I was part of a community. Already, I could see the park at the town center was crowded with all sorts of people, barbecue equipment, booths, picnic tables, and sitting areas. There were colorful strings of pennants waving in the breeze. Banners at each of the park entrances proclaimed that it was the annual Oaks Crossing Barbecue Fest. I found a parking spot and began a search to find Mayor Whitcomb's booth. Fortunately, I saw his booth rather quickly, since it was right at the center near the fountain. Ivy! Mayor Reuben Whitcomb greeted me, immaculate as always in his suit. He didn't even look like he was breaking a sweat as the mercury climbed. 
Do you think it would be better to have the banner go across the table or at the top of the pop-up canopy? I would think at the top, I motioned to the table. If we have a crowd of people, no one will be able to see your banner if it gets blocked in at the front of the table. Good point, nodded Whitcomb. Where would you like me to set up the cupcake display? I asked him. Right over here, he gestured. We have reserved this area for you. Great. I looked at the half of table and wondered where he was going to have all the rest of the cupcakes. I decided on focusing on the display first. You will have someone here handing out the cupcakes, right? He questioned as the assistant perched on a chair, trying to tie the corner of the banner to the canopy. Did Molly and you discuss that? I wondered. She didn't mention you wanted someone here all day. Oh, I suppose I just assumed that someone would be here to handle the cupcakes, chuckled Whitcomb. I can hardly get sticky fingers while I'm shaking potential voters' hands. That would be awkward. I'm sure Molly would be delighted to stay, I mentioned, at an extra cost. Of course, agreed Whitcomb. He gestured to the banner. A little higher. The assistant untied the banner and stretched as tall as he could on the chair. One foot perched precariously on the back, the other on the seat as he tried to find a spot to tie the banner. "'Hey, Ivy!' Herb called out as he and Conrad shuffled past, dragging a rusted barbecue along the grass. "'Good morning,' I replied, eyeing the equipment they were toting. "'Is that safe? There looks like there is a hole.' "'Extra ventilation!' grunted Conrad. "'Good for the burn!' "'Don't worry,' assured Herb. "'The inside will be scrubbed clean and fully up to code. "'Wouldn't want anyone getting food poisoning.' "'Joan jinx us,' joked the mayor. "'Oaks Crossing hasn't had a food incident in eight years, "'and I would like to keep it that way. "'This town has a reputation to uphold.' "'Don't you worry,' responded a confident Herb. "'Oaks Crossing is about to have the best barbecue food "'in the history of the world today.' "'I look forward to it,' grinned Whitcomb. It still doesn't look very safe, I mentioned. Are you sure you want to use that barbecue? The rest of the barbecues at the campground were being used by campers, grouse Conrad. This was the only one we could find that was not in use. Maybe if you didn't have so many people at the Happy Camper Resort, we could have used our regular barbecue. Now, Conrad, we need the people for the revenue, chided Herb. Besides, if I would have thought of that... I would have put our favorite barbecue aside for today, so now we will make do. Once we do a little spit and polish, this machine will be fine, Grail Station. Does anyone hear that? I questioned, tilting my head to the side. Hear what? A nearly deaf Conrad scoffed. Sounds like the beginnings of a great meal to me. I think I might have heard something too, Whitcomb frowned as he tried to listen. A buzzing noise, perhaps? Buzzing? Shrugged her. That's the sound of the crowd, I expect. Come on, an impatient Conrad said. We need to get going if we're going to set this up. The two men heaved the old barbecue over the grass. With a squeal, one of the wheels fell off, tipping it off balance. Conrad lost his grip, barbecue tilted, then gravity took over, sending the barbecue to the ground. The lid popped open, hanging by one hinge. The ominous buzzing grew as a large honeycomb was revealed on the inside. Bees, gasped Whitcomb. Duck! Herb fell to the grass, pulling his polo shirt over his head. Everyone for themselves, yelled the mayor's assistant as he launched himself off the teetering chair, running to escape the insects. Chapter 5 Cupcake Disaster Most of the bees chased after the poor assistant, attracted to a moving object. The massive swarm followed him through the park and onto the street as he raced away. Unfortunately, Mayor Whitcomb swatted at a few of the insects, causing him to get stung. Conrad stood stock still and somehow managed to get away without a single bite or sting. Herb had a couple on his hands to show for his trouble. During the melee, I had shrieked and tried Herb's method of turtling my tea over my face. It hadn't been the most effective for me probably because my shirt was too small to provide much in the way of protection. The Cupcake Queen of 2018 now had stings on her stomach, arms, neck, and a couple to the face. "'Get that thing away from me!' growled Whitcomb, pointing at the offending barbecue which had caused all the trouble. "'We could have had natural honey as a glaze,' suggested Conrad as he and Herb straightened the barbecue. 
That would be good, agreed Herb as they moved along, a few of the bees lazily following them. Well, the mayor cleared his throat as he straightened his tie and cuffs. Well, are you allergic to bee stings? I asked, carefully touching one on my aching chin. No, I'm not. Are you? A concerned Whitcomb looked at me. You appear to have taken a few stings. I have been stung before. I tugged on my shirt to cover the stings on my stomach. I guess I will get started on bringing over the cupcakes. That is a good idea, nodded Whitcomb. He picked up the wheel of the broken barbecue and tossed it under his table. I will throw that out later. I wondered who was going to hang the other side of the now trailing banner, then decided not to ask. If I was not careful, Whitcomb might have me up there trying to tie it. As I ferried trays of cupcakes back and forth from my orange beetle, I passed the thickening crowds. It was early and starting to get busy. I hoped Molly would be able to find a spot to park later so that she wouldn't have to walk a long way to get to the mayor's booth. On what felt like my twentieth trip, I accidentally bumped into a man. He was tiny and thin. Oh, excuse me. Where are you going? He yelled at me. He paused, eyes widening, as he pushed a shock of black hair out of his face. How big is that pimple on your chin? Wow. Can someone get a shot of that? It should be in the Guinness Book of World Records. Three of the people surrounding him swung their phones my way. It's a bee sting, I replied tersely. Sure thing, scoffed the guy, and I lift weights for a living, cupcake queen. I have no idea what you do for a living. Irritated, I replied. I ignored the fact that he was calling me by the name of my shirt. Please, excuse me. I need to get past so I can go to the mayor's booth. You don't know who this is? Amazed, one of the people pulled their phone down a little to gawk at me. World famous eating champion Jason Kennedy, he introduced himself, laying a hand on his chest. I'm so famous, I have recently insured my stomach, esophagus, and mouth. You can do that? I asked, a little dumbstruck. It costs a lot, shrugged Jason. However, I'm worth it. Cool. I stretched an unfelt smile across my lips. I still need to get past you and your friends. Maybe you should let us pass, one of the entourage said snidely. Please. I stepped to the side, hoping they would just go away. I needed to finish the display and get back to the Happy Camper Resort so I could take over for Topher in the office. Hey, Kennedy! A teen boy came racing over. Can I get your autograph? Sure, Jason smiled, whipping out a permanent marker. Within moments, he had scrawled his name on the adolescent's magazine. Wow, thanks, breathed the boy, holding the magazine like a piece of treasure. Here, I'll sign for you too, since I'm such a nice guy. Jason scribbled his signature on my plastic cupcake container. Hey, I snatched it away from him, too late. You just defaced my property. I made it more valuable, he corrected me. You are going down, Kennedy, a loud voice shrouded from across the street. I'm going to kill you. Jason blanched as he saw a beefy man headed his way. Uh-oh. <laughs> One of your adoring fans, I asked sweetly. She lied, Brown, shouted Jason. I have witnesses. I never took that woman home with me. That woman is my girlfriend, shouted Brown, cracking his thick knuckles. I got my own girlfriend. I don't need yours, pointed out Jason as he backed away. I thought you were married, questioned the boy with the magazine. We're going through a messy divorce, shrugged Jason. It's not my fault the ladies love a man who can put away 69 hot dogs in 10 minutes. Gross, I murmured. Yeah, I'm still six away from the world record, confided Jason, although scientists think that it is feasible to eat 83 in 10 minute time frame. You disgusting turd, Brown gave Jason a shove on the shoulder. Someday you're going to get what's coming to you. I would advise you to cool down, I interrupted. I pointed to a man in uniform not that far away. There is a police officer right there. There are more cops on duty than normal to help out with this event. Brown looked down at me. You one of his groupies? <laughs> not at all, I stated emphatically. I am just trying to do a job if he and his posse would just let me past. Let the zit lady go, advised Brown, glaring down at Jason. This isn't over. See you at the eating contest, grinned Jason. I'm still going to beat you. Not this year, Brown's eyes narrowed. Uh, Mr. Policeman is right over there, 
I reminded them before making my way around the group. The last thing I needed was to be involved in that drama. Perhaps a half hour later, I put the finishing cupcake on the display. I was sweaty, hot, had a dozen or so bee stings, and now had sore feet, too. The entire car had been emptied of cupcakes, and the full trays were stacked neatly under Whitcomb's tables. If I was lucky, the icing would hold up in the shade. The empty trays were ready for refilling at the campground kitchen. "'We can't be thrown out of the competition for a few bees,' insisted Conrad as they walked by the mayor's booth. "'The judge was very clear,' sighed Herb. "'Our barbecue has to be in good condition. He said the one we brought was a piece of old junk.' "'It has experience,' grumbled Conrad. "'You just don't throw out things because they have some age.' "'We need to buy a new grill,' stated Herb, pulling out his wallet. "'How much do you have?' "'Not enough,' groused Conrad. "'The handy hardware store has jacked up the prices on all the grilling stuff since the barbecue fest started. Next week there'll be a big sale when no one needs the stuff any more.' I shook my head in disbelief as the pair headed toward the exit. "'Just about done?' asked Mayor Whitcomb. "'Are you certain you still want to man the booth?' I wondered." Wickham had taken a couple of stings to the face and back of his hands. His face, especially, was not looking the best. Somehow, he still was not sweating in the suit he was wearing. I, however, was soaked, and would likely need a shower and a change into my last tea before heading to the Happy Camper Resort office. The good news was, there was not one but two electric fans in the office. Wickham gave a smile made grotesque by the two stings he had taken to his upper lip. I can't let the competition get ahead of me. It's an election year. I nodded uncertainly. I was not going to question his decision to stay, not when I had a sizable check he had given me burning a hole in my pocket. Good luck. I'll send Molly with the rest of the cupcakes shortly. Perfect, replied Whitcomb. Now, I wonder where my assistant went. If his assistant was smart, he was likely at home with the air conditioning. I decided as a bead of sweat made its way down my back. After a quick deposit at the check at the bank, I headed for the pharmacy. The pharmacist gave me a cream and advised using a couple of over-the-counter medications for the pain from the bee stings. Otherwise, they would just have to heal on their own. In the car, I liberally spread the cream over the bumps I had before heading back to the campground kitchen. I brought a bunch of empty trays in, putting them on the kitchen counter. "'What happened?' asked Molly as she looked at my face. You like like you have a pimp of the year on your chin. You were fine this morning. <laughs> Beasting, I answered, popping lids off the trays so we could load them up with more cupcakes. There are bees? questioned Molly in horror. I'm not going if there are bees. You have to go, I explained. Mayor Whitcomb paid extra for you to hand out the cupcakes so he wouldn't get his hands all sticky. Plus, the bees are gone now. They chased the mayor's assistant away. That sounds like a story, Molly gave me an uncertain look, helping to load up the remaining cupcakes. Ask Conrad or Herb when you see them. I think I might up their rent this month in retaliation, I shrugged. Really? A surprised Molly asked. No. I sighed, tired and in pain. Do you have any clean laundry? I need some clean clothes to wear at the office today before I can do my own laundry at the laundromat. I am literally down to my last shirt, and it's not presentable. "'Sure, I have got clean laundry, but I doubt it will fit you,' Molly eyed my figure. "'I think you've gained a little weight. That shirt is tight.' "'I have not gained weight,' I stubbornly replied. "'This shirt shrunk in the wash.' "'Sure, and I plan on going for a walk on the moon on my birthday as a vacation for myself,' a sarcastic Molly responded. "'Fine,' I snapped, a little annoyed at my friend. "'I will wear my nasty paint shirt for the rest of the day.' I can loan you a shirt, huffed Molly, but I can't do the cupcake thing with the mare. I promised to be on Team Mighty Oaks, remember? I need to keep that hussy Melinda Stratton away from Chaz. I sighed. I have to be in the office today. It's not fair to Topher to ask him to do more than this morning. He isn't a member of this campground. What about Conrad? grumbled Molly. The office is like his second home. Where is he? At the barbecue fest, like everyone else, I explained. They all have abandoned chore chart duties in the name of fun and competition. I really can't blame them. I just wish I could clone some people to work reliably for me without much pay. Those are called teenagers, advised Rye Molly, although you need to sort them out to find the good ones. I can't exactly hire someone this late of date, 
Some frustration crept into my voice. What am I going to do? I can't be in two places at once. I don't know, but neither can I, sympathized Molly. I already promised. Fine, my shoulders slumped. I will figure this out. You always do, chimed Molly as she brought a chair out to the car. I left Molly to finish bringing the cupcakes to the barbecue fest. On my way to the Happy Camper Resort office, I noticed how crowded the entire campground had become. There were people everywhere. Children were playing tag on the grass. Adults congregated around grills, making lunches. Picnic areas had people playing cards or board games while they chatted to one another. Others were walking past in swimwear headed for the beach. Some men were in the pool scrubbing it down. Wait a minute. I backed up, heading directly for the pool. What is going on here? Oh, sunburnt man in his bathing suit gave me a thumbs up. We're almost finished. Pretty soon the drain will be plugged and the water will be running. Hopefully by the end of the weekend there'll be some real water in here. Who asked you to clean the pool? I wondered. Already I had visions of someone hurting themselves and my being liable. We talked to the guy at the office, mentioned another man, turning the lobster red from the effects of the sun. He gave a small discount if we finished cleaning the pool. My husband, the cheap one, an unimpressed woman leaned on the fence beside me. He would rather spend his weekend cleaning a pool than be with me and the kids. Babe, you know I love you, grinned lobster guy. When we get the, some water in here, it will be like a wading pool for all the kids. I can look after them. You can spend some time shopping in town with your girlfriends. Catch. She tossed him a bottle of water. You should be using sunscreen. He caught the water bottle. You always worry about the sunscreen. She eyed him. You are going to regret not using the sunscreen. How big of a discount? I questioned. Considering we have no electrical... A pretty hefty one, the woman pursed her lips. This place is terrible. I'm supposed to be on vacation, not primitive camping, while my husband does manual labor. I nodded in sympathy, then quickly made my getaway. Topher had a lot to explain for, I decided, as I entered the office. Leaning back in the old office chair with a pencil in hand and squinting at Conrad's crossword puzzle, Topher gave me a big smile. How's the barbecue fest? Topher... I cleared my throat. There are people in my pool. Oh, yeah, he nodded, one hand absently stroking Cupcake, who was sleeping on his lap. Cookie was snoozing on her side on the cool floor in front of a fan. I might have given some people incentive to get a few things done around here in return for a lesser rent. You are not authorized to do that, I groaned. I've seen you do it multiple times, pointed out Topher. Plus, I had to. We had spots without electrical since you forgot to call the electrician this morning, and the pool isn't open. People are expecting a certain level of service. I moaned and took a seat in one of the two scruffy swivel office chairs. Ignoring the stuffing that was coming out of the chair, I slumped into a somewhat comfortable position. I did forget to call Evan. I suppose I ought to do that right away. Don't worry. Topher penciled the word into the newspaper crossword. I have everyone settled. All the reservations are done, and no one is expected until next weekend. So I would hold off on getting that electrical finished just yet. It's pretty quiet around here. If I were you, I would go have a nice, relaxing afternoon. Maybe do a little tanning on the beach. Since I was supposed to be handing out cupcakes soon, it was highly unlikely my afternoon was going to be very relaxing. I looked at Cupcake, who let out a snore. Why do you have my dogs? B dropped them off about an hour ago, and I told her I would look after them, replied Topher. They and I are having a great time staying cool with the fans. Cupcake really likes me. I sighed. Go, insisted Topher. I have everything under control. The office closes in a couple of hours, and then the dogs and I'll go for a walk. When you're ready to pick them back up, come find me. Are you sure about this? I asked. I don't want to impose upon you any more than what I already have. You promised me big goods, remembered? Grinned Topher. You deliver on those, and we are all good. Okay, I agreed. I got out of my chair and decided I had better check on Molly. I needed some clothes from her and a ride into town so I could help out at Mayor Wickham's booth. As I exited the office, I could see Molly driving my car down the dirt road towards me. I waved and she slowed down. Hey... Is there a room for my laundry? I asked as I slid into the passenger seat. 
Can I borrow those clothes and grab a shower before we go? I'm not feeling so fresh. Molly looked at her watch. There's no time. You can grab your laundry, but we need to go. I'm supposed to be at the Mighty Oaks booth right now. I need a shower, I stated flatly. If I'm going to be handing out food and representing our business, I should at least look presentable. Melinda Stratton is smiling at Chaz right now, Molly reminded me. I need to be there to make sure she doesn't get her claws into him. Fine, I bet off. I still want my laundry. Then I can at least do my washing after I'm done at the mayor's booth. Okay, huffed Molly. I grabbed my laundry basket at my camper and stored it by my feet in the car while we drove to Oaks Crossing. At the park, Molly was able to find a decent place to park the beetle since someone was just pulling out of a spot. I got out to feed the meter and noticed Molly leaving. Hey, I exclaimed. Where are you going? We have to deliver the rest of the cupcakes. I have to go, shrugged Molly as she tossed me the keys before sprinting away. Great, I muttered. I grabbed a tray of cupcakes and made my way through the thick crowd to Mayor Whitcomb's booth. There you are, a relieved mayor said. You can help with handing out the cupcakes you brought. I really should grab the rest from the car first, I mentioned. It wouldn't be very good if their frosting were to melt. Fine, fine, nodded Whitcomb. Have you seen my assistant? He hasn't returned since the bee thing. Sorry, I shook my head. I haven't. Whitcomb sighed. It's hard to get good help these days. It can be, I agreed dryly. Can I have a cupcake? A little girl asked. Of course, smiled Whitcomb as he handed her a cupcake. As long as you tell your mommy and daddy to vote for Whitcomb for mayor. Her face scrunched up. Do I have to? Yes, or you can give back the cupcake, Whitcomb told her. It's called a transaction. One cupcake for advertising. Mayor Whitcomb, I gasped. Whitcomb saw my face and chuckled heartily. Just kidding. It's a little joke. Enjoy the cupcake. The girl scrunched up her face before turning her attention to me. What's wrong with your face? You look like you have a huge pimple on your chin. It's a bee sting, I answered dryly. It's gross, she commented before licking the icing on the cupcake. You should go find your parents, I remarked a little less friendly than I could have. My parents aren't here, she explained. I'm here with my Aunt Lizzie. Then you should find her. I grabbed a cupcake, shoving it at the little girl. You can give her a cupcake. She's right there, the little girl pointed, with Luca. Ever since Tom dumped her, Auntie Lizzie has been trying to attract Luca's attention. At least that's what my mom says. I turned to see Lizzie Galbraith flipping her long blonde hair as she laughed at something Detective Luca Amand had said. She looked fresh, clean, and wholesome in a sundress and sandals. I felt grimy and sweaty in my cupcake queen of 2018 shirt and shorts, a bee sting on my chin. There was no comparison to be had between me and Lizzie Galbraith. You have to admit, they would make a striking couple, commented an oblivious Whitcomb. They are both tall, athletic, and good-looking, which was how the three of us were looking at Armand and Lizzie when a man came stumbling towards us, reaching out blindly before collapsing into the pyramid that was my cupcake display. Chapter 6 Into the Fountain Cupcakes were strewn everywhere. The man had fallen to the ground as bystanders stared in shock. I knelt beside him. Wiping the buttercream icing away from his neck, I felt for a pulse, but the world-eating contest champion, Jason Kennedy, was dead. "'Can you do CPR?' asked Mayor Whitcomb. I pushed him over, tilting his head back and looking into his airway to see if it was blocked by something he had eaten. Instead, I saw what looked to be a couple of what were, in my opinion, to be sewing needles lodged in the back of his mouth. "'I don't think we should. Call for an ambulance.' I don't have a phone, a stunned Whitcomb told me. My assistant handles any phone matters. I felt my pockets, but remembered that I had left my cell phone in my car. I looked up at the mayor, then get Detective Armand. Is he going to die? the girl asked, leaning closer. You really should go find your aunt. I avoided telling her that technically, without a pulse, Jason was already dead. I felt his neck again just to be sure. Nothing. In the time it took me to do this, Whitcomb had brought back the detective. "'What happened?' asked Armand as he crouched beside me, looking at Jason's body. 
Maybe, if you hadn't been flirting with Lizzie Galbraith, you would have seen what happened. The words flew out of my mouth, and for a moment I was horrified by my jealous tone. Flirting? An incredulous Armand repeated. He did a double-take as he spotted the bee sting on my chin. Wow, what happened to you? Bee sting, I curtly replied. My mortification at my previous accusation was replaced by Armand's reaction to my appearance. I decided to turn the conversation back to what was important, the man who had crashed into my cupcakes. He's dead. Armand turned his attention back to the body and felt for a pulse. There is something in his mouth, I mentioned. Tell me what occurred from the beginning, asked Armand as he checked the inside of Jason's mouth. He pulled out his cell phone, turning on the flashlight app to get a better look. Just how long has it been since he collapsed? Just a minute ago, I explained. We were talking, then he fell into the cupcake display before ending up on the grass. I got you right away, confirmed Whitcomb. Switching off the flashlight app, Armand pressed a couple of buttons on his phone before speaking tersely into it. I need the ambulance to gate C. There was a reply, and Armand put away the phone. He started CPR compressions on Jason's chest. Should we do the breathing part of the CPR? I worriedly asked. No, stated Armand. I don't want the wires to move further down his airway, nor do I want anyone accidentally aspirating one of them. Just chest compressions. Moments later, the paramedics arrived, taking over. Within minutes, Jason Kennedy was loaded up into the ambulance, which drove away, sirens blaring. We all watched for a moment before Amon took out a notebook and a pen. He looked directly at Whitcomb. Where were you when Jason came over here? Standing right here, replied Whitcomb. Do you know the victim? questioned Armand. No, clarified Whitcomb. He could be anyone. Jason Kennedy, I answered. His name was Jason Kennedy, and he was one of the eating contestant entrants. Someone said he was a world champion? Armand turned his attention to me. Did he say anything before he collapsed? No, I replied. Or if he did, I didn't hear it. He didn't gesture to anyone or do anything odd, inquired Armand. We didn't really see, I mentioned with an apologetic shrug. We were looking elsewhere. You were looking at am I Aunt Lizzie, piped up the little girl. The guy was grabbing his stomach before he fell into the cupcakes. Now there's a real mess. What did he look like? Can you show me? Armand looked at the girl with more interest. He had his hands here. She pressed her tummy with both hands, making a face. It looked like he was in pain. Mid to upper abdomen, noted Armand as he wrote something down. What does that mean? The little girl tilted her head to the side. It's just where his hands were as a measurement, clarified Armand. What is your name? Tabitha Galbraith. She stood a little taller as her aunt joined her. You were talking to my Aunt Lizzie earlier. Oh, Armand stopped writing his book. I suppose I was. She has a crush on you, sang Tabitha. Tabby! Lizzie clapped a hand over her niece's mouth. The pretty blonde blushed. She makes things up sometimes. I do not, an indignant Tabby said, pushing her aunt's hand away. Lizzie had an apologetic smile. I will talk to her. It's true, insisted Tabby. Zipface and the mare were looking at you and Luca. They didn't even look until the guy fell into the cupcakes. Tabby, you can't call someone Zipface, Lizzie trailed off as she eyed my chin. It's a bee sting, I repeated, unamused. She's smelly, too, Tabby wrinkled her nose. It does look a little. Armand studied my face. Did you get some salve or something for it? Seriously? I'm not certain what came over me. I had been sweaty, sore, frustrated by everyone having more important things to do than keep their promises, and full of bee stings. I had just had enough. I saw red. Armand took a step back as I advanced on him. I apologize. I gave him a hard push on the chest, driving him back further. I might believe that if you weren't holding your hands up in surrender with such a guilty look. Now, Ivy, Armand cleared his throat. His lips twitched as he looked at my shirt. Or, should I say, Cupcake Queen. I pushed him, as hard as I could. And the next thing I knew, Detective Luca Armand was flat out in the Central Park Fountain. I stared at him a moment as he flailed around before I burst into tears. Ivy, sputtered Elmond. Tabby laughed hysterically. Oh, dear, muttered Tawny Tilbury. 
The elderly lady came out of the crowd, wrapping an arm around me. I think Ivy needs a little break. I nodded miserably. Did you bring your car, dear? asked Tawny, her big eyes blinking at me behind her glasses. Why don't you give me a lift home? You can have a soothing cup of tea. I would rather have a shower and get my laundry done, I sobbed. Then that's what we will do, agreed Tawny, slowly leading me away. Miss Thurman, began an irate Armand who was now standing in the fountain, but he was cut off by Tawny. Not now, Luca, the elderly woman said firmly. You can apologize later. She pushed me into the fountain, he complained. You probably deserved it, sniffed Tawny. Men often do. I wish I had pushed a few men into fountains during my lifetime. I had a watery laugh, trying to imagine this sweet elderly lady who ran Tawny's tea house dunking men into fountains. Tawny patted me on the shoulder. Don't you worry, dear. After a nice hot bath, some clean clothes, and a good night's sleep, you will feel better. I hope so, I managed to say. Do you know any good remedies for bee stings? I do, nodded Tawny. Honey mixed with baking soda and a paste can reduce the swelling, pain, and any itching you might have. I should try that, I murmured, suddenly feeling exhausted as we approached my car. Do you want me to drive, dear? wondered Tawny. It's a bit tricky, I sighed, unlocking the doors of the Beetle. It's a three-speed semi-automatic, which means it's like a manual drive, but no clutch. How strange, remarked Tawny. Whatever will they think of next? It's vintage, I explained. The car is so old it doesn't have air conditioning. No wonder you are upset, decided Tawny. I would be too if I had to be in this heat all day. Since I already knew where Tawny lived, I didn't need to ask her for directions. I had been to her house before, after finding her missing cat, Winifred. Winifred was Tawny's pride and joy, a purebred Persian who had actually helped solve a previous murder in the town of Oaks Crossing. Once at Tawny's, I hauled in my laundry. As promised, she let me use her washing machine. Then she sent me upstairs with a hot cup of chamomile tea, some biscuits with jam, and firm instructions to use her bubble bath supplies and candles however I saw fit. I don't have any clothes to wear, I groaned. I will get you a robe. Don't skimp on the Epsom salts, she advised. The first floor on the left is the guest bedroom. Once you're done, go and have a lie down. Thank you, Tawny, I gratefully said. Every woman needs a little time out from her life, replied Tawny. Now go, relax. I will put the laundry in the dryer when it's time. With that, I chose from a well-stocked supply of bath oils, bath bombs, foamy bubble bath soaps, and scented candles to create a small oasis in the bathroom. Tawny had a clawfoot tub which was deep for added bathing luxury. I slipped into the water and thought about poor Jason Kennedy. It was true I hadn't liked the conceited fellow, but choking on needles was not a nice way to die. I hoped the emergency response people could revive him. I wondered why he would have died from the needles. I remembered a kid from my secondary school swallowing a shaving razor accidentally. He had been trying to switch out the dull blade for the new blade. I guess he had the habit of holding one of the blades between his teeth while he was making the switch. Then, oops, he swallowed it. Turns out most sharp objects will pass through the human body without incident. Only, on rare occasions, does something go wrong and require surgery. I remembered it because our biology teacher had made a sort of a three-day project out of the poor embarrassed kid. It was also a safety memo. Don't put sharp things that aren't meant to be swallowed between your lips or teeth. However, it was not like you swallowed needles and just automatically died. Something very strange was going on here. Had Jason swallowed the needles on purpose, or had someone else managed to get multiple needles into his food? The needles were unlikely to kill, especially so quickly, so why had Jason died? Had someone wanted to hurt Jason? He was not the nicest guy, and I could understand that people didn't like him. However, that was no reason to wish someone harm. The man earlier in the park who had confronted Jason about an affair with his girlfriend didn't seem like the type to put needles in someone's food. My impression of Brown was that he preferred to face his problems head-on. Perhaps Jason's wife? Jason had admitted that they were going through a messy divorce. I sighed. It was not my problem. I had enough to do at the Happy Camper Resort without getting caught up in another mystery. Maybe Jason would live. Sometimes hospitals work miracles. Finally, I finished off my bath, 
All clean and feeling better, I put on the robe Tawny had provided. Bringing my dishes downstairs, I found Tawny neatly folding my clean laundry. You didn't need to do that. It's fine, dear, said Tawny. I like to keep my hands busy. You choose out something to wear and have a nice nap in the gas room. Don't forget to put on some of the paste I made for those bastings. It's on the table. Thank you. I picked out some simple clothes and headed upstairs. I did as directed, putting the honey and baking soda mixture on my aching stings. Once in the soft bed, my brain turned again to the subject of Jason Kennedy. Who had wanted to hurt him so badly? I had brought my purse in from the car and now leaned over the side of the bed to grab it. Fishing through the bag's contents, I found my cell phone and began a search on the internet for Jason Kennedy. There were several articles about his food-eating achievements. Most of Jason's winning streak appeared to be from a couple of years ago. However, he had placed third recently at the barbecue chicken eating contest. The amount of prize money for these events were amazing, I reflected. Some commentaries showed the downside of competitive eating. Contestants could face all sorts of health hazards. I wrinkled my nose and passed on reading those as I had no interest in entering the sport myself, even for such sums of cash. There were articles about Jason's messy divorce and his new string of girlfriends. The amount of money his soon-to-be ex-wife wanted in the divorce settlement was a lot, and the way the newspapers wrote, it sounded like the judge was sympathetic to her cause. Jason stood to lose a lot of money to his wife, so if she were to get the money anyways, why would she want to hurt him? Unless she thought she could get all the money, I wondered. Or it was not about the money at all, but about revenge instead. I set the phone down and drowsily wondered how many other people wanted to hurt Jason. The last thing I remembered was Winifred, Tawny's prized cat, hopping onto the bed and settling in with a purr. Waking up in a room that is not my own was a bit disorientating. At first I wondered where I was. It was a grandmotherly room with doilies, quilts, lace curtain, antique furniture, and big flowers on the wallpaper. Then all the memories came flooding back. I groaned, putting a hand to my head. I had pushed Armand into a fountain. While he had deserved it for his comments, assaulting police officers was not my thing. Why had I been so mad at him? A picture of him and Lizzie Galbraith chatting it up flitted into my head. Deciding not to analyze my thoughts on that subject, I rolled out of bed wondering how long Tawny had let me sleep. I checked my cell phone, but it was out of battery. There was light coming through the window while birds merrily chirped. I could hear Tawny puttering around her kitchen. I washed my stings and reapplied the concoction Tawny had made, noting that the swelling had gone down considerably. Stomach rumbling, I headed downstairs to find out what the delicious smells were about. "'Good morning!' trilled Tawny as she took a couple of plates from the cupboard. "'You are just in time for brunch!' "'Brunch?' I asked in surprise. Apparently I had slumbered the entire night through. I hadn't realized I had slept that late. "'It's better that you did. I never eat breakfast or lunch.' I always combined the two into brunch. If you had woken earlier, I wouldn't have had anything prepared, explained Tawny. Do you need salt for your eggs, dear? I can't have it for my high blood pressure, but I always keep a little for guests. Salt would be nice, I nodded. Do you need any help? Oh, no, chuckled Tawny. Have a seat. The food is ready. We enjoyed a leisurely brunch. Tawny had outdone herself with eggs, toast, bacon, and pancakes. A cup of coffee and orange juice accompanied our feast, along with a bowl of fruit and some small containers of various yogurts. You really know how to treat a guest, I observed as I popped a grape into my mouth. I enjoy hospitality, replied Tawny. That's why I started the tea house. I get to have guests all the time. It's nice to take care of other people. I could understand that Tawny enjoyed her tea house. Living on her own, it was probably lonely, and her business brought her a sense of community. I thought about my own campground and how I enjoyed taking care of all the people in it. At least I did when they weren't complaining about the air conditioning, pool, or electrical. How do you deal with complaints at the tea house, Tawny? Are you having some issues at the campground? questioned Tawny in concern. A few, I sighed. We all know that Grandma hadn't been keeping up on maintenance and repairs. I'm trying to get things in order, but it takes time. I keep getting complaints about things that aren't finished yet. I don't want to get a bunch of bad reviews, so I have been very clear that everyone gets a discounted rate since not all the amenities are working yet. I still get complaints. You have to understand that sometimes people don't read the fine print, 
Tawny patted my hand. Sometimes they don't even understand the large print. I've had people come into my tea house expecting a full meal. One guy even ordered a steak. Just because I serve light meals like sandwiches and soups doesn't mean I'm going to be selling meat and potatoes. What do you do when that happens? I wondered. Well, when I have a complaint, I give the customers one of my coupons, answered Tawny. I have a bunch of them printed up, all numbered so I can check them off in my book, and they don't get duplicated. They're only good for a year, and they usually for 10 to 25 percent, depending how bad the complaint is. Then the customer feels a little better about the service. I only give them out to the worst offenders when it seems like a simple apology will not be enough to make the customer stop complaining. I would be handing out a lot of coupons, I sighed. I'm not sure I could afford to honor too many. That's the beauty of it, responded Tawny. Coupons expire, get lost, or get thrown away. I calculated that almost half are never redeemed. The trick is to make them small and flimsy. It's the same as all those gift cards. A percentage of those never get redeemed either, but the companies keep the money. Really? I sipped my orange juice and thought about it. I suppose it could work. Works for me, noted Tawny as she ate the last of her toast. I also add a margin in my prices for the amount of coupons that usually are redeemed. Thus, they are absorbed into my operating costs. You inflate your prices based on the number of coupons you expect to hand out. I realize that Tawny Tilbury, for all her seeming innocent absent-mindedness, might really be a shrewd businesswoman. Absolutely, confirmed Tawny. Otherwise, you are shrinking your profits. When you need your business to pay your bills, you think about these things. The smaller the profit, the less comfortable lifestyle you're going to have. Yet if your profit margin is too big, you might become uncompetitive. Customers don't come to uncompetitive businesses unless there is an extra sense of experience to go along with the purchase. People can buy tea at the local diners, cafes, or fast food places, or they can buy it for a higher price from me with the knowledge that is luxury tea with fresh baked goods, and a tea house will have the full experience of creating the tea to their own liking, pouring the tea and having it in fancy tea sets at a properly set tea table. They love the experience of pretending that it's more than just tea and a sandwich. It's a ritual. I charge appropriately for that. I need to make the Happy Camper Resort an experience, I mused. Something special that visitors are willing to pay the extra for. Eventually, agreed Tawny, First, you need to focus on getting it up to standards of the other campgrounds in the area. Then you can work on making it special. Thank you, Tawny. This was some really good advice, I noted. Tawny sipped her coffee. Now, shall we talk about the exciting gossip? I grimaced. Jason Kennedy? The guy who died in my cupcakes? Oh, dear, replied Tawny. You haven't heard. Haven't heard what? I wondered, a little surprised by her tone of voice. Tawny shook her head and patted my hand. He's not dead. Chapter 7 The World Famous Eating Competitor What do you mean he's not dead? I questioned. I felt his pulse. He had none. Detective Armand did CPR on him. It's not to say that he was not dead, explained Tawny. He was. My daughter, Connie, works at a nurse at the local hospital. The paramedics were able to get his heart beating again. It turns out he had a ruptured stomach from all the food he ate, and his body went into some sort of shock. He won first place, you know. <laughs> I guess that will help him with his medical bills, I murmured. What about the needles in his throat? Oh, you mean the wire from a barbecue brush? They took those out, replied Tawny. The elderly woman always seemed to have the lead on all the gossip. She even had her granddaughter put an app on her phone that let her listen in on the local police scanner. They used a magnet to reach the ones they could. The rest should pass on their own. That reminds me of the time my son ate a bunch of those metal jacks from the game where you used the ball to pick up jacks. What's it called? Jacks, I ventured. That is it. Those pointy little spike things were so nasty to accidentally step on, chuckled Tawny. I was certain they were going to rip his insides apart. Well, the doctor told me to wait, and sure enough, all those jacks passed through the boy just fine. The doctor said it was rare for anyone to have complications for eating something sharp. Not that he advised doing such things on purpose, mind you. Why would Jason Kennedy eat a bunch of wires from a barbecue brush? 
I shook my head, unable to comprehend why anyone would willingly swallow dangerous objects. Did Jason say anything about that? I don't think he could, shrugged Tawny. He probably has to rest his throat for a couple of days. If you want, there are visiting hours at the hospital. You could ask him yourself. I don't know. I set down my own cup. I doubt a world-famous eating contestant would want to talk to me, although I am glad that he is alive after all. "'Aren't you going to investigate?' asked Tawny. I mulled over the idea of getting involved. I do have a campground to run. I have a tea house to run. It is a lot of fun to insert oneself into the gossip,' admitted Tawny, "'especially in attempted murder.' "'We don't know that someone was trying to kill Jason,' I cautioned. "'You think he ate those wires on purpose? Why would he do a thing like that?' scoffed Tawny. "'Maybe it was a world-record thing?' I shrugged. Jason liked to brag about how many hot dogs he could eat. Maybe this was his next thing to chase fame. "'I find that those who brag the loudest usually aren't as good as they say they are,' advised Tawny. "'Well, he's still alive, so it's not really my problem,' I decided. "'I only investigate if I choose to.' "'If you say so,' Tawny gave me a knowing look. "'Luca was over earlier today.' "'And what did the detective want?' I sipped the last of my coffee, trying not to be curious and failing. He asked how you were, responded Tawny. I think he may have felt sorry for his earlier remarks to you. Somehow I doubted from the way Armand had complained in the fountain yesterday. He was suddenly having a change of heart over our interaction. Armand lived right beside Tawny. If anything, Tawny was probably trying to smooth things over between us. She was a bit of a matchmaker, like many other senior citizens of the town. "'It's true,' reiterated Tawny at my disbelieving look. "'He's very concerned about you and wanted to know if there was anything he could do for you.' "'He probably thinks I'm crazy,' I slumped in my chair. "'At least he's thinking about you instead of Lizzie,' pointed out Tawny. I digested this as I finished my food. "'Do you want some help with the dishes?' "'Look at the time!' exclaimed Tawny as she checked her wristwatch. "'I had better get to the tea house. Would you mind giving me a ride, dear?' Sure. I grabbed my dishes, insisting on helping. Soon enough, I had my clean laundry in the car and was depositing Tawny at her tea house. On the way to the Hampi Camper Resort, I found myself taking a detour to the Oaks Crossing General Hospital. It was unlikely that Jason Kennedy would see me, yet I decided to try. I blamed curiosity and my talk with Tawny Tilbury this morning. After all, if she and I hadn't gossiped about the subject, I would likely be at the Happy Camper Resort right now working on my own problems, rather than concerning myself with Jason's issues. The hospital was small. While I had been to the after-hours clinic in town, this was the first time I was at the hospital itself. It was easy enough to find the lobby. After speaking to the clerk, who happened to be a niece of B, I found out the room number for Jason. While it was not hospital policy to give out room numbers to unapproved visitors— B's niece thought that since I had solved two murders and found a missing cat, I should be granted some slack if I had decided to investigate what had happened to Jason Kennedy. It appeared I was getting a bit of a reputation. One that was a little bit deserved, I might add. I had found Winifred the missing cat. I had also solved the murders of Ethel Murley and Bart Baker. Who knows, maybe I would assist in finding out what had really happened with Jason Kennedy. Jason was awake when I came into his room. His posse were absent for the moment, something which I was grateful for. Hello, Jason. He looked at me with a bit of confusion, then recognition lit his face. Cupcake Queen of 2018. <laughs> that is right. I nodded as I sat down in one of the uncomfortable visiting chairs. How are you doing? You collapsed right into my cupcake display. Did I? A surprised Jason asked. I'm sorry if I did that. I hope I didn't cause you any inconvenience. A little, I shrugged. I wondered if the medication he was on was making him so amenable and mellow. I just thought I would come by and see if you were okay. Well, my stomach took a beating, a pale Jason remarked. Shouldn't have tried to eat so many wings. I was going for the world record of 501. I thought I had it in the bag. I had this new technique. I picked up the wings from these two really old nice guys because I liked their sauce. It wasn't too spicy or bland, you know, just the right heat level. The doctor did surgery on your stomach, I asked, to keep the conversation going. Says I can't compete anymore, groused Jason. What do these doctors know? I'm going to get an expert to look into it. That's probably a good idea, I agreed. 
I thought you had insurance to cover your stomach if anything went wrong. I do, sighed Jason. Only if it's in the normal routine of things or at an eating competitions. I don't think ingesting metal is normal. I'll have to check with the insurance company. Where do you think the needles came from? I carefully questioned. Needles? What needles? He frowned in confusion. The ones in your throat when you collapsed, I explained. Those were needles, Jason answered. They're barbecue bristles. Someone, likely those old dudes, cleaned their grill and somehow the wire bristles from the brush ended up in their meat. Too bad they were negligent with their cooking tools. I told the police all about it early today. Wow, that is a bad coincidence, I murmured. Tell me about it. This could end my career, lamented Jason, just when I was about to get hot again. You were having a bit of a lull, I quizzed. I saw online that you hadn't taken a championship in a while. Competition world's gotten fiercer, he complained. Thanks to the internet, everyone thinks they can do this. It's a real art. It takes dedication and training to become a champion, especially at more than one category. I believe you, I replied. I did please third a couple months ago, mentioned Jason. Prize was barely spending money. I have to pay for travel, hotels, advertising, my coaching. It all adds up. Do you have another job besides food competition? One with benefits for the hospital bill, I wondered. Jason had a derisive laugh. When would I have time for a job? This is my career. I'm a champion. All I need is a little time to get back on the podium. As for the hospital bill, I'll let my manager worry about that. You have a manager? I was surprised. It was like Jason thought he was some sort of superstar. Maybe in the food-eating world he was. Of course I have a manager, replied Jason. Who else would book my competitions? I see, I murmured. Jason sighed dramatically. I'm exhausted. I need my wrist so I can heal in time for the next competition. I took the hint. I said my goodbyes and hopes for a speedy recovery. As I drove to the Happy Camper Resort, I reflected that Jason was probably in a tight spot financially. It didn't appear that he was winning enough prize money to keep up to the lifestyle that he had become accustomed to. Nor was it likely that he had enough money for his ex-wife who was taking him to the cleaners, according to the articles I had read. I wondered who the two men who were who had supplied Jason with the wings that he had eaten. Jason had said that they were old, yet I didn't trust his opinion on that. He seemed the type to exaggerate. Like children who think that age 40 is ancient, or last week was eons ago. First, I stopped at the office, hoping that someone was manning it. I'd planned on being there most of the day with my bosties. It was cooler for them with two fans in the shade anyways. I found Conrad with a crossword at the desk. Hi, Conrad. I didn't expect to see you here, I observed. I thought you would be with Herb at the barbecue fest. We got disqualified, grumbled Conrad. Whole bunch of bull, if you ask me. What do you mean? I asked in concern. Someone said that some wire bristles from the cleaning brush accidentally got stuck in their wings, snorted Conrad. How unlikely is that? In order for that to happen, I would have to cut off the wires and shove them directly into the meat. There's no accidentally about it. That was you and Herb, I said faintly, my stomach bottoming out. They say so, Conrad let out a humph. I gave the police our grill cleaning brush and dared them to find any bristles missing. I bought it new yesterday morning, along with a ridiculously priced barbecue from the handy hardware store. The grill was so clean it never needed any brushing. The whole thing is hogwash. What happened? I questioned. Conrad glowered. As of right now, the police just confiscated our equipment as evidence. Herb and I have been told not to leave town. Are the police going to charge you with anything? I wanted to know. They haven't yet, groused Conrad. If Jepson has anything to say about it, they won't. Jepson Gray was an 80-year-old retired lawyer who occasionally helped those he liked. He had helped get Molly and I out of jail last month. It was a silly incident where Molly and I hadn't even been charged with any crime. In return, I had given Jepson some baked goods. Conrad, this is serious. It sure is, noted Conrad. The Oaks Crossing Police Department is full of fools. We need a better police force. I plan on telling Mayor Whitcomb that at the next mayor race debate. What did Jepson say when you told him what happened? I inquired. While well, he might be old, Jepson was not lacking in the facilities department. He would know if a case could be built against Urban Conrad. The grill brush was new. There was no bristles missing. 
Besides, why would we want to hurt the guy? Shrugged Conrad. He paid a nice price for our barbecue wings and recommended us to others. What did Jepson actually say? I repeated. Conrad sighed. We gave Jason the wings. Our brush is missing no bristles. There was more than adequate time and opportunity for others to mess with the wings between us giving him the food and Jason consuming it. Jepson says they might try us for negligence, causing bodily harm, but he will get a toss for lack of evidence. Good, I said in relief. How have things been at the office today? Quiet until you came, Conrad gestured to his crossword. I almost have it finished. Any complaints? I asked in trepidation. Conrad shrugged. None worth worrying about. My shoulders sagged a little. I was going to have to figure out this coupon thing. I didn't want to have bad reviews. Reviews could be the difference between someone choosing my campground or another place to rent during their vacation. Thanks, Conrad. Are you going to be here for a little while, I wondered? Sure, grunted Conrad, penciling in another word. Nothing much else to do. Okay, thanks again, Conrad. I gave him a wave as I headed back to my car. I made my way to the tenting area to find Topher. I felt a little guilty for having him look after Cupcake and Cookie the entire night while I was at Tawny's. The doggies could be a bit of a handful if you didn't know how to handle them. They needed their walks and playtime to get their energy out. I had thought about making a dog park area at the campground for all the dogs here. I felt that it would be an added attraction. I stepped around a cooler and approached Topher's tent. Hello, Topher! He's not there, another tenter helpfully supplied as they sprawled on the grass with a paperback in their hands. Oh, thanks. I looked at the book in surprise. Is that the ghoulish grave digger? Yeah, nodded the guy, barely looking up. Some old lady lent it to me. She's got a library worth of crime novels. I'll bring it back when I'm done. Her name is B, I informed the tenter. Hey, you wouldn't have to know where Topher went, would you? Think he went to the barbecue fest, the guy said with a shrug. Great, I sighed. Do you know what he did with Cookie and Cupcake, the two Boston Terrier dogs he had with him? Took him with, I guess. Again, the shrug was about the only response as he continued to read. Okay, thanks. I left the tenting area, noting one spot that had a lot of litter. I called out to the tent, but no one was currently there. Making a mental note to follow up with that person, I grabbed a bag from my car and cleaned up the trash before heading back to my camper. I dropped off the trash in my laundry. Deciding I should find Topher and my dogs, I headed back to Oaks Crossing. Finding a parking spot was terrible. It looked like half the town, plus the tourists, were all here. I managed to squeak into a spot near the crafty corner. Ava, the owner of the store, appeared to be very busy with a crowd of people inside. I gave her a wave through the front window before heading towards the barbecue fest. I had no idea how he was going to spot Topher in the crowd, and wondered at the wisdom of his bringing Cupcake and Cookie here for so many people. Aromas competed with one another as barbecues grilled. Marinated sauces were for sale in jars. There was a deep frying station where they could deep fry anything you wanted, from chocolate bars or ice cream to pickles or entire burgers. It was a food dream. I bypassed a vegetarian grilling station, trying to see through the crowd. Excuse me. I carefully cut through a lineup of people waiting for a taste of barbecue chicken. Continuing down the aisle between booths, I could hear a voice announcing over the stereo system that the next food contest was about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, have we got a treat for you, the announcer said with enthusiasm. While the best grilled chocolate sauce winner was announced, we were getting ready for the hamburger eating contest. For the contest, contestants can only eat one burger at a time. They may have water in a provided cup, but no dunking of the burger allowed. Contestants can have condiments of their choice on their burger, but no veggies or cheese. The contest lasts ten minutes, with the person who eats the most hamburgers as the winner. Last year's contest winner ate an astounding twenty-two burgers. My stomach rebelled at the thought. While I enjoyed eating, I was now about to stuff myself to the point of absurdity. All the more power to the people who chose to do the contest, I thought privately as I continued to scour the crowd. The announcer began to announce who the contestants would be. We've got local favorite, Big Mike from Mike's Garage. The announcer paused as the crowd cheered. Lady Lisa is a two-time burger-eating champion and won last year. The crowd cheered again. Hey, Ivy, came Topher's friendly voice. I swung around to find him. 
Relieved, I smiled. Hi, Topher. I have been looking for you. Topher's smile got wider. Cool. I was hoping to run into you here. Where are Cupcake and Cookie? I wondered. I didn't think it'd be wise to bring them with all the people here, explained Topher. I'd hate for one of them to get stepped on accidentally. I left them with Herb. Offered, and since he had puppy set before, I thought it would be a good idea. B was going to join them while they go fishing. B was going fishing? I asked in surprise. I think she was just going to keep Herb company, confided Topher. She had one of her murder mysteries along. Great, I nodded as I thought that maybe I'd found the reason B was taking a little more care in her appearance. Perhaps something was going on between her and Herb. I kind of liked the thought. That is a good idea. Thank you for watching Cupcake and Cookie for so long. I hadn't been planning on staying away overnight. No problem, shrugged Topher. I enjoy looking after the doggies. We played fetch and took a few walks through the forest after our shift in the office. It was fun. Nice. Can I buy you lunch as a thank you? I offered. I was going to give you some cupcakes, but they melted in the car. Lunch sounds great, Topher readily agreed. Starting to get hungry with all this food around. And the world-eating champion, Jason Kennedy, the announcer shouted. I whipped my head around, trying to see the stage. Did they just say Jason Kennedy? He's supposed to be in the hospital. Looks like they let him out early, noted Topher. He ruptured his stomach in the last eating contest. I tried to push through the crowd of people so I could get a better look. Topher took my arm, pulling me back a little before taking my place. He easily pushed through the crowd, letting me follow him. Stepping out of the way, he brought me forward so I could see the stage which had been set up in the park for all the various competitions that were taking place. He's crazy, I shook my head, as I saw Jason Kennedy waving to the crowd before taking his seat behind a mountain of hamburgers on a plate. Chapter 8 Kisses Do you want to watch them before we go to lunch? asked Hofer, leaning in close since it was hard to hear over the noise of the crowd and announcers. It might be interesting to see who wins. We need to stop him, I exclaimed. Pushing against the crowd, I tried to get to the stage. Get ready, contestants, shouted the announcer. Eat! Hey, I yelled, trying to get closer. Hey, he shouldn't be eating. Jason Kennedy just had surgery on his stomach. He did? questioned Topher in alarm as he tried to help me get to the stage. Is he allowed to eat like this? Hey! I waved my arms as security blocked off the stage. Jason shouldn't eat. He just got out of the hospital for stomach surgery. He signed a waiver, the security man stepped in front of me. You're gonna let him eat until his stomach explodes again? I was incredulous. That is nuts. Everyone signs a waiver. It's their choice to try to win the contest. We live in a free country, the guard told me. The waiver of liability could be invalid if Jason Kennedy is found to be on any prescription that inebriates his ability to think. I recited something I had managed to remember from my time in business college before I flunked out. The contract would be void. That means if anything happens to Jason, it is within his right to sue anyone in association to this contest. The security guard blinked. She is correct, added Topher. The waiver he signed would be voided from the beginning, as though it had never existed at all. The contest would be considered negligent for letting him compete, especially when it is common knowledge that he just had surgery on his stomach. If anything happens to Kennedy, there could be millions on the line. Does it make a difference if Jason insured his stomach, I wondered? <laughs> it does, nodded Topher. In fact, it makes it worse for the organizers of the event, depending on if they find if the event was at fault or if Jason was at fault. The insurance company will calculate a payout to Jason, then launch a lawsuit to get that money back from the contest. Insurance companies tend to have a lot of lawyers. It just depends if Jason is of sound mind or if he was inebriated by drugs. Wait here, the security guard told us before going to the stage to urgently talk to another person with organizer written on their t-shirt. Where did you learn about contracts? inquired Topher. <laughs> Business school, I answered with a shrug. My mom wanted me to go to college and would only fund it if it was a business college. I ended up leaving before I got my degree. I guess some things just stuck. We watched as the security guard talked to one of the event organizers. Enough of this, decided Topher. If we wait any longer, the contest will be over. 
We both went forward to the stage steps. Just as I was about to put my cane on the bottom step, someone shouted, "'He's choking!' <laughs> Topher and I looked up to see a contestant getting hit hard on the back as they bent over the table, coughing. A moment later, the guy stood up, breathing okay. An air horn sounded, ending the contest. I kept my eyes on Jason Kennedy. His skin was a gray color, but otherwise he was alert as he watched the judges count how many hamburgers remained on each plate. The judges talked together, then handed a slip of paper to the announcer. "'Everyone, if I could have your attention, please,' the announcer spoke into his microphone. Third place goes to Mike!' The crowd cheered as Mike stood, taking a bow. "'Runner-up goes to Lady Lisa!' There was more cheering. First place for the ten-minute hamburger-eating contest goes to Jason Kennedy!' In a burst of energy, Jason jumped up onto his chair, then the table, as he waved his hands in the air. The crowd went wild with cheering. "'I guess he's okay,' observed Topher. "'He's insane,' I decided. I sighed and shook my head. Hopefully he doesn't plan on eating anything else. We watched as Jason was given a medallion and a check. Gordon, a reporter from the local paper at the Oaks Crossing, took a photo. Other reporters from around the area and state took photos as well. He should go to the hospital again and get checked out, I murmured. I can't believe he did this. We waited as the security guard and event organizer went to talk to Jason. They had talked intently to him, and over the noise of the crowd I could hear the organizer insist that Jason get checked out by the medical personnel on hand at the event. I guess we can go to lunch since it's over, remarked Topher. I suppose, I agreed, giving Jason Kennedy one last look. Topher and I took our time, walking along the booths and grills, trying to decide what to have. Ivy! I noticed Molly waving. Topher and I found her at the Mighty Oaks Christian Campground booth, helping to serve cold drinks while the guys grilled hot dogs and hamburgers. They were raising funds for a charity organization that helped bring medicines to third world countries. Hey, Molly, I gave her a smile. How are things going? Good, grinned Molly. Melinda Stratton's makeup started to streak with all the heat. She had to go home. Nice, I grinned back. How was the Irish cream dream? Perfect as always, complimented Molly. I might be a little sunburnt before the day is through, but I'm enjoying myself on Team Mighty Oaks. Good. Could we get some burgers, fries, and drinks, I asked. Sure thing, agreed Molly. Hey, weren't you supposed to be handing out cupcakes? The display got shot down, I mentioned. Someone fell into the cupcakes. The mayor chose to just hand out the handshakes instead. That is unfortunate. Molly served us our meal. Personally, I thought it was great to have my day back for my own purposes, rather than be handing out cupcakes at the mayor's table. Topher and I managed to find a picnic table that had just been vacated. If it isn't rude to ask, what do you do for a living? I ventured, curious about Topher's vocation. He had been on the campground for weeks now, and I highly doubted anyone could be on vacation for that long. I work as a corporate lawyer, revealed Topher as he dunked a fry in a ketchup. Some days I have to be in court, other days I meet with clients. Interesting. I took a sip from my drink. Do you like being a lawyer? It's okay, shrugged Topher. I kind of got into it since my dad was one. I come from a long line of lawyers. What about you? Have you always wanted to run a campground? <laughs> Not really, I admitted. I inherited the campground from my grandmother a couple of months ago. When I first came, I had thought to sell the campground. That was before I became attached to all the people at the Happy Campground Resort. Now I wouldn't think of selling. I have always wanted to own a bakery, which is why Molly and I started the Happy Catering business out of the campground. That is neat, Topher cocked his head to the side as he studied me. For some reason, I thought you hadn't been at the campground your whole life. You seemed to know how to do everything there. I shook my head. I spent summers there with Grandma when I was a kid. She taught me a lot. I suppose business college might have taught me something as well. Do you have other family? wondered Topher. Just my mom, I answered. You? My dad and a couple of brothers, supplied Topher. I'm the youngest. Must have been nice to have brothers to play with, I mentioned, polishing off another fry. It was, except when I was the slowest, skinniest, and most accident-prone of the bunch of us, he laughed. I always got picked last for sports. Truthfully, my brothers are pro-athletes, and I'm still the nerd of the family. You're not a nerd, I defended him. You're smart, and you have smart friends. How many other people can help with software programs that book stays at a campground? 
Thanks for trying to make me feel better, but I'm okay with who I am. Nerds have become cooler now that I'm grown up, Topher told me. I used to play Dungeons and Dragons, I offered. Topher picked up his soda, holding it up in a toast. To nerds. To nerds, I smiled as I picked up my soda. We touched hands and sipped. Taking a breath for courage, I decided to broach a sensitive subject. Topher, I have to talk to you about something. I was thinking about the song, and I realized that I may have given you some confusing signals. Well, I think you are a really nice guy, and I like you as a friend. It's okay, Ivy, interrupted Topher. I understand you're not interested in me. I felt so bad for him. I'm sorry. Topher shrugged. Don't worry about it. While it was fun hanging out at the campground, I probably should get back to work before my dad fires me at the law firm. I figured after the barbecue fest, I'll move on. You and your friends are always welcome to come back, I offered. I'll give you the family discount. I will take you up on that, promised Topher with a smile. We decided to find out what desserts might be available at the next booth to finish off our meal. I had promised Topher some baked goods, and we did manage to find a booth that was selling brownies topped with ice cream. This looks great, a satisfied Topher took a big scoop of brownie and ice cream. His eyes lit up. Fantastic! I smiled, glad that Topher was enjoying himself. He really was a nice guy. Too bad there was not any spark, unlike when I saw Luca Armand. There he was again. This time Armand was chatting to Melinda Stratton, who was known as the beauty queen of Oaks Crossing. I took a deep breath. So that is where the way that your heart lies, murmured Topher, getting a good look at Luca. I sniffed and grabbed Topher's arm while firmly fixing a smile on my face. Is there anything else you wanted to see while we were here? I heard there was a competition on for the best marinating sauce for ribs. We could check that out, allowed Topher, grinning down at me. As we made our way through the throng of people, I may have looked back to see Luca look my way. I snapped my attention back to Topher, and he is not who I like. Sure thing, scoffed Topher with a grin. You only stare at him whenever the guy is around. He's irritating, I said firmly. I heard you pushed him into a fountain, Topher mildly stated. That you previously had a date? It was not a date, I muttered. Luca may have paid for my food, but I think it was more because he felt sorry for me than he was interested in me. Okay, shrugged Topher so easily. It was not, I insisted, knowing I sounded petulant and all of two years old. I sighed in defeat. Maybe it was the steely blue eyes or the fact that we got under each other's skin that made me feel a spark for Luca. Okay, so I might like the guy. Topher looked at me with a sad smile. Then let's get you the guy. You don't have to, I told him. I'm sure he's not interested in me. I want to see you happy, replied Topher. He brightened up at a thought. Who knows? Maybe he's got a hot younger sister who's looking for a lawyer type. <laughs> Maybe, I smiled in return. You are a really great guy, Topher. Whatever girl you find, she will be lucky to have you. For sure, nodded Topher as he slung his arm around my shoulders. Now let's go see this marinating contest. I have high hopes that the honey garlic will win this year. I laughed as we made our way through the crowd. I was not laughing long as Thelma found me, grabbing me by the arm. Jason Kennedy collapsed, breathed an alarmed Thelma. He has collapsed and the police are looking for Conrad and Herb. That dumb police chief is accusing innocent people again. Thelma, I patted her on the arm. I wonder if she had just caught up from yesterday's gossip of Jason dying on my cupcake display and was slightly confused. Jason was okay. His stomach ruptured, but they let him out of the hospital. If he can stop doing the eating contest, he'll be fine. He is not fine, hissed Thelma. The man is dead. The ambulance just took him away. What do you mean, just took him away? I questioned. He was in the hospital yesterday. No, it happened just now, insisted Thelma. We saw Jason Kennedy at the hamburger eating contest maybe a half hour ago, inserted a confused Topher. He was fine. The guy was happy to have won. Why don't you believe me, huffed Thelma. Jason Kennedy just collapsed after he announced the next eating competition. It was supposed to be a pie-eating contest. It happened right on stage in front of everyone. Wow, Topher looked at me in surprise. How unlucky can one guy be? Do you think his stomach ruptured again? I asked in concern. It was a foolish thing he did, competing when he had just had surgery. No one knows for certain why he collapsed, responded Thelma. However, the chief of police said Kennedy died, and he was asking where he could find Conrad and Herb. 
I think he wants to charge them with murder. That is not going to happen, I assured her. Conrad already talked to Jepson, and he doesn't think the police have a case against Conrad and Herb. Did that stop the police chief from arresting Jackson Grubbs last time? questioned Thelma. No, I reluctantly allowed. Yet we did get Jackson out of jail and found the real killer. We'll have to solve the murder again. Chief Williams was determined to find Conrad and Herb. I think he's going to arrest them, insisted Thelma. Wouldn't the case have to be investigated first? asked Topher. I thought you were a lawyer, I looked at him in concern. A commercial law lawyer, explained Topher. I deal with mergers, acquisitions, liability, environmental stuff. Never really handled any criminal cases. You're going to investigate, aren't you? Thelma pleaded with me. Conrad and Herb need your help. You know I will do anything I can to help them, I assured her. Including making nice to the detective you may have pushed into a fountain? Questioned Thelma as she arched an eyebrow. You heard about that? I blinked. News goes fast around here, observed Topher. It's the senior gossip line, affirmed Thelma with a nod. We know everything. It's true, I reluctantly added at Topher's surprised look. The seniors in this town are well connected when it comes to knowing what is happening in Oaks Crossing. Kind of like the secretary gossip train at work, noted an amused Topher. Exactly, exclaimed Thelma. She hooked an arm in Topher's, patting his forearm with her free hand. You know, I happen to like you. There is this lovely young girl I would like you to meet. I think the two of you might really hit it off. What about the investigation? Topher half-heartedly protested. Oh, have he's got that in hand, purred Thelma as she led him away. Now this girl, she's a sweet thing who likes animals. Did Thelma just steal your date? asked a bemused voice from behind me. He's not my date, I automatically protested as I turned to see Molly. Why aren't you with Chaz? I was, but I think the festival is getting shut down, she replied. The police told us to wrap up the booth. They're cordoning off the area as a crime scene. I guess someone died. Jason Kennedy, the food contest eating champion, I informed her. The guy who survived a stomach rupture? Blinked to surprise Molly. Not such a lucky guy after all. Not really, I agreed. I started to head toward the Mighty Oaks Christian Campground food booth. Did you overhear anything the police said about it? Just that we had closed down, Molly followed me. Where are we going? To see if there are any clues, I told her. The police chief thinks Conrad and Herb were behind the wires in the meat that Jason ate. If Jason dies and the cause is found to be one of those wires, there could be murder charges. You're investigating again, moaned Molly. Hey, it's not like I want to, but these are my friends, I retorted. They came to our help when we were kept overnight in jail when Bark Baker died. True, sighed Molly as we came up against the crime tape, unable to walk any further. Tell me how I can help. You can help by finding a good lawyer for Conrad and Herb, a voice interrupted. Detective Armand stepped out of a group of police officers to talk to us. A scowl was on his face and his steely blue eyes flicked my way. As good as Jepson is, he will need someone who isn't retired to assist him. Your friends are in a mess of trouble and need all the help they can get. Tell them to turn themselves in, but say nothing until the lawyers arrive. I'm not certain they can afford anyone besides Jepson, I pointed out. They are pensioners, which aren't the richest of people. Your boyfriend, the commercial law lawyer, might know someone who does pro bono criminal cases, sniped Armand. Ask him. I've got to get back to real work. My jaw fell open as Armand abruptly turned and went back to the group of cops, barking out a few orders that had them scrambling. Oh, my word! I think he's jealous, squealed Molly in my ear as she grabbed my arm, practically bouncing on the spot. He must have seen you and Topher at lunch earlier. Just because we had lunch doesn't make Topher my boyfriend, I managed to squeeze out, still a little shocked at the hostility in Luca Armand's voice. The two of you did look super cozy together, a gleeful Molly said. Plus, I looked up Topher Wellman's profile. Did you know he pulls in seven figures a year, is partner in his daddy's firm, and has a bunch of investments? The guy is worth millions on millions, Ivy. And it is obvious to anyone with eyes that Topher likes you. So yeah, maybe the smoking hot detective is a little threatened. Do you think so? I wondered, emotions swirling through me. I had a hard time picturing the implacable detective Luca Armand feeling inferior to anyone. 
For a moment I felt like I was standing on the precipice to something which could determine the entire route of my life. Molly laughed. I know so. I am an expert on men. Impulsively I ducked under the crying scene tape, rapidly falling after Luca. Hey! Go get him! cheered Molly from behind me. Hey! I shouted again, suddenly nervous and indignant. Luca! You can't be here, one of the cops told me, grabbing me by the arm. Luca! I yelled again. Miss, you need to step back. The cop began to push me toward the yellow crime scene tape. I will take it from here, came Luca's flat voice as he joined us. Are you certain? The cop asked Luca. I can escort her out of the crime scene, sir. I'm certain, a grim Luca told him. The cop nodded, then left us. Luca folded his arms across his chest, his eyes boring down into mine. Yes. Conrad and Herb didn't do it. I blurted out through my suddenly dry throat, as any bravado I had felt fled. I know that, ground out Luca. What do you think I told you to tell them not to say anything until they had a chance to discuss matters with their lawyers? It kind of hinders the police investigation for me to advise the suspects not to talk unless I fully believed they were not guilty. Oh, I felt a little deflated. What do you really want, Ivy? he demanded. I have an investigation to run. Nothing. I muttered as I turned away. I saw Molly giving me a look of disbelief. Behind her, I could see Lizzie Galbraith looking at Luca with concern. Her blonde hair shone in the sun, and she was another one of those thin sundresses. Shoring up my courage, I faced Luca again. Topher is not my boyfriend. What? A half-distracted Luca asked, his attention fixed on someone in the crowd before coming back to me. I had the sneaking suspicion he may have been looking at Lizzie. My lips flattened, and I poked him hard in the chest with a finger to get his focus on me. Topher is not my boyfriend. He sure looks like he is, snorted Luca. He's been hanging around you like a love-struck puppy for the last month. You haven't been exactly discouraging him. I stared at him for a moment before a big smile crept across my face. You are the worst investigator there ever was. Excuse me? A dangerous note crept into Luca's voice at my insult. Oh, you're great with murder and crime, but with the other stuff, you are terrible, I hastily amended, still grinning. I don't know what to do with you, muttered a frustrated Armand. Ivy, go back behind the caution tape. I have to return my investigation. Okay, just one more thing, I chirped happily. The thought that he really was too tall flitted through my mind. I pushed it aside. Luca was perfect as he was, each tall grumpy inch of him. What? he bit off. Lean down, I whispered. It's a secret. Annoyed with me, he tensely complied. I reached up to cup his face with my hands. On my tippy toes, I touched my lips to his. As a first case, it was everything and more than what I had hoped for. When we surfaced, his hands were on my ribs and I was deliciously pressed against them. Both of us were a little surprised and satisfied with the experience. Where we were began to register as we heard some of the cat calls from the crowd and a couple of the rookie cops. We pulled apart as the chief of police approached, a thunderous look on his face. You are fired, Armand. Chapter 9. An Arrest You can't just fire him, I exclaimed. I can and I have, declared Chief Williams. Unprofessional behavior and interfering with an investigation. You've crossed a line, detective. Pick up your things from the station and get away from my crime scene. Luca gave Chief Williams a long, measuring look before emitting a short nod. What? I demanded. You aren't going to let him do this. Luca put a hand to my back, propelling me toward the caution tape. There isn't much choice at the moment. It was just a kiss, I protested as we ducked under the caution tape. And I did advise you to tell your friends to lawyer up before the police could question them, a grim Luca pointed out. Not that long ago, I also continued investigating into Bart Baker's death against express orders from the chief. Does Chief Williams know that? I wondered. Someone may have let it slip, sighed Luca. He's within his rights to suspend me, not necessarily fire me. Is there any recourse to get your job back? I questioned. I knew that Luca was proud of his position. He enjoyed the challenge of investigation to put criminals behind bars. Being fired for these reasons would put a black mark on his career. I'm not certain, admitted Luca. What if you solve the crime before the police department does? I suggested. Ivy, warned Luca, you shouldn't be involved in this. 
Conrad and Herb are my friends. I laid a hand on his arm. You mean a lot more to me. Do I? Luca's eyes turned intense. You know you do, I said breathily as he took my hand in his. Good. He pressed a kiss into my palm. Then we will investigate together. You tell me everything, and I'll do the same. That is a deal, I agreed readily. I happened to see Molly in the crowd as she gave me a happy wave. Chaz was behind her, and Molly reached up to give him a kiss on the cheek before leading the bemused and slightly blushing Chaz back into the crowd. I smiled at Luca, who turned his attention from Molly and Chaz back to me. Chaz has no idea what your friend is about to do to him, murmured Luca, his lips twitching into a partial smile. He's a lucky guy, I mentioned before turning serious. We have some work to do. Come on. A sober Luca helped push through the crowd of onlookers. We went through the park, finding an exit, before going to a nearby parking area. Luca brought out his keys, and we headed for his SUV. Do you know where Conrad and Herb are? Herb and B are fishing, I replied. Conrad should be at the Happy Camper office. He volunteered to be there after he and Herb were disqualified from the cooking competitions. Call Conrad, advised Luca as he got my door and helped me into the SUV. With the air cast, I was still a little awkward getting in and out of vehicles. Put it on speaker so we can both talk to him. I pulled out my cell phone as Luca started the SUV, putting the air conditioner on full against the humid and hot air. Happy Camper Resort, grunted Conrad on the phone. We are full up, so if you're looking to reserve, it had better be for some time later this summer. Conrad, it's Ivy, I responded. Jason Kennedy died. You need to get a lawyer. There was a pause before Conrad answered. I have a lawyer. Jepson will do fine. You know that Herb and I didn't do anything wrong. We know you are innocent, interjected Luca. However, the chief of police has you and Herb as his primary suspects. He will be looking to bring you in for questioning. It's important that you don't say anything to the police. Just tell them you would like your lawyer. And if this goes to trial, then you need a lawyer who's currently practicing law, not Jepsum Gray, who is a retiree. I'm a retired coroner, grunted Conrad. I know a thing or two about the law and how cases work, young man. Then you also know that anything you say can be used against you in court of law, replied Luca. If I can get you the autopsy report, it could help your case. I thought you were the police, snorted Conrad. What are you doing helping me out? Is it some kind of trick? Luke and I exchanged a look. I got fired today. <laughs> Don't that beat all, whistled Conrad. We all know Chief Williams has been slipping lately. The man is going to ruin his own police force if he keeps it up. Firing his best detective. Thanks for the vote for best detective, but he's not exactly without cause, noted Luca dryly. I was interfering with a few investigations. Only because you believe that they had the wrong suspect in custody, I pointed out. True, admitted Luca. So now what are you going to do? asked Conrad. Figure out who killed Jason Kennedy, said a determined Luca. With my help, I inserted. With Ivy's help, amended Luca. He took my hand in his. Jepson said between the time Jason decided on our wings and the time he actually received the wings for the eating competition, there were a number of people who had handled them, commented Conrad. It could have been anyone who snuck the wires into our wings. The food assistants, Jason's manager, and the judges, agreed Luca. The food was passed and inspected by a number of people. And no one noticed anything? I questioned in surprise. It would have taken time for someone to insert a bunch of wires. The wires would have been poking out of the meat. Seven wires, noted Luca. Three removed from Jason's throat, one surgically removed from the stomach rupture, and three were found still in the wings that Jason hadn't eaten. That is terrible. I swallowed down my disgust at whoever had tried to murder Jason. Then a thought occurred to me. What if it was Jason who did it? Why would he want to eat a bunch of wires? challenged Conrad. He'd have to know it would kill him. Maybe the point was not to kill himself. I suggested. Maybe Jason wanted to rupture his stomach or harm his throat. He mentioned to me that he had insured his mouth, esophagus, and stomach. Perhaps it was a scheme gone wrong to defraud the insurance company. The police checked with the insurance company, Luca informed us. The policy doesn't cover attempts of sabotage, which this would fall under. There would be no payout. Does Jason know that? I wondered. He did, after we told him at the hospital after his stomach surgery apprised awry Luca. He seemed a little surprised, but claimed he had nothing to do with the wires being in the wings. Jason was emphatic. 
Did you believe him? grumbled Conrad. Yes, I don't believe he was aware of the wires being in the food, sighed Luca. His phone rang. Luca pulled out his cell, noting the caller before answering with a clipped Armand. Conrad and I waited in silence as Armand talked to the caller. A few moments later, he hung up. An eighth wire punctured Jason's esophagus. It was undetected in the X-rays. The doctors think it was hiding behind a rib. It traveled to the heart and punctured the vital organ as well. "'That's how he went, then,' murmured Conrad. "'I can see the police have pulled up outside the office here.' "'Don't say anything, Conrad,' I hastily replied. "'We'll find you a great lawyer. Just hold tight.' "'If anything happens, you take care of our ivy,' a gruff Conrad said. "'I mean it, Armand. I will haunt you if you don't.' "'Nothing is going to happen,' I promised. "'We're going to find out who is really behind it all. "'I'll take care of her,' Luca said, giving my hand a squeeze. "'We could hear someone talking to Conrad, "'and Conrad replying that he wanted to talk to his lawyer "'before the call ended. "'My phone rang suddenly. "'I wiped away a tear before answering, "'Hello?' "'Ivy, it's B. a quivering voice said. "'The police have taken Herb.' "'They have Conrad as well,' I told her. I told them I would call Jepson, sniffed B. I told them not to talk. That's how they get false confessions. At least that's what my books always say. That's not necessarily true, remarked Luca. His eyes met mine. Not always. Is that Detective Armand? asked B in a righteous voice. You tell him the police in this town are out of line, accusing innocent men of doing heinous crimes. It's just ridiculous. I plan on taking this to the mayor. I want everyone in that department fired. Do it. A grim Luca replied. Go to Wickham, start a movement, raise some cash for Conrad and Herb's defense, whatever you need to do. I fully support you, B. What? A little of B's steam evaporated. I was fired by the chief of police today, Riley admitted Luca. I'm on your side. Oh, sighed a weary B. Good. Between Luca, myself, Jepson, and the senior sleuths of the Happy Camper Resort, we are going to solve this, I vowed to her. I have Cookie and Cupcake with me, B let me know. Cookie bit one of the officers. Which one? asked Luca as I gasped in shock. Maybe a Burmer? I think that's what his name is, replied an uncertain B. Good. Luca had a half smile. I don't like that guy. Is he going to press charges? I asked worriedly. For Cookie biting him? No, he was focused on arresting Herb for murder, B's voice wobbled again. He can't be arrested for murder, inserted Lurka. In my confused look, he explained, Jason isn't dead. The guy must have nine lives because the paramedics managed to keep him going. The doctor I just talked to said he pulled through the heart surgery. The worst Conrad and Herb can be charged with is attempted murder. This is crazy, I breathed in surprise. Anybody else would be dead by now. The good news is we can interview Jason again, noted Luca. Maybe he will be willing to add some more details to what is happening now he has a second life-threatening event. I nodded. That is a good idea. How long can a person go to jail for attempted murder? whispered B. He's not going to jail, I soothed. That's not what I asked, reprimanded B softly. Luca? At a minimum, four to seven years, a grave Luca answered. At a maximum? Question B. Life imprisonment, replied Luca. Ivy is right. We aren't going to let this happen. There are some substantial holes in the case against Conrad and Herb. There is no motive for attempted murder. At most, it could be argued negligence that caused bodily harm. Even then, it would need to be proved beyond a shadow of a doubt Conrad and Herb were the two who put the wires in the chicken wings for any criminal case to succeed. I don't believe the police can fulfill the obligation of proof. What should I do to help? B cleared her throat. Call Jepson, advised Luca. Then I would like you and Thelma to go to the barbecue fest and spy on what the police are doing. I want to know everything they might do for the second crime scene. Write it down in detail. Afterward, go to the mayor and demand action. Start a fuss, B. I can do that. A note of steel crept into her voice. Thank you. You are welcome. Luca replied as the call ended. Spy on the police? I asked him. I saw everything at the second crime scene, but perhaps she might overhear something the police investigating strategy that Police Chief Williams might employ. B needs to feel like she's doing something that can change the outcome of what is happening right now, sighed Luca. What are we going to do first? A couple of ideas tumbled around my thoughts. 
go to the hospital to interview you, Jason? He's just out of surgery. I doubt he'll be awake or able to answer any questions, said Luca as he put on his seatbelt. I think I should try to collect my things at the station. If I happened to take a few files with me by mistake, that would just be unfortunate. Good idea. I pulled on my seatbelt as well. I frowned. Who is Burmer, and why don't you like him? He's the guy next in line after the chief of police, sighed Luca as we drove. Burmer is a sleazebag. I can't prove anything, but I feel that he's behind a lot of the problems the station has been having, from bad hires of personnel to budget issues. I thought you were originally hired to find out who was tampering with evidence. I watched him in concern. I was, and we did get the guy. However, I have since found there's more to the story, grimaced Luca as he pulled into the parking lot of the police station. I think Burmer is after the chief's job. He's pushing Chief Williams to make certain decisions which are making the chief look incompetent. I also think Burmer has been taking money from the budget and pocketing it. Things aren't adding up. Burmer has noticed that I've been watching him. He's been driving a wedge between Chief Williams and I. I probably didn't help. I sighed, remembering how I had accidentally drugged half the police department, including Luca, last month with some magic brownies. In my defense, while I had sold the cannabis lace brownies to Luca, I hadn't been the one to make them and had no idea that they would get the police high. Luca actually chuckled. No, you didn't. We may have argued about you and your senior citizen amateur sleuth gang a few times. Any retort I was going to make died as he parked the SUV and looked at me with warm eyes. My breath caught as he leaned in for a quick kiss before leaving me in the vehicle alone. Oh, my word. I sighed to myself and watched as Luca went into the police station. A smile played with my lips. It was still there as my phone rang and I answered, Hello? Ivy, don't let our man go to the police station, a fearful Thelma rushed to say. What? Why? I sat up straight, clutching the phone to my ear. I overheard one of the police, not an officer, someone in a suit who came to talk to one of the policemen at the barbecue fest. They were talking on the phone to someone else named Burma. It, it doesn't matter, she hastily replied. It's a setup. They are going to arrest Armand. Whatever for, I indignantly replied, shutting off the SUV and pulling the keys. He's a detective. He upholds the law, not breaks it. I don't know, replied Thelma in a hushed voice. I just know what the man said. What exactly did he say? I asked as I hopped out of the SUV and hurried toward the front of the police station. He said Detective Armand was on his way to the station, explained Thelma. He said the police chief had fired Armand, so the timeline would need to be moved up. Then he yelled, Yes, I expect you to plant the evidence and to arrest him, before hanging up the phone. Why would the police be setting up Armand? He knows, I gasped as I came to the front of the station, watching as a cop put cuffs on Luca through the glass door. He knows Luca has been investigating him, and was close to finding something about the missing money. Who knows, asked Thelma. What missing money? I need you to find out who it was talking on the phone to Burmer. Then you need to call Jepson and tell him everything you just told me. I laid my hand on the glass, wondering what I should do. As if he knew I was there, Luca turned his head to see me. He mouthed one word, go. I turned quickly to make my way back to the SUV. Part way there, I could hear someone come out of the front door and yell, Hey! Gritting my teeth, I ran. It was not easy with the air cast, but I made it to the SUV, jumping into the driver's seat and slamming the door shut. I quickly locked it. I had no idea why any police officer would be chasing me, but suddenly there was a cop knocking on the window. I started the vehicle. Ivy, just listen, he said loudly looking back to the front of the building in worry before turning back to me. I recognized him as one of the rookie cops who had been high at the carnival fundraiser when Luca had bought my brownies. Warren? That's right, he affirmed. My name is Warren. Open your window. No. I shook my head and put my hand on the gear shift. Step away. I don't want to accidentally run you over. Just open the window a couple of inches, he motioned to another rookie cop who snuck out of the back of the police station, holding on to a bunch of files. I need you to give you some files before Burmer finds them. It's evidence Armand was collecting against him. The other rookie came, hefting up the files. Here! Kruger's on the rampage! He's tearing apart Armand's desk, looking for these. They need to disappear, now! I opened my window. You could get into trouble for this. The station's already in trouble, admitted Warren. I don't know what they have on Armand, but I'll call your campground when I figure it out. 
"'Thank you,' I said as I took the thick stack of files from him. "'Get an accountant to look at those,' advised Warren. "'Not the local one. He's in Burma's pocket. "'That's how Burma found out Armand was investigating him. "'Armand asked some leading questions. "'The next thing, there's these rumors going around "'that Armand is skimming drug evidence for himself. "'They intend to muddy the waters, "'so anything Armand says is suspect,' the other rookie stated bluntly. "'You need to get him a good lawyer.' "'I will,' I nodded. "'Good luck, Ivy,' Warren stepped back. We will help however we can. You better get going, the other rookie said, looking at the station. I pulled the cord so the security camera won't record us talking to you, but anyone could come around at any moment. Thank you. I put the files on the passenger seat. Please look after him as best as you can. I put the SUV in reverse and drove out of the parking lot, more afraid than I had ever felt before. Chapter 10 death of a world champion. Even though it was still warm in the evening air, I pulled on one of the hoodies I had kept from Luca around me. I had gotten it when we were poured on by the rain, and I had broken my ankle. It was one of his police hoodies, which was far too large for me, but I didn't care. I found it comforting to wear. The lights were already on at the clubhouse. I had called an impromptu meeting of the permanent members of the Happy Camper Resort including the honorary guests of Topher, Tawny Tilbury, Jepson Gray, Ava, and Jackson. I suspected Molly might have asked Chaz to come as well, which was okay with me. We needed all the help we could get. Hosting the large file box I was carrying, I marched into the clubhouse. The crowd quieted down as they spotted me. Setting the box down on a nearby table, I popped open the lid and pulled out a thick manila envelope, one of many. I have here everything I was given from two brave cops at the police station. They told me this was from Detective Luca Armand's desk, and it was possible evidence that a policeman named Burmer was embezzling funds from the Oaks Crossing police station. This afternoon, I made copies, and I'm going to pass them around tonight, so if anyone has their paperwork stolen, there are copies here with someone else. I want us to bring them to accountants who can see where the money is going, who can read between the lines and figure out how to bring down the corruption in our local police force. However, we cannot bring it to the local Oaks Crossing accountant. Luca did, and the accountant tipped off Burmer that Luca was investigating him. I'm a retired small business accountant. George Kershaw came forward from where he had been standing beside Thelma. I'm willing to go over the figures. Thank you. I handed an envelope to George. Who else will take one? More people came forward to take the envelopes. Topher took one as well. I can fax it over to our company accounting department. They should be able to see anything odd in short order. I nodded. Did you call for legal counsel? I did. Topher turned to address the crowd. Jepson and I have assembled a team of lawyers who have agreed to defend Conrad and Herb. They're putting pressure on the Oaks Crossing Police Department to either charge the men or let them go. We expect any changes will be made public in the morning and can start launching a legal defense. Because Jason Kennedy is very much alive, even if charges occur, Conrad and Herb should receive bail hearing where we can free them from jail. Detective Ramond has also met with legal counsel. I'm still trying to contact his legal representation and find out what the charges are against him. We need to launch our own investigation, I continued, for both cases. That means interviewing Jason Kennedy and everyone associated with him to find out who put those wires in the chicken wings that Conrad and Herb barbecued. I grabbed a large permanent marker and wrote on the wall, Jason Kennedy. Then I put lines leading away from his name as I scribbled down possible people who might have motives to harm him. The wife, the girlfriend, the boyfriends of Jason's conquests, the manager, competitors in the local food competitions, and a question mark for those we don't know. I capped the marker and turned to look at the group. Alibis, motives, opportunity. I'm going to assign different people to interview different possible suspects. I will interview someone, volunteered B. No, I shook my head. I have a special job for you. You and Thelma were great at the protest for Ava and Jackson. We need another one of those. Right now, the media is talking about Oaks Crossing and how Jason Kennedy almost died twice. We have the opportunity to direct the media's attention to the unfair arrest of Conrad, Herb, and Luca. If you and Thelma can produce the biggest protest this town has ever seen, we could even make national news. Mayor Whitcomb would have to act on it and launch an investigation into our police department. On another wall, I wrote Luca's name. Under it, I put Burmer and some question marks. Burmer has help from some of the cops. 
he hired a number of men who are loyal to him. Luca believes that he wants to replace the chief of police, then he would have unlimited power over the force to do with as he pleases, and no one would be looking to the budget issues or suspecting missing money. We investigate Verma, nodded Thoma. Find out who he talks to, where he goes, what he does. More importantly, if he has things like jewelry, cars, or a home that is worth far more than what he should be making at his pay grade. I quickly wrote down the suggestion. We're gonna have to repaint these walls, noted Agatha. It needed updating anyway, Bertie told her. I'll help paint when this is all over. We can help with the protest, volunteered Ava, holding Jackson's hand. I will take over the office duties so you don't have to worry about them, decided Mabel. I'll also look after Cookie and Cupcake while you investigate. Just drop them off at the office. That's very helpful, I agreed. Mabel had helped in the office before, so she had the experience necessary to keep the campground running smoothly. We can trail Burmer, Oliver pointed to himself, Lionel and Bertie. He won't even know he's under surveillance. We can find out everything about him. Good. I lined up people to interview our suspects, giving out a list of sample questions. If anything feels odd or missing, keep digging. We need all the information we can get to solve what is happening. I'll start the petition to fire Chief Williams and Burmer, decided Agatha. I would sign that, Loretta agreed. We can collect signatures and bring it to Mayor Whitcomb. We could potentially sue the police department for wrongful arrests, remarked Topher as everyone descended into talking. I looked at him in surprise and he hastily added, I'll, we'll double check that with a lawyer who specializes in civil suits. Thank you for doing this, Topher. I was grateful. I couldn't do this without you. You are fully welcome, Topher had a bit of a sad smile. Thelma introduced me to this girl named Mary. Mary Albany, who works for the Oaks Crossing Animal Shelter, I asked. She's nice, Topher admitted. She's not you, though. I'm sorry, Topher. I laid a hand on his arm. I haven't met this Armand guy, but he better be good for you, gruffly spoke Topher. He is, I smiled as I thought of Luca. I sobered as I remembered what it was like to be cold and alone in the jail when Molly and I were kept overnight. We're gonna get him out, vowed Topher. I nodded, blinking back a couple of tears. Thelma came, wrapping an arm around me. It's getting late. We should wrap up this meeting so everyone can start and on their jobs early tomorrow morning. I agreed, and Topher called for everyone's attention. Soon we had sorted out who was doing what task. Good nights were said, and everyone filed out, going their separate ways. Molly and Chaz walked with me as I walked toward my trailer. I noticed the pair were holding hands. Thank you for coming, Chaz, I remarked gratefully. The more people who can help, the better. I'm happy to assist, replied Chaz. I talked to Luca a few times, even invited him to play for the local softball teams. He seems like a great guy. He is a great guy, stated Molly as she snuggled closer to Chaz, which everyone knows, so it will be easy to prove his innocence from whatever this Burmer character cooks up to try to frame Luca with. If you can think of anything else we should be doing, or if you need some extra help, let me know, offered Chaz. I nodded, fishing out my keys from my trailer as we came to the fork where Molly and I usually parted, since her trailer was further down the dirt road. I was suddenly tired from the day's events. I felt heavy from the weight of the responsibility I was under. When I thought we had a good chance of freeing Conrad and Herb, I was not so sure about Luca. There was little I could do to help him. Molly suddenly gave me a hug. Hey, I'm sure Conrad and Herb are keeping Luca entertained. Between the three of them, they're probably parting out up in the jail. I had a half laugh at her pep talk. I think Luca secretly likes all the senior citizens around here. It will be okay, promised Molly. I gave her another hug before letting her go. Watching Molly and Chaz walk away in the moonlight, I was happy and a little envious at the same time. Chaz would see Molly to her trailer before heading home himself. He was a gentleman. I wish Luca were here to see me home with a goodnight kiss rather than in the cold jail cell. I resolved to do whatever it took to help clear his name. Still in Luca's hoodie, I snuggled in bed with Cookie and Cupcake, hugging both little doggies close. After a restless night, I dragged myself out of bed. Even in the early morning, the heat was dragging on, and I shed the now too warm hoodie. A quick shower, breakfast, and morning walk with Cookie and Cupcake left me feeling marginally better. I dropped the doggies at the office with Mabel before heading to the clubhouse. I looked at the walls one more time, seeing the names of people who were willing to do what they could to free our friends. I wiped away a tear. There was a wonderful community of people here who had embraced me. I didn't want to let them down. 
Stealing my resolve, I fingered the keys of Luca's SUV. Minutes later, I was driving toward the Oaks Crossing General Hospital. B's niece was on duty at the lobby again, and easily gave me Jason Kennedy's room number. I thanked her and made my way down the maze of corridors. A nurse at the nursing station caught me on the floor. It was Tawny's granddaughter, Connie. "'Hi, V! How nice to see you!' She grabbed my arm and steered me into a supply closet. "'Granny told me everything last night. The police are talking to Jason again against medical advice. One of the detectives seems to be pushing Jason to say certain things. They're recording the whole thing.' "'Is there anything that can be done to stop them?' I asked. "'The last thing we want is for Jason to give a false statement that supports Burmer's narrative. "'The doctor's on his way. "'He can shut it down and call security to squirt them out, if necessary,' Connie assured me. "'I sighed in relief. "'This is ridiculous. "'Since when do the police pressure people into giving statements "'when they're obviously not ready to give them?' "'Ever since the chief of police came in as a patient,' muttered Connie. "'What?' I asked in surprise. He came in last night. He was found confused and wandering the streets of the town, explained Connie. I sent a sample of his blood to the lab to check for anything abnormal, but I doubt we'll find anything. The hospital lab is not like a toxicology lab. Our lab only looks for what we ask it to look for. You think he was drugged? I questioned. I think he's been drugged for a long time, nodded Connie. The guy used to be sharp as a tack and smart. The past year, Chief Williams has been slipping. He's been argumentative, confused, looking for the easy way to solve things. Some people say that he might be getting towards dementia. I might say someone has been using a dose of medication which interfered with his ability to function mentally. We'll know in a few days once any drugs are out of his system. If you find out what it is, let me know, I responded. Sure thing, she agreed. There's a commotion outside, and Connie peeked out the door. Cops are leaving. I snuck a look out the opening. I could see two police officers walking down the hall, a security guard trailing them. One of the men had a bandage on his hand. I presumed that might be Burmer, hoping that Cookie had gotten a good bite on the man. Come on! Connie grabbed my arm. We left the closet, heading for Jason's room, where the doctor waited. Dr. Hillman, Ivy Thurman. Ivy is investigating to find out the truth about what happened to Jason and Chief Williams. I trust her to help sort out this mess. Jason isn't in a position to be questioned right now, stated Hillman. He's still recovering from the complicated heart surgery. I can't answer any medical questions. It would be a violation of his privacy rights. Maybe instead you could tell me who's been visiting him. I offered. How long did this stay? We should talk in my office where we won't be overheard, decided Hillman. Both Connie and I trailed him. Hillman offered both of us a seat before closing the door. I'm going to put security on both Jason and Williams. Then maybe they can get some rest and recovery. Three good men are in jail because of what has happened, I commented. Jason and Chief Williams hold the key in figuring out what really happened. I will tell you what I can. But no one is interviewing my patients until I've deemed them recovered enough, a grim hillman stated firmly. Who has been visiting them? I grabbed my cell phone, ready to take notes. Chief Williams has been visited by his wife and Detective Burmer, answered Hillman. I think Burmer was more a formality than an actual visit. He stayed less than a minute after giving his regards to the wife. Mayor Whitcomb's competition, Harlan Boggs, has been in to chat with the wife as well. Has Mayor Whitcomb been told about Chief Williams? I wondered. Don't know. I would assume that he would have been there if he had known, even just for a quick visit, sighed Hillman. I wrote Boggs' name down in connection to Burmer, wondering if they were connected. I would contact Mayor Whitcomb later to see what his views were on the recent events. As for Jason, there has been a veritable line of people in and out of my hospital wanting to see him, noted Hillman. Those who have had access are the wife Tamara, the girlfriend Kaylee, and the manager Stuart. Everyone else, his fans, the other competitors, the five other women claiming to be his girlfriends have been denied access. It was bad enough when the girlfriend and wife got into it in the hall. They fought? I sought clarification. Regular screaming match, confirmed Hillman. I had to have both of them escorted out. Since the wife hasn't been fully divorced, she has legal access. "'What did they argue about?' I inquired. "'I don't know, and I don't care,' sighed Hillman. "'About an insurance payout,' inserted Connie. "'It was something about how the insurance wouldn't pay. 
The wife, Tamara, called Kaylee a few names, basically blaming Kaylee, Jason, and Stu for being dumb enough to endanger Jason's life before reading the fine print. So it was an insurance scam. I wrote that down. The question is whether Jason knew about it or not, and who put the wires in his wings. It shows that Conrad and Herb had nothing to do with it, noted Connie. They're just involved by accident. As long as you can get proof, noted Hillman. You said the wife and the girlfriend were arguing, I pointed out. Perhaps if I can talk to them separately, I can get a confession out of one of them. Hillman's pager suddenly went off. He looked at it, then jumped out of his chair in alarm, heading for the door. It's Jason! Connie and I quickly followed him as Dr. Hillman ran down the corridor to Jason's private room. Chapter 11 Who Done It? I had to stay in the hall as the doctors and nurses worked on Jason. His vital signs had taken a sudden dive, and officially he was dead again. I found myself pulling for him to make it back to the land of the living for a third time, but after fruitless efforts, Dr. Hillman finally called time of death. I opened my eyes with a sigh of defeat. No one would be interviewing Jason Kennedy to find out the truth from him any more. A movement from the corner of the corridor caught my eye. Swiftly, I chased after the person that I had seen. Soon, I overtook a blonde woman who was having a distinctly difficult time hurrying in stilettos. Excuse me? What? Her voice was harsh. If you're another one of those reporters, I have nothing to say. I'm not a reporter, I assured her. From the photos I had seen on the internet, I determined that this was Tamara Kennedy, Jason's wife. My name is Ivy Thurman. I'm a friend of Conrad and Herb, the two men who have been accused of putting the wires in the chicken wings that Jason ate. Panic flicked through her eyes before her face hardened. What those two men did was despicable. They were accused, not that they actually did it. A note of steel entered my voice. I wish I was taller like Lucas so that I could try and intimidate her. We both know they had nothing to do with the wires Jason ingested, didn't we? I have no idea what you're talking about, replied Tamara. I really need to get going. Why, you just got here, I noted. Don't you want to see your husband? I... She stumbled in her speech, glancing back to the corridor where Jason's room was. I meant I need to go see my husband. Because it would look weird if you came and left before seeing him, right? I raised an eyebrow. Tamara narrowed her eyes. Not so weird when complete strangers are chasing me down and asking random questions. Here's a question. I took a step forward, invading her space. Did Jason know about the insurance scheme his girlfriend and manager had cooked up? Was he aware that they were going to put his life in danger for a chance out of an insurance payout? Are his finances so bad he was willing to die for them? This is preposterous, she exclaimed, backing away from me. Where's a security guard when you need one? Jason is dead, I said flatly, looking at her face to see what sort of reaction she might have. He died of another wire piercing his heart. What? No, it was a stroke. Tamara broke off what she had been said in horror. How do you know it was a stroke? I questioned, bringing my phone up, showing that I had been videotaping the entire conversation. Her eyes darted to my cell phone. You can't film me. I already did, I told her. When you admitted your guilt of murdering Jason, you might as well just confess it all, Tamara. Her face crumpled. We needed the money. Jason had been living the champion lifestyle without being a champion for the past few years now. He is beyond in debt. There is so much debt, he can't even properly divorce me. We're all impoverished from funding his dream. His girlfriend Kaylee, Stu, and I. So you killed him, I surmised. No, she protested. At first we thought an insurance scheme would work. Jason didn't know. Kaylee and Stu went forward with the plan. When I realized there was not going to be a payout, I told them to knock it off. We'd figure out a way to make more money without adding hospital bills and putting Jason's life at risk. Then why are you so certain he died of a stroke? I demanded. Tamara hesitated. I checked his life insurance. Kaylee had increased it. I was coming to the hospital to warn Jason she was going to make an attempt on his life. How do you know he died of a stroke? I asked again. A tear slipped down from Tamara's face. I don't. I just assumed. Why? I was not about to let this go. I yelled at her. I want an answer. Because Stu mentioned if an air bubble would get into Jason's intravenous line, it could cause a stroke. 
He had seen it on some television show, sobbed Tamara. He must have told Kaylee, and she acted on it. I looked along the corridor and spotted a security camera. I pointed to it. There are cameras. It will have recorded anyone who went into Jason's room. We will find out who killed him. It could have just been a natural death, couldn't it? She tearfully asked. He could have just died. No one had to have murdered him, right? I doubt it, I sighed. It really seemed Jason had used up all his good luck. Stu is such a good guy, sniffed Tamara. He's just under a lot of pressure lately. I don't think he would do anything to harm Jason. They are friends. I had the feeling Tamara and Jason's manager, Stuart, were a couple. It would make sense for Stu to kill Jason while Tamara was still married so that she could inherit the life insurance proceeds. Then he would be free to enjoy the money with her. If anything, Stu was more likely a suspect than the girlfriend Kaylee. That will be for the police to decide. Tamara fished some tissues out of her purse, blotting her eyes. I saw a security guard and waved him down. Can you keep an eye on Mrs. Kennedy? The police are going to want to take her statement, and she really needs to wait for them. The security guard agreed to stay with her. I phoned the police station, asking to talk to Officer Warren. When the receptionist asked who I was, I lied, saying I was Warren's girlfriend. Hey, Anita, Warren's familiar voice said. It's Ivy, I told him. I have Tamara Kennedy at the hospital. She's confessed about the insurance fraud scheme. Jason Kennedy has died, for real this time, and it could be either his girlfriend Kaylee or his manager Stuart. I have a video confession from Tamara that I can send to you. You know my email, sweetheart, replied Warren, a little distracted. Okay, I will tell you again. It's Warren is a cop at dragonnet.net. No uppercase letters. You can send the pictures there. And I did not forget our lunch date. I will be right there. Perfect, I smiled at his response. He was a smart cop. I will see you soon. I love you too, babe, said Warren before he hanging up. I sent the video of Tamara's confession to Warren. As a backup, I sent it to Molly. If I was arrested or something happened, I wanted another person to have the video to use. Ivy, Connie hurried over to me. She looked at Tamara in surprise. Tamara is waiting for Officer Warren, who will be taking a statement, I revealed. We also need to get the security tapes to see who went into Jason Kennedy's room. Why? questioned a confused Connie. Jason stroked out. It was a natural death, considering he had two surgeries and obvious heart issues. Tamara gasped and cried harder. Connie, could an air bubble in the IV create stoke symptoms, even death? I gently inquired. Connie blinked in surprise. It could, but everyone is very careful here with the intravenous lines. We would never want that to happen. I nodded. Tamara heard Stuart and possibly Kaylee plotting to kill Jason by an air bubble in the intravenous line. This might have been murder. I will let Dr. Hillman know, replied Connie. He'll want to preserve the room so the police can look at it as a suspicious death. Good, I concurred. I'll wait here for the police with the security guard and Tamara. Connie rushed away to talk to Dr. Hillman. My phone buzzed, Molly having left a message stating she was going to share the video with a few other people within our group for safety. I approved as this was a good idea. The more of us with evidence, the less likely our evidence would get buried. I texted her, asking if she knew Mayor Whitcomb's phone number. She didn't, but would get back to me. "'Miss Thurman!' Officer Warren came down the hall, the other rookie cop who had helped him before with the files behind the police station trailing him. "'Hello, Officer Warren,' I replied. "'This is Mrs. Tamara Kennedy. I think she's ready to give her statement now.' "'Great. Officer Cupper will get started while I have a word with you.' Warren motioned me to follow him down the hall. First, let's exchange phone numbers. I'm going to put you down as my new girlfriend, Anita. If anyone but me ever picks up, you're just looking to contact me about my upcoming family reunion plans. You think this much subterfuge is necessary? I wondered as I typed his name into my phone and put Anita beside it as a reminder. Isn't your real girlfriend going to get confused? Burmer has taken control of the police department since Chief Williams is incapacitated, replied Warren. He has some allies in the force, people he hired. He also has fired some of the senior staff who weren't particularly fond of him. So yes, I do think it's necessary for me not to seem to be handling information to Detective Armand's girlfriend. If I get caught, I might get charged with interfering in an investigation and get suspended. Then I won't be any help at all. Plus, I'm currently single, so I won't get you mixed up with anyone. I nodded. I see your point. Have you found out any other further information? 
Not yet, Warren spoke in frustration. I'm still feeling out who we can trust in the department. What about you? I gave the file to various accountants to check for inconsistencies, I answered. I have people tailing Burmer to see who he talks to and what he does. Be careful. We don't need to track undue attention, warned Warren. He hesitated a moment before revealing something more. Burmer shipped Armand to state prison. What? I exclaimed in shock. Prison? Why? To get rid of him, grumbled Warren darkly. None of us can talk to him without Burmer finding out. A fissure of fear traveled through me. We need to get him out. Armand must have been close to discovering something big on Burmer, mused Warren. Burmer saw him as a threat and moved to keep Armand silent. What are the charges? I wondered. What is Burmer saying Luca did? Stealing evidence such as drugs, money, and weapons from the evidence lockers. Interfering with investigations. Aiding criminal organizations by leaking police information. Distributing drugs and weapons to criminals, sighed Warren. There's a bunch of trumped-up charges. Basically, anything Burmer thinks might stick, he's thrown at Armand. Luca hasn't done anything. I lowered my voice as Warren hushed me. How is Burmer going to prove what he's accusing Luca of? My guess is there's a lot of falsified documents. Some low-life criminals who are willing to make a false statement to get a deal on their own sentences. And maybe a cop or two in Burmer's payroll pretending to be eyewitnesses, imparted Warren. It's a lot of baloney, but if it carried out right, Armand could go to prison for a very long time. Luca has a lawyer, right? Do you know who it is? I questioned. I'd like to get in contact with whoever is representing him. I'm not sure, admitted Warren. If you go to the prison, you might be able to talk to Detective Armand if you're on his visitor list. Here's the address and visiting hours. Remember, everything you talk to him about at the prison will be recorded. You won't be able to visit him today since he's just been brought there. Maybe tomorrow at the earliest. He passed me a piece of paper. I took it with shaking hands, clutching it to me. Ivy, have you shown the video you gave me to anyone else? He asked. The one with Tamara's confession? I gave it to some friends, I confessed. I wanted to have some backups just in case I was arrested or something happened to me. Good, nodded Warren decisively. I think you should go one step further, though. What do you mean? I blinked in confusion. Leak it to the press, advised Warren. Right after you record whoever the last person that entered Jason Kennedy's room from the security camera tapes, I want you to leak both videos to the local and national media. Burmer will have no choice but to release Conrad and Herb if he has conflicting evidence and enough public pressure. Okay, I agreed, trying to focus on my friends instead of my fear for Luca at the moment. Has the protest started? It's in full swing, a grin spread across Warren's face. Acting Police Chief Burmer wanted to bring out water cannons, but the media is there recording the whole thing, so he had to settle for saying the protesters were there without permits and being a nuisance. He's supposed to make a statement this afternoon. I'm guessing he will try to arrest the protest organizers for civil disobedience. If we can leak the video right before he starts his speech, it would be ideal. Great, I like that plan. I looked back to see Cupper still talking to Tamara. We should go to see the hospital security tapes before any other boys in blue come by. Warren convinced the security guard to show us the security tapes while Cupper continued taking Tamara's statement. We were led to a little room near the administrative part of the hospital. The security guard brought up the cameras in the hallway outside of Jason's room, backing them up to the time before Jason had died. We watched the activity on the floor, and everything looked normal until there was a flurry of activity as doctors and nurses responded to the code blue that Jason was experiencing. "'Rewind it,' ordered Warren. "'That orderly, right there. Is he one of the normal staff?' "'I don't know,' confessed the guard. "'I only just started a month ago. I haven't learned all the names of the staff, especially those on alternating shifts.' I looked closely at the screen. "'It looks like Jason's manager, Stuart.' We'll have to bring in all three for questioning, decided Warren, Stuart, Kaylee, and Tamara. I quickly recorded what we needed to leak to the media. Warren got the guard to give him an official recording of the incriminating videos to be used as evidence in the police investigation. We thanked the guard before exiting the office. I'm going to return with Cupper and Mrs. Kennedy, said Warren. I'll text you when Burmer is going to make his speech. You should release the video shortly beforehand. Okay, I held out my hand to shake his. Good luck, Warren. You too, he replied, his warm hand squeezing mine in support. Tell Armand we're pulling for him. I will, I promised. 
I headed out of the hospital to Luca's SUV. I sent the second video to Molly as well, explaining what Warren had planned in doing. I asked her to get as many emails together as possible to send the videos to. Molly replied that she and Chaz would start right away. She also noted my request early for Mayor Wickham's phone number would only reveal his office one. His personal phone was unlisted. I decided to visit Wickham in person, hoping to get him on the side of the protesters before Burmer convinced him to approve any arrests. The last thing I wanted was more people in jail to try to bail out. It was a short drive to the town hall which housed the mayor's offices. There were crowds of people out holding placards and generally holding up traffic as they walked. Driving at a crawl, I managed to find a parking space. In awe, I watched as hundreds of people chanted, Set them free! and swirled around the town hall and nearby police station. Once I battled my way through the crowd into the relatively quiet town hall, I walked past the usual lineup at the clerk's desk, looking for Whitcomb myself since the town clerk was known to have the pace of a sleeping sloth. I found a door with Whitcomb's name on it and entered without being bothered to knock. "'Mayor Whitcomb?' I asked, barging into an empty room. Sure, it was a regular office, but no one was there. My shoulders slumped in disappointment. I suppose I would have to look around to find Whitcomb. I was about to leave the office when I bumped into Harlan Boggs, who looked at me in surprise. "'What are you doing here?' demanded Boggs, holding onto a file a little tighter. I cocked my head to the side to study the mayoral candidate. Knowing I'm a terrible liar, I opted to tell the truth. I was looking for Mayor Whitcomb. What about you?' "'Uh, the same,' lied Boggs, or at least my gut told me he was lying. "'Is he not here?' "'He isn't.' I sneakily reached around and flicked the knob so it would lock after I shut the door. "'Would you like to come with me to find him?' "'No,' Boggs looked at his watch. "'I have someplace else to be.' I firmly shut the door behind us. Boggs went one way down the hallway, while I calmly walked down the other. Once I was around the corner, I stopped, waited, and listened. Sure enough, moments later I heard footsteps. Carefully peeking around the corner back at Whitcomb's office, I could see Boggs fiddle with the now-locked door. He had a frustrated look at the door before going back the way he came. Somehow, I don't think Boggs had wanted to find Whitcomb. Either Boggs was looking for something in Whitcomb's office, or he was planting something to be found later. It seemed highly suspicious. I began looking around the place for Whitcomb. It didn't take long to find him in a council meeting, talking with some other councillors on how they wanted to respond to the protests that were going on. "'I would support them,' I mentioned casually from the open doorway. "'Ivy!' blinked Whitcomb in surprise. "'Did we have a meeting?' "'No.' I came forward to address the room. "'Very shortly, information is going to come to light, proving Conrad and Herb to be innocent of the charges against them. This, being an election year, it might be in all of your benefit to be on the right side of justice when this information comes to light.' "'What proof?' challenged one of the councillors. "'Acting Chief of Police Burmer assured me he had proof as well.' "'Not like my proof,' I smiled in satisfaction, "'which will be distributed to all the news media outlets shortly.' "'I move that we support the protesters,' Mayor Whitcomb said thoughtfully. "'I found civil movements to take on a life of their own when oppressed.' "'Plus, it will look good for you when Ivy delivers on her declaration,' another councilperson said snidely. "'Choosing to believe an amateur sleuth over our police department, Mr. Mayor?' Burmer's record has been less than stellar, retorted Whitcomb. The few dealings I have had with Miss Thurman, she's always managed to fulfill her promises. Where is Harlan? another person asked. We can hardly vote without him. He was trying to snoop in Mayor Whitcomb's office, I mentioned. I interrupted him before coming here. Don't worry, I locked the door behind us so Boggs can't go back. I now had the attention of everyone in the council. "'I knew he was a sneaky, no-good person,' erupted a councilwoman. "'Hey, we don't know what he was up to anything,' defended another. "'All we have is her word of this supposed incident happening.' I rolled my eyes and focused on Whitcomb. "'Can I see you outside?' "'Ivy, I'm in a little bit of a difficult situation,' Whitcomb prevaricated. "'I understand. However, I think you could benefit from a quick talk with me.' He had a look at his arguing town council with a sigh. Okay. I proceeded Whitcomb out into the hall, closing the door behind us. Jason Kennedy's manager, Stuart, was behind his death. 
The insurance scheme to capitalize on Jason's life insurance policy may have been perpetrated by Stuart, Kaylee, and Mrs. Kennedy. I have video proof, which is going to be released before Burmer makes his speech today. Don't let Burmer arrest the leaders of the protest movement. It will look bad on you when it comes out Conrad and Herb are innocent. Whitcomb grimaced. I plan on supporting the protests as long as they remain peaceful. Councilman Boggs is stirring up the council to go against me. This is going to be the tightest election yet. Many of the council have thrown their support for my oppressor. Do you mean what you said about Burmer? I asked. Where you stated his record has been less than stellar? Burmer has a past. No one has ever been able to accuse him of anything since there is never any proof. But the man can be outright insubordinate at times, confessed Whitcomb. Now he's acting as interim chief of police. I have all sorts of issues at the police station that I can't pin down. That's why I brought Detective Luca Armand in to investigate it internally. Now it looks like Armand has been in collusion with whoever is behind all the issues at the station. You're wrong, I told him. Burmer is framing Luca. Ivy, I am so sorry. He patted my arm with sympathy. I know that you and Luca recently became involved, but the evidence is damning. It's not true, I insisted. I will prove it. Just give me some time. Time is the least of your worries, Harlan Boggs snidely remarked as he walked toward us. I hear cops don't fare very well in prison. Chapter 12 A Protest if Mayor Whitcomb hadn't grabbed me in the moment, restraining me, I might have been in jail for assault charges. After my anger had died down and Boggs had stopped taunting me, Whitcomb hauled me to the lobby area, advising me to cool off. I gave him a reproachful look before heading out into the crowd. I headed straight to Luca's SUV, uncertain as to what my next move should be. I desperately wanted to see Luca to make sure he was all right. According to Warren, the soonest I could do that would be tomorrow. Once at the black SUV, I looked at it, then down the street to where Tawny's tea house was. Needing some empathy, I walked to the tea house, only to find it closed with a sign on the door. This establishment will not reopen until Conrad Hubble, Herb Lowe, and Luca Armand are released as a sign of protest against the arrest of innocent people by the local and incompetent police force, I read out loud. Walking up and down the streets, I found a large number of establishments that had closed down in protest, similar declarations posted on their windows. Some of the windows also had the incredible statement of, Tawny Tilbury for mayor! Stop the madness! You could be the next to be arrested without cause if we don't fire the Oaks Crossing police! I walked through the protest, looking for anyone from the campground who might be able to clarify what was going on. Instead, I found an impromptu stage up in the Oaks Crossing Central Park. Tawny was on it with a microphone in her hand, Will Knapp working the soundboard so her elderly voice came clear over the speakers. "'I have dropped my hat in the marrow race because I'm tired of corruption,' stoutly declared Tawny. "'Our police force is a farce. It arrests innocent people.' There was an answering cheer from the crowd. "'We need good detectives.' "'One's like Luca Armand, who was framed for the actions of another.' Tawny's voice wobbled, and she wiped away a tear. "'I have been blessed to know Luca. He's a good man. Luca helps me in my garden. He checks in on me regularly. Luca is kind to children and animals. He isn't the sort of man who cheats or steals. He's my neighbor, and we have had many talks. I don't know what is happening at the police station, but when it starts arresting my friends for no good reason, I am going to take action.' The crowd cheered again, waving the placards. Conrad Halbel and Herb Lowe have been upstanding members of this community all their lives, she continued. Conrad is a retired coroner who worked for the police. Herb is a retired dentist who still does the occasional free work for members of the community who cannot afford dental care. They're both widowers who raised families here. Neither of them would harm anyone. We all know how grumpy Conrad can be. We also know that he is always willing to help anyone who asks. Herb loves playing golf. He also loves Beatrice Fallows. They've recently started dating. Why would Herb risk his relationship to harm a person he doesn't even know? It doesn't make any sense. Cheers of agreement came again. 
Vote for me for mayor, and I will open an investigation into the procedures of the police department. We will uncover the corruption and convict those responsible. Let us right past wrongs. Tawny raised her voice. Vote for honesty. Vote for Tawny Tilbury. The crowd went wild with cheering. Was she not great? shouted a voice into my ear. I turned in surprise to find Thelma, who wrapped an arm around me. We are going to change this town. Tawny for mayor? I asked with just a touch of disbelief and admiration as I watched Tawny shake hands with Will and exit the stage. Thelma winked at me. We are going to win this. I can feel it in my bones. Those boys of ours are going to be set free. I nodded, hope warring with doubt. Thelma gave me an answering squeeze. I know it's hard, but the accountants are looking. George is looking at the files. They will find something, she whispered, resting her head against mine. I sniffed, tears threatening. My phone buzzed in my pocket, saving me from a total meltdown. I quickly brought it up. Warren says it's time. Time for what? wondered Thelma. Time to set Conrad and Herb free, I told her. I called Molly. Molly, we need to send the video out now. Okay replied Molly. I'm on it, but these emails are to the stations. I'm not sure anyone will see it or put it on the air in time. I'm going to put it all over social media as well. Not good enough, I said in frustration. Eyeing the microphone on the stage, I pushed my way through the crowd. Excuse me, pardon me, I need to get by you. I clambered onto the stage, grabbing the microphone. Is it on? It is now. Will Knapp quickly turned a few dials. Anyone who is with the media... I need you to text the following number with your direct email address. I have video proof of Conrad Hubble and Herbert Lowe's innocence. I provided my number and Molly's. Soon my phone was lighting up and I was sending the two videos out as swiftly as my fingers could manage. Who are you? A reporter from the front of the crowd, a mic in their hand, pointed at me. Ivy Thurman, I replied distractedly. Conrad and Herb are my friends. "'Are you the amateur sleuth who solved the murders of Janine Thurman, Ethel Murley, and Bart Baker?' she persisted. "'I had help from Detective Luca Armand. I kept sending emails. There were a lot of media here. He was Oaks Crossing's homicide detective. "'I heard he was suspended last month.' She leaned forward, ready for a scoop. "'Could you say why Detective Armand had been suspended?' "'It was a misunderstanding.' I glanced up at her. Luca has been trying to uncover the corruption in the police force of Oaks Crossing. He has been falsely accused, and I have no doubt his name will be cleared. Are you romantically involved? she questioned. I think I am done answering questions for right now, I stated. Thank you. Will Knapp suddenly let out a burst of music out, covering up the reporter's insistent questions. He gave me a thumbs up as I finished with the emails. Shoving the phone in my pocket, I decided I should probably make myself scarce before Burmer showed up. The last thing I wanted was to be arrested for interfering with the investigations. I was determined to visit Luca tomorrow, and nothing was going to stop me from getting to the state prison on time for visiting hours. I carefully hopped down from the stage, and the reporter grabbed me. I'm not answering any more questions, I warned her. Here, she gave me her card. If you have anything more to say about the possible corruption of the police station, I might be able to get you onto live television in an interview. Just let me know when you're ready to talk. Okay, I pocketed her card. Thanks. Pushing my way through the crowd, I made my way to Luca's SUV. I drove back to the Happy Camper Resort. Stopping at the office, I collected cookie and cupcake. You should see this, Mabel pointed to the computer screen. I saw that we had made state news. The leaked videos, the protest, and Tawny running for mayor on a platform of stopping corruption. Reporters asked the questions of why two men who were so obviously innocent were being held in jail when the real criminals were going free. "'I expect it will be national news by tonight,' smiled Mabel in satisfaction, especially since Jason Kennedy was considered a world champion one time in the eating contest circuit. "'This is good.' I sat in one of the old office chairs. Cupcake bounced into my lap and I petted her. "'Hopefully Conrad and Herb will be released soon.' Armand will, too, supplied a supportive Mabel. It's just a matter of time. I had a weak smile. We need to prove that he is innocent. It could take some time. We will do it, nodded Mabel. She absently patted Cookie on the head. Maybe you could call up Topher and see how his group of accountants have made out. It was a good idea. I took out my cell phone, dialing Topher's phone number. On the third ring, he replied, Hey, Ivy. 
"'Any news with the accountants?' I asked wearily. "'If gone over the paperwork with the fine-tooth comb, "'I hate to say it, Ivy,' Topher dragged out a sigh. "'It appears everything's in order. "'The accounting department is going to look it over again tomorrow, just to be sure, "'but they don't see anything unusual.' "'I swallowed thickly at the bad news. "'Nothing? Sorry, Ivy.' "'Topher's disappointed voice came from the phone. "'I was not able to find out who Armand's lawyer is, either.' I do have a team of criminal lawyers who are willing to help pro bono once we can get in contact with him. I'm going to try to visit Luca tomorrow, I revealed. He's in the state prison. Prison? A disbelieving toe for Eckerd? I would have thought the Oaks Crossing Police Department would held him a little longer for questioning. I know, I sniffed, wiping away a tear. It's not good. It means the police have formally charged him with something, mused Topher. Once his arraignment happens, the charges will be made public as well as the name of his lawyer. At the very least, we'll have a starting point. If you can visit him and find out his lawyer information, we can contact them much sooner and offer our assistance. He's going to need all the help he can get, I added. A couple of officers at the police station have been helping me. They think Burmer is going to try to charge Luca with stealing drugs, money, and falsifying evidence. Burmer is building a solid case. He can build as much as he wants, declared Topher. All we need to do is punch a few holes in the case he's building and suddenly it becomes less credible. Remember, this is a criminal trial. That means they have to prove beyond any burden of a doubt that Armand is guilty. All we need to do is plant doubt. I would rather show that Burmer is the guilty person, I mentioned. That would be the most optimal solution, Topher softened his voice. We have a great team of lawyers, Ivy. We aren't going to let Armand go to prison for something he didn't do. Once his arraignment happens, if bail is granted, we could potentially have him home and out under house arrest. I hope so. I managed to say anything to get him out of prison. Why don't you call Bertie and ask if there's been any updates from their surveillance of Burmer? Maybe if we keep watch on him, he'll lead us to a solution on how to pin it all on him instead, offered Topher. I will. I clung to the hope that we could turn this around. We said our goodbyes and I filled Mabel in before calling Bertie. Hey, Ivy, Bertie said in a hushed voice. I have got eyes on the subject. Did you find out anything interesting today? I asked him. Mostly, Burmer has been in the police station, replied Bertie. He made an announcement that was interrupted a lot by the reporters with questions that contradicted his story of Conrad and Herb's guilt. The mayor came forward and stated that due to new evidence, Conrad and Herb were being released. He did? They are? Excitement crept into my voice. When? Soon, commented Bernie. I'm waiting with the crowd for their release. Boy, was Burmer mad over that. The interim chief of police got really red in the face. I guess he didn't expect to have his authority challenged. Good for Mayor Whitcomb. I grinned in delight. We still plan on digging around on Burmer. Oliver is going to follow him home tonight so we can see what sort of real estate he's sitting on, remarked Bertie. Don't get caught, I cautioned. Also, don't question any of the people in the police department. I already have two sources in there that we can get information from. The last thing we need to be is drawing attention to our investigation of Burmer. No worries. We aren't exactly amateurs, sniffed Bertie. What do you mean? You have investigated someone before? I questioned. Oliver was a private investigator, mentioned Bertie. Lionel used to work installing home security systems. I was a framer and have built a number of houses around Oaks Crossing, so I might know the layout of the home if I had a part in building it. We have experience, Ivy. You don't need to worry about us. I will worry anyways, I smiled as I told him. Be careful and keep me updated. We will do, Bertie ended the call. I petted Cupcake absently while wondering what we should do next. I think we should decorate the clubhouse, spoke Mabel. Have a big coming home party for Conrad and Herb. <laughs> that would be nice, I responded. I think they would like it. Don't worry, Mabel patted my hand. We'll throw another party for your detective as soon as we get him released. I was about to agree when I got a call from Thelma. Hello? We have done it, exclaimed a happy Thelma. The police have dropped the charges. Conrad and Herb are getting out of jail right now. That is great. I glanced at Mabel. Maybe we should decorate the clubhouse. At the very least, bake some cupcakes or something for everyone to enjoy. Ooh, a party! An enthusiastic Thelma gushed. Wonderful idea. 
I laughed a little. Look at what you've gotten us into, Mabel. I will call Will Knapp. He'll love to set up the music for us, suggested Mabel, grabbing her phone. Forget the cupcakes, honey, interrupted Thelma. We'll do an old-fashioned bring-what-you-can event. I don't want you hiding in the kitchen all evening long. I promise no hiding, I replied. I do think we have some extra baking that I can thaw out. Good Bring that and a drink, responded Thelma. Tonight we're going to have some fun. Tomorrow we work on getting Detective Amount free. I smiled as she hung up. She's right. We need to celebrate a little, said Mabel as she ended her call. I'm going to close off the office, and we're going to have a ready for a party. As much as I did not feel like partying, I knew it was important to the seniors I participate. I was happy for Conrad and Herb. My happiness was tinged with a little bit of longing and disappointment that Luca was not here to share in the moment. Despite my misgivings, it turned into a very fun evening. When I arrived, the seniors had set up tables with cloth tablecloths, chairs with bows on them, and strung up fairy lights intertwined with some pennants that looked suspiciously like the ones that had been used at the barbecue fest. Food and drinks were piled on a couple of tables. Will Knapp had the music started on soft, so speeches could be heard on the microphone. Someone had scrawled, Mystery Solved, over the section of wall where I had written down Conrad and Herb's names and the corresponding tasks for everyone to help get them out of jail. What do you think? grinned Mabel as she and Loretta taped a bunch of pictures of Conrad and Herb to the wall. I love it, I grinned back, looking at the pictures. There were many, some from when the men were much younger, standing beside old cars or at community events. Some photos showed them with their families. Others showed them as they were now senior citizens playing euchre or shuffleboard at the clubhouse. I teared up a little. We need to have group photo of everyone. I would love to have a photo of all my amateur senior sleuths. Then I can use it to rub Luca's nose in it when we free him. I think he would get a kick out of it, I heard Thelma say behind me. Great detective got himself in a bit of a pickle, snorted Conrad. Good thing we're here to bail him out. Conrad, I quickly hugged the frail but feisty elderly man. Now, now, that is enough, came his gruff voice even as he patted me on the back. Everybody seems determined to squeeze the life out of me. I'm just happy to have you back, I slowly let go, wiping away a tear. Conrad cleared his throat. You haven't replaced me at the office yet. I thought Mabel was eyeing my spot. Never say so, Mabel lightly admonished as she gave Conrad a hug. You are always welcome in the office. Where is Herb? I asked, looking through the thickening crowd. B needed a moment with him, Salma informed us with a wink. I think the two of them have finally clued in that friendship is a good base for a relationship. Always the matchmaker, tutted Mabel. I just smiled. I was glad for B and Herb. Good for them. Speaking of relationships, where is George? He said he would be here any minute, answered Thelma. She sobered, taking my hands in hers. George was going over some of the papers from the police station with some of his accounting buddies. He says they all seem to be in order. However, something was bothering him about the invoices, so he's going to keep trying. I swallowed thickly. Topher said the accounting department at his law firm didn't find anything abnormal. I guess it was a dead end. We'll just have to find something else for proof against Burmer. "'Did you see Tawny today?' asked Thelma with a twinkle on eye. "'If she gets elected, she could have the department investigated. "'We just got her in under the nomination time. Two weeks from now, Tawny could be the mayor.' "'I had rather hoped that Luca would not have to wait two weeks. "'I resolved to pull together everything we knew about the goings-on at the police station early tomorrow morning. "'Somehow there had to be a clue somewhere that would absolve Luca of any criminal activity. "'I just had to find it.' The group cheered as rosy-cheeked B and Herb entered the clubhouse. "'Today shows that teamwork and faith in people can bring freedom to those who have deserved it.' Will Knapp raised a can of beer up as he talked into the mic. "'To the happy camper senior sleuths! No mystery in town stands a chance against them!' Someone put a drink in my hand for the toast. After a quick sip, I treated it out for something non-alcoholic. I was going to need my wits about me tomorrow. I was encircled in a hug from Molly. Step one, free Conrad Nurb is done, she grinned triumphantly. Next step, free the hot detective. Hey, Chaz gave Molly a slight look of reproach as he laid a hand on my shoulder. He's not that hot. Well, he's certainly no Irish cream dream, allowed Molly as she teased him. But he is perfect for Ivy. Thanks. 
I shook my head at them, amused by their antics. The volume of music went up, and Conrad grabbed my hand. I hope you know how to swing. I'm about to make you look good, Ivy girl. I was surprised by the moves the elderly still had in them. Conrad certainly knew how to heat up the dance floor. Knapp had put on some fifties music, and we were all moving to the music, passing partners around and just enjoying the moment. Those who couldn't dance shuffled with friends or clapped in time to the music as they chatted happily. I saw Agatha tapping her feet as Loretta brought her a cup of punch. Topher was there, dancing with Mary Albany, the young woman who ran the local animal shelter. They looked to be having a good time. I gave a wave to Bee and Herb as they swung past at a slower speed in deference to Bee's arthritis. George had arrived, and he was showing off some sweet dancing moves with Thelma. The evening passed in dancing, toasts, and general good cheer. At one point, Herb took over the microphone, a drink in his hand, as he gazed over the crowd. When we were in jail, we never worried. Conrad and I knew the best people in the world were going to free us. We knew you wouldn't give up. Even though it was not easy, never once did we believe that jail was anything more than temporary. His eyes searched the crowd and found mine. Our Ivy is a force to be reckoned with. This young lady has not only brought life to our campground, but she has also been the glue to our little family. Without her, none of this would be possible. She makes us old folk feel young again. Thank you, Ivy, for organizing everyone, for having good judgment, for helping us. Conrad might make a few grumpy remarks, but he thanks you as well. I propose a toast to Ivy, our leader and our friend. Molly cheered in my ear, and I reflected that staying here in Oaks Crossing, keeping my grandmother's campground, had been the best decision of my life. Chapter 13. Progress. Next, the clerk said, motioning me to step forward. Identification. I pulled my license out of my pocketbook, showing the clerk. Ivy Thurman. Who are you here to see? he asked. Luca Armand, I nervously replied. He flipped through some papers, looking through a list. You are on the visitor's list. Sign here. I put away my license and quickly signed where he pointed, relieved that I was on the list. He gave me a visitor's badge to clip onto the front of my dress. A chair was pointed out to me, and I sat waiting on the hard plastic, looking at the depressing gray walls. A lot of visitors had showed up for Visitor's Day. We were a depressed lot of people, each a little anxious, most seemingly resigned. There were people of all ages, some mothers with children, some older seniors. Everyone had their own person to visit, and no one talked to each other as we waited. I shivered. While the heat had been stifling outside, the air conditioning was on full blast in here. I wish I had brought a sweater with me. I rubbed my bare arms, trying to find some warmth. It was forty minutes of waiting and seeing other people get their names called. Finally, a guard called my name, and I followed him with a group of people to another room. Ivy Thurman, window five. I took a seat in another hard plastic chair at a window where a large number five was painted above it. There were partitions between each window, so it gave a false feeling of some privacy, even though the guard was standing in the background watching us. I remembered Warren's warning that everything Luca and I might say would be recorded. We would have to be careful about what we talked about. It was a few minutes before a group of men in orange jumpsuits were brought into the room on the other side of the glass. I forced myself to stay in my chair as I recognized Luca. A guard unlocked the cuffs from around his wrists and motioned toward my window. Luca came forward, sitting in the chair across from me. We looked at each other for a long minute before he picked up the old-style phone receiver on his end of the window. I picked up the phone on my side of the glass, pressing it against my ear, listening as Luca said, Hey, beautiful. I blinked as tears came to my eyes and tried to smile. Hey, yourself. What is a handsome guy like you doing in a place like this? His smile faltered a little. Made a wrong turn, I guess. You aren't staying here. I said softly. We will get you out. Ivy, sighed Luca, his eyes turning serious. This might be beyond you and your friends. We have some help from some of your friends at the station, I protested. Between all of us, we will figure this out. Ivy, this is dangerous, warned Luca. I don't want you involved in this. You could get seriously hurt. I am not giving up on this, I retorted. Topher has a legal team put together. Just get your lawyer to contact him so he can help you. There's no point, 
responded Luca with a finality. Of course there is, I countered. You need to fight this. Ivy, I am being realistic. I have been transferred to general population. Luca's voice was low and intense. I've sent a lot of people to prison. One of these people is going to recognize me at some point, and there will be retribution. Places like this can make a man long on hate and short on forgiveness. I swallowed thickly. I am going to get you out of here before that happens. I was put here because whoever is behind the issues at the station wants me to disappear, grimly replied Luca. It's unlikely that I will make it to trial. You don't have to wait until trial. I didn't want to understand what he was trying to say. We will raise bail, no matter how much it is. Everyone is hoping to try to get you back to Oaks Crossing. I'm not getting out of here. There is a finality to his voice. I have accepted that. You need to accept it, too. No, I can't. I was fighting down panic. The thought that he believed he was going to die here terrified me. We found some information, and I have people studying it right now. We're going to find something on Burmer. I can feel it. There was a pause before Luca responded. Put your hand on the glass. I watched as he rested his palm on the glass between us. I set my palm against his, but could only feel the cold window against my skin. You are going to be okay, Ivy, Luca told me, his warm blue eyes resting on me. You have a lot of people who love you and are looking out for you. Stop it, I managed to say as a tear trailed down my cheek. You're going to get out. It would have been nice to take you on a real first date. On his lips was a half-smile, even as his eyes remained sad. Not just burgers in the car while it was raining. I liked burgers with you, I replied softly. But we will go wherever you want, just as soon as you are released. A buzzer sounded, indicating our time was over. You need to let me go, Ivy. Luca spoke before the phone cut out. No, I cried. No, no, no. I pressed my fist to my mouth as I watched him be handcuffed again, moving with the group of men single file as they left. A guard tapped me on the shoulder. Time is up, he said impassively, immune to my distress. Please follow the other visitors and exit the room. Taking a bracing breath, I hung up the phone. I hefted my purse and shakily stood. I walked out with the rest of the subdued visitors. Some wiped away tears, some seemed grim or resolute. Others looked like it was just part of their normal routine. I wondered how long Luca could be in here before pushing the thought from my mind. We were going to get him out of this place. Blindly, I returned the visitor badge and signed out of the visitor log. It was only when I was in Luca's SUV that I broke down. I don't know how long I cried, but once I was done, I realized my phone was ringing. Sniffling and wiping my eyes, I answered, Yes? Ivy? Ivy Thurman? A voice asked. That's me, I confirmed. Ivy, it's George Kershaw, the voice identified itself. I have something. I kept going over and over the invoices. They all looked good and legitimate, but when I investigated further, I found a bunch that weren't real. What do you mean they aren't real? I asked. For instance, there's a bill for over 5000 spent on a plumbing issue, chuckled George. The sneaky people had an invoice for services saying it had been paid and everything. Yet, when I tried to corroborate it with the plumbing company, there were no services rendered to the police station. The plumbers had a different customer entirely for that invoice number. Burmer is using dummy invoices to skim money out of the police budget for his own means. Okay, I blinked, trying to think of how we could use this to our advantage. How much has he been skimming? I don't know yet replied George. It's going to take a little time to investigate each invoice. I have asked Thelma, B, and Herb to help me call each business to verify the documents. With all of us at it, the time it takes will be reduced. Good. That is good, I replied absently. Ivy, are you okay? questioned a concerned George. I cleared my throat. I will be. I thanked George for his help and drove back to Oaks Crossing. It was a couple hours of driving, and I tried to think of, through what we knew. Burmer was taking money from the police funds for his own purposes. The former police chief, Williams, was not aware of it, and now Burmer had his job on a temporary basis. Mayor Whitcomb did not like Burmer and said that he had less than stellar record. I would need to investigate that further. What did Whitcomb have against Burmer? If Whitcomb remained mayor, he would have a large vote in who got the job of chief of police if Williams was found unable to continue the job. 
However, if Whitcomb was replaced by Boggs, would Burmer get the job? Boggs had been trying to do something in Whitcomb's office, whether it was plant false evidence or search for something. I needed to find out if Boggs and Burmers were allies. Who else was in on the missing budget dollars at the police station? George was figuring out just how much was missing. Could other town money also be missing? Oaks Crossing did a lot of fundraising for charity work, restoration projects, and the town budget in general. Was the embezzlement limited to just the police station? If Luca's investigation led to more missing money, no wonder Burmer was interested in getting Luca out of the way. Luca could die. Suddenly I felt overwhelmed. It was too much for just myself and my little band of seniors to solve. This was more than just asking questions and sticking our noses where they didn't belong. We held a man's life in the balance. Yet there was no one else. No one else was investigating. We would have to find the clues and solve this mystery. To do less than that was unthinkable. Deciding another talk with Mayor Whitcomb was in order, I parked the SUV in front of Town Hall. A quick look in the rearview mirror confirmed that I didn't look my best. My face was blotchy from crying, and any makeup I had worn had long since slipped off on moist tissues. I sighed, then straightened my shoulders in determination. Walking into Town Hall, I found that a security guard had been placed just past the lobby area, impeding anyone from continuing further into the offices or boardrooms. Too many people have been sneaking by lately, the board town clerk told me as she meandered past holding a stack of papers. Town council thought we should have a little protection, considering the local mood and protests. Can I please talk to Mayor Whitcomb? I asked, following her back to her desk. Although I found her less than helpful the times that I had talked to her, I needed her help if I was going to see the mayor. It's urgent business. Everything regarding the mayor is urgent business, she noted with a put-upon sigh. I might be able to get you an appointment. That is really not going to work. I gave her an assessing look. Do you enjoy working here? She snorted. You don't have the authority to threaten my job. No, I agreed readily with her. The next mayor might choose a different staff. Mayors can do that, right? Fire and rehire staff at will. Whitcomb has been mayor for sixteen years. She raised an eyebrow as she set down the paperwork. I doubt that will change. I don't know, I shrugged. Tawny Tilbury has locked down the senior voters. Boggs has people who want change from Whitcomb. The mayor himself said he never had an election race this close. I have faith in Whitcomb, she stated firmly, trying to pass me. I stepped in her way. What if Boggs got Whitcomb disqualified from the election? She blinked in surprise at the thought. How? I don't know, I admitted. I haven't worked out that part, but he was in Mayor Whitcomb's office when the mayor was not there. I don't know if Boggs was looking for something or meant to leave something there when I interrupted him. I locked the door behind us when we left and Boggs went back, which proves he was not looking for the mayor. All I have is your word against Boggs, she looked at me uncertainly. True, I agreed. Yet I have no reason to lie. <laughs> no. You are just desperate to get your boyfriend out of prison, she retorted. Word gets around. I swallowed as she pushed by me. Quickly, I followed her. I have proof that Burmer is skimming money from the police budget. If Whitcomb were to make it public, it would help his campaign to make him seem like a mayor that doesn't condone corruption. She stopped and looked around. Grabbing my arm, she pulled me into the copier room, closing the door. If what you say is true, it could win the election. I could give the evidence to Tawny and let her win, I explained. However, I need information from Whitcomb. I have questions which need to be answered, and I'm willing to make a trade. What sort of questions? She wanted to know. I see a lot of what happens around here. Are Burmer and Boggs working together? Have you seen them talking together? I inquired. Of course they talk, she replied. Boggs and Burmer are thick together. Burmer has weekly meetings with Boggs. There are also a few members of the town council they have swayed to campaign for Boggs. Some of the secondary members of the town councils meet with them, too. Who? Who meets with them? From what councils? I asked. There's towns from the education board. Martha, that's a friend of mine who works as a secretary, says he is power-hungry to take over as the leader. Towns is currently the treasurer. She ticked people off of her fingertips. Jefferson is the treasurer of the Parks and Recreation Board. He is campaigning to become the manager during this election. 
Salter is the treasure for the town books. He meets with Burmer and Boggs all the time. An idea came to me. I looked at her in astonishment as I verbalized the thought. What if it's not just the police department that is being embezzled from? What if it is every large committee, institution, or board in the town of Oaks Crossing? What if this election is a coup to own the money and power of the entire town? That is a crazy scary thought, breathed the clerk. We both jumped as my phone rang. I pulled my cell out of my purse, looking at the display. Warren? Hey, Anita. I know we said Uncle Bill doesn't need a cake, but I think it would be fun, spoke Warren. A cake? I was confused. Who is Uncle Bill, and why does he need a cake? I have ordered one from the Tasty Treats Bakery, continued Warren. Would you mind picking it up today? You can just put the cake in the freezer until we need it, darling. Okay, I agreed. I checked my watch. There was not much time until the bakery closed. Does it need to be picked up today? You are the best girl ever, stated Warren as he ended the call. A cake? The clerk looked at me in disbelief. It's not a cake, I assured her. It's something important. Tell Wickham what we talked about. I need to go. I pulled out a couple of business cards out of my purse, handing them to her. They had both mine and Molly's phone numbers on them under our business name of Happy Catering. Call me if you see anything happen. I told her as I quickly raced out of the building as fast as my air cast would let me. It would take longer to find parking for the SUV than to walk to the Tasty Treats Bakery. I determined as I walked across the street. Going as fast as I could, I made it just a few minutes shy of closing. Hi, I gasped as I approached the counter. I'm here to get a cake for Uncle Bill. Maurice, the owner of the bakery, nodded to me. I have the cake ready. I found it very interesting to get a last-minute order when I dropped off the regular order of donuts to the police station. Warren is such a good customer I could not refuse, despite how busy it was today. He went to a refrigerator and pulled out a cake box. Maurice set it on the counter, lifting the lid to show me a nice round cake with the script, Happy Birthday, Bill, iced on it. I have to admit, I was disappointed and more confused than ever. It looks nice. It is paid for. Maurice shut the lid. I must say I had great fun in making it. Pay particular attention to the creaminess of the ganache. Warren especially asked for it. Bon appétit. Thank you. I took the package, wondering if Warren was taking this subterfuge thing a little too far. However, I had a free cake out of the deal, so I was not going to complain exactly. I was heading out when another young woman rushed in asking for a cake for Uncle Bill. I waited, watching as Maurice repeated the performance, showing her the cake and declaring it paid. She thanked him and left ahead of me. "'It's so nice to see Anita, isn't it?' winked Morris. Such a lovely girl. She attracts the attention of many people outside. I was more confused than ever. Leaving the bakery, I saw a police cruiser with a cop I didn't recognize looking at the bakery with interest. I limped back to the SUV, wondering if I was losing my mind a little. Setting the cake on the passenger seat, I drove back to the clubhouse at the Happy Camper Resort. Picking up the cake, I went inside to look at my scribbling on the wall. Grabbing a drink of water and a fork, I started enjoying the cake while continuing to add to the wall. Beside Burmer's name, I put Boggs. Then I added the treasures from the Education Board, Parks and Recreation Board, plus the Oaks Crossing Town Council. Towns, Jefferson, and Salter were now added to my suspect list of suspicious people who might be in and on a scheme to profiteer off the people of the Oaks Crossing. I added how Burmer was using false invoices to bill for services that had never been performed. Maurice of the Tasty Treats Bakery had outdone himself. It was a beautiful chocolate ganache cake. My fork slipped through again for another bite when it hit something. Frowning, I used the fork to pull apart the layers of the cake to find something wrapped in cellophane. Carefully, I pulled out an envelope, destroying the cake in the process. Unwrapping the brown envelope, I tossed the plastic into the garbage. Breaking the flap open, I found pictures and papers. Photos showed Burmer and Boggs talking at the police station in an office. Records of missing drug evidence and money were written down. Numbers were circled with Luca's writing stated unaccounted for, missing, or reduced, with another number beside it. It looked like Luca had been doing a thorough inventory of the police station's evidence vault and had found discrepancies. Warren must have continued searching and found the notes hidden somewhere. Bless you, Warren, I breathed, looking over the incriminating evidence. 
A few sheets later, and I could see Luca's notes about how the books at the police station looked legit, yet he suspected there was some form of misuse of funds. With my phone, I took pictures of everything I had gotten from Warren, plus what I had written on the wall. I sent the information via text to Molly. Tucking the evidence back in the envelope, I unlocked the storage room. Opening a dusty box, I found it full of Grandma's old things. Thelma and whoever else had cleaned out Grandma's camper must have put the items here. I buried the envelope in the box, reclosing the lid before locking the storage room behind me. It would be safe for now. My phone rang. Expecting it to be Molly, I picked up. Hey, did you get all the information I sent you? Ivy, it's Connie from the hospital, replied a voice. Hi, Connie, I replied. I'm sorry, I thought you were somebody else for a moment. Police Chief Williams has died, she informed me. Chapter 14 Things Are Heating Up It took a moment for Connie's words to sink in. What happened? It looked like a medical complication, explained Connie. Something interfered with the medication he was given. The good news is Dr. Hillman is going to ask that an autopsy be performed so the cause of death can be fully determined. Maybe we can get some answers as to the chief's behavior during the past year. How long will it take for the results of an autopsy to come back, I wondered. It depends. Sometimes the preliminary results come back within a day if the death is pretty straightforward, answered Connie. If we need to wait on toxicology results, it'll take longer. For the full reports to come back, it can be up to six weeks, depending on how far behind the coroner's office is on other cases, and where in importance this autopsy ranks. It could be even longer if there was a murder and Burmer suppressed the autopsy. Even if the death was suspicious and could be proved to be murder, it would be too late to help Luca. I needed to find some hard evidence to get him out of prison. Thank you, Connie, I said gratefully. I appreciate all your help. I'll let you know if I hear anything else, Connie assured me. We ended the call, and I added the death of Police Chief Williams to my wall. Circling his name, I wrote drugged, murdered, beside it. I called Topher, filling him in on what George Kershaw had found about the bogus invoices. I sent him the same information I had sent Molly, so that he would have a copy of what Armand had found with the evidence inventory having items missing at the police station. Detective Armand was on to some serious tampering, commented Topher as he looked through what he had seen. When I come back to the campground, I can take the original documents and give them to the legal team. Has Lucas' lawyer gotten in contact with you? I wondered. Not yet. We're going to go directly through the prison tomorrow to find the lawyer's name, Topher informed me. We're doing everything we can. I thanked Topher again, promising to call him with any more updates I might have. With a last look at my confusing wall of clues, I walked to the office and collected cookie and cupcake. Remembering my car was still parked on the street in town and likely had gotten a ticket by now, I trudged along giving my dogs a walk. I would need someone to drive me into town so I could collect my orange Volkswagen Beetle. Stopping at Thelma's camper, I knocked on her door. Ivy, Thelma greeted me. You are lucky you caught me. I was just about to head into town to give the surveillance crew a little late supper. The boys are getting hungry watching acting police chief Burma. He might just be the police chief for good, I mentioned. Williams died today. What? Oh, no, exclaimed Thelma, a hand pressed to her heart. Williams was such a nice man. Well, until recently. I do think his mind was turning. He was a great deal more angry and rude this past year. His poor wife, she must be heartbroken. Thelma, would you mind if I hitched a ride to town? I asked. I need to pick up my car before it gets towed from Main Street. Sure thing, honey, agreed Thelma. You know you are always welcome to keep me company for a drive. Thanks. I helped her load an assortment of plastic dishes full of delicious-smelling food into the mercury meteor. As my stomach growled, I realized I had only eaten cake since breakfast. Soon enough, Thelma, Cookie, Cupcake, and I were on our way into Oaks Crossing. Can I ask you something? Certainly, Thelma assured me. How did you know that George was the one for you? I studied her profile as she drove. A slow smile spread across her face. You're wondering if Luca is the one for you. Maybe, I shrugged a little. I knew that I liked Luca. I enjoyed being around him, bickering with him, challenging him, and solving cases with him. It didn't hurt him one bit that he was handsome. And boy, could he kiss. Time will tell you for certain, replied Thelma. Whenever I'm near George, I feel like the world is a more vivid place. He makes me happy. 
I'm comfortable with him. I suppose you know that we used to be high school sweethearts. B mentioned it, I affirmed. Then you know his parents didn't approve, Thomas said without any rancor. We were young and had our whole lives ahead of us. Then George was told if he wanted a proper education paid for by his parents, he needed to go across the country to one of those Ivy League schools. We argued about it. George wanted to get a job locally and get married. I knew it wouldn't work if he stayed. As much as I loved him, George was used to a better life. I was white trail of trash at the time, so I made him a deal. He went to school and graduated. I would work and wait for him. He didn't come back for you? I asked. I couldn't wait, softly remarked Thelma. I was in a bad situation at home. Women back then weren't as independent as we are now. I chose to jump from one problem to the next. My first husband was not bad. We did okay, considering how poor we were. He liked to drink, and I was used to that. He passed away while he was drunk driving and hit a tree. George didn't forgive me for getting married for some time. He went on to have his own family far away from Oaks Crossing. How did you both get past the hurt? I questioned. Thelma had a shrug. Time. It takes time, perspective, and communication. Never doubt the good that can be accomplished in a proper conversation. George came back to Oaks Crossing, a widower with two grown children and four grandbabies. I was a widow who had put a second bad marriage behind me, thankful that I hadn't had children who would have borne that marriage with me. George and I accidentally bumped into each other on the street. Then we saw each other at the market, then at events. The pool was still there. He was my best friend and the boy that I had loved. One time during one of our accidental meetings, we talked. What did you talk about? I wondered. Everything, replied Thelma. Just everything. We talked about the past, about how we had done the best we could under the circumstances, what we had gone through in life, and how we had changed, how Oaks Crossing had changed. We just talked. Then every time we saw each other after that, we'd talk some more. Then one day he started paying for my meals, holding my hand, and asking when he could see me. It took a long time, but we have a second chance. Life is short, Ivy. Take your chances where you can, advised Thelma as she pulled up to the Oaks Crossing Central Park. If your day is made better by being near Luca, if you can talk to him and confide in him, then he's the man for you. I helped Thelma bring the food to a nearby picnic table, where Bertie and Oliver were waiting. Anything new, gentlemen? asked Thelma as she began to divide out the food. I handed out cutlery and mugs. The weather's still hot, Oliver popped the lid on his dinner. "'Enough to cook an egg on the pavement.' "'They say a thunderstorm's coming,' mentioned Bertie. "'Weatherman's been saying that for days. "'I haven't seen a drop of rain yet,' scoffed Oliver. "'I meant on the investigation,' clarified Thelma dryly as she sat down. "'The last container is for Lionel. "'Here, Ivy, we can share. "'I can hear your stomach rumbling. "'Thank you.' "'I poured out some iced tea from one of the thermoses Thelma had packed.' "'Vermin leads a pretty boring life,' sighed Bertie, setting his fishing hat to the side for the duration of the meal. "'He goes to work. He occasionally investigates something, but mostly he is at his desk shuffling paperwork, from what we can tell.' "'Twice, Burmer has been to the hospital to visit Chief Williams and Mrs. Williams,' added Oliver. "'He finally arrested Jason Kennedy's wife, manager, and girlfriend. Took him long enough to do that.' "'After Ivy solved the whole crime for him,' Thelma rolled her eyes in derision. Anything else? In the past few days, he's had three visits with Councilman Harlan Boggs, revealed Bertie. They seem very concerned about something. Boggs was quite upset from the looks of it. <laughs> we know they are in contact, I nodded. How about Burmer's house and car? Does he seem to have more money than what he should for his pay grade? No, sighed Bertie in disappointment. It seems like he's living within his means. His house and car are modest. However, the guy does wear a nice Rolex. Maybe he's being smart and not flashing around his ill-gotten gains, suggested Thelma. She had a laugh. A smart criminal for once. Very smart, I reflected, considering he was framing Luca for his crimes. We should have someone tail Boggs and a few other people, too. I think they might be working together. I explained to them what I had learned from the clerk at the town hall. How the treasurers from the town hall all seemed to be having extra meetings with Boggs. 
My theory is that all of them may be embezzling money from the town. I'm just not certain how to prove it. The financial records aren't public property, noted Bernie. It's not like we can just ask for them for a copy of their books. If they were being dishonest, the books would be misleading anyways, inserted Thalma. True, but if they are using the same method by creating false invoices, then we can catch them at it, I explained. The problem is getting the financial records. Why don't you just ask the mayor? questioned Oliver. Seems to me he has a vested interest in all this. It is an election year. If he were to uncover a huge plot to steal from the citizens of Oaks Crossing, he would be considered a hero. Easy win. Unless Mayor Wickham is caught up in the money-grabbing, theorized Thelma, then he wouldn't want anyone to find out the truth. I don't think he is involved. At least I hope he isn't involved, because asking him for access is the only way I can think of to get our hands on the financial books, I sighed. You will just have to take the chance and ask him, advised Bernie. Wickham likes staying mayor. I doubt he would do anything to jeopardize his precision. I'll try to talk to him again tomorrow, I decided. We finished up, Bertie promising to give the extra meal and tea to Lionel. Thelma packed up the empty dishes and headed off to her mercury meteor. I walked to where I had left my car, expecting a ticket to be under the windshield wiper. Instead, I found my car was missing. Drat, I muttered. It must have been towed. The only company that did towing in town was Mike's Garage. It was past business hours, but I gave him a call and left a message anyways. No doubt I would have to pay an impound and towing fee on top of whatever ticket the Oaks Crossing Police Department had decided to issue. I looked at the empty parking spot and decided to call Molly. I was going to need a ride home. The call went straight to voicemail. Hey, Molly, I'm in the town at the park, and I need a ride back to the campground. Call me back. Busy with my phone and debating how long to wait before calling the local taxi service, my mind registered the squeal of tires before I turned my attention to a black SUV swerving from the center of the road towards me. Chapter 15 The Clue The car hit the curb and the parking meter. I could hear metal and plastic crunching as I instinctively lunged for the edge to get out of the way. Scrambling, I pushed through the thick shrubbery into the park. The car burst through the hedge behind me, causing me to flinch as it continued by. Tinted windows prevented me from seeing anyone inside. Gasping in shock, I saw the car break and put on its backup lights as the driver shifted into reverse. Turning, I lurched over the broken hedge and ran toward the street. Perhaps I could get into a building and get away from the crazy driver who was bent on harming me. Stumbling over a coins from the damaged parking meter, I fled to the street only to see another car bearing down on me. The mercury meter braked hard, coming to a halt right beside me. I rounded the car as quickly as I could, wrenching open the passenger door and hopping in. "'My word, Ivy, you look awful,' began Thelma. "'Drive!' I interrupted her as the SUV backed out of the park towards us. Thelma's eyes widened as she took in the oncoming car and her foot laid on the gas. The meter sprang forward in response. I fumbled while putting on my seatbelt, trying to look over my shoulder to see the SUV behind us. The SUV paused in the middle of the road, then made a three-point turn, going in the other direction. I slumped into my seat with a gasp of relief. "'What on earth just happened?' asked a confused and slightly shaken Thelma. "'Honey, you have a twig in your hair.' "'I think someone just trying to warn me to stop the investigation,' I breathed. As Thelma helped pluck the offending foliage from my hair, I recounted the events of the past few minutes. "'Warn you?' exclaimed an upset Thelma. "'I... they tried to kill you!' I don't think so, I mused. Now that I was safe, I could think it over rationally. With the air cast, I can't move that fast. I think they were deliberately trying to scare me. We need to report this to the police, declared Thelma. They can find out who did it by the damage on the vehicle. I had a dry laugh. The police are the problem, remember? Likely it was Burmer or one of his friends. If they killed me, they would have to cover it up. This was just letting me know that they know I'm asking questions and snooping around. They want me to stop. I report this to the police and it will go nowhere. We drove in silence back to the Happy Camper Resort. As we made the turn into the campground, Thelma stopped the car, pulling it over to the side of the dirt path. I am just glad I decided to check on you. I just had the feeling I should. I didn't want you to be stranded if your car had gotten towed. 
I reached out and took one of her shaking hands in mine, giving it a squeeze. You have no idea how grateful I am you did come back to check on me. Thelma sniffed, wiping away a tear. I'm always good in a crisis. It's afterward that I tend to fall apart. This is quite serious, isn't it? It is, I nodded. We are going to have to be more careful. Thelma took a deep breath before turning the mercury back on. These people have no idea what they're up against. We are going to uncover their scheme and get them out of our town. They don't deserve to be a member of Oaks Crossing. Exactly, I agreed with her quiet determination. I think we need to have the other councilmen involved in the scheme followed as well, decided Thelma. We need to document who they are meeting and when. If Mayor Whitcomb chooses not to help us with evidence, we might have to break into a few offices. I still have my tools if we need to use them. Thelma had used her keys, otherwise known as breaking tools, to break into Al Frick's golf equipment rental shop a few months ago when we had been searching for evidence. I had never asked how she gained such a skill, nor had she volunteered the information. Will will give Whitcomb a shot first. I didn't refuse her offer to break and enter. Not when Luca was in prison and we needed all the proof we could get to help release him. Tomorrow we can start trailing towns, Jefferson and Salter. The clerk from the town hall pointed to them as possible suspects who were involved with Burmer and Boggs. "'I will let the boys know,' agreed Thelma. "'We're going to need more people involved if we're going to keep up a good surveillance.' "'Just tell everyone to be very careful,' I advised. "'I would hate for anyone to go through what I did tonight.' Thelma nodded. I watched, confused, as we passed the office. "'Um, Thelma? I need to stop the office to collect cookie and cupcake.' Oh, an embarrassed Thelma said, I'm sorry, I just wasn't thinking. If you don't mind, I need to grab my laundry. Afterwards, we can loop back around to the office. Sure, I agreed, but wondered why she would be using the dryer at the campground when none of the wash machines were working. Surely it would be easier just to complete the entire load of laundry at the town laundromat. Deciding it was none of my business how Thelma was doing her laundry, I kept quiet. Here we are, Thelma put the car into park and shut it off. Would you mind giving me a hand? I only have two baskets. If we both fetch one, I can get you back to the office quicker. Okay. I thought it was a little odd, but willing to get out of the car to help. My confusion grew as we stepped inside. There was all my senior crew clapping, and someone popped a bottle of bubbly. What is going on? Happy laundry day, shouted Conrad as everyone cheered. We all took our earnings from our events and taxiing services, inserted Herb, and bought a few new washing machines. All those treats I sold on the beach, said Mabel, plus the money Loretta made from the hoodies almost bought one machine on its own. They are used and a little dented, cautioned Thelma, yet they're all in working order. We came up with a bit of a fundraiser and got some donations for what we didn't manage to raise the funds for, mentioned B. However, we now have a fully working laundromat at the campground. Even the guests can use it. I chipped in for a new fire extinguisher, mentioned Agatha. There were big bows on the new and slightly dented white washing machines, which now took up the space of the old almond and green broken one that had been there. I felt myself cheering up. <laughs> they are perfect. It was so hard keeping the surprise, remarked Thelma as she gave my shoulder a squeeze. I almost blurted it out a couple of times. They are coin-operated, noted Herb as he handed me a set of keys. This way you can get some money back to put away for future repairs or replacements as needed. Someone passed a glass of something to my hand, and we were all rejoiced with a little party. The ever-promised storm did not arrive overnight, and the morning was heavy with mugginess. It felt like I was walking through a fog of humidity as I dropped off Cupcake and Cookie with Mabel in the office. "'Where is Conrad?' I asked curiously. "'He's with the boys, following our various suspects around,' mentioned Mabel as she gave my bosties a pet. "'I guess he thought it would be exciting. Once he's done his shift, Conrad will take over for me.' "'Okay. I wasn't really surprised that the retired coroner would want to be in on the happenings of our investigation. I'll see you later.' Taking Luca's SUV, I drove to Mechanic Mike's garage. I was hoping they had my orange beetle. Mike's was the only towing company in the area, so it made sense that they might have my car. The bell tinkled as I walked in the door. Hey, Mike, I began, but he raised a hand to cut me off. I don't have it, sighed Mike with regret. I tried to talk to Chief Burmer into letting me keep your bug here at the lot, but the jerk insisted on putting it at the small impound yard they have at the police station. You need to go to the station to get your car back. 
I expect they will inflate the towing and impound fees, so bring your checkbook. Burmer kept my car? I asked in surprise. Yep, commented Mike in disgust. He was really snarky about it. Said he wanted to talk to you in person when you came to get the beetle. Told me to call him when you came here looking for the car. Are you going to call him? I questioned, a little alarmed. Are you kidding? snorted Mike. His royal policiness isn't getting my cooperation. In fact, I'm going to call up Whitcomb and tell him this guy is out of line, trying to take my impound fees. Your car wasn't used in any crime, so this is abuse of power. I had the feeling Oaks Crossing would see many more abuses of power if the election went the wrong way. I nodded, distractedly agreeing with Mike, which was all the encouragement the beefy mechanic needed to continue. And if Whitcomb doesn't do something about it, then I'm throwing my vote behind Tawny Tilbury, concluded Mike with a decisive nod. The election is two days away. That is a firm deadline for Whitcomb to keep or lose my vote. Two days, I echoed. Was the election really that soon? I had been so busy lately, it felt like time was just flying by. A lot can happen in two days. It can, agreed Mike. Ivy, don't you worry about your car. Let me talk to Whitcomb and get it back to the yard here. I won't even charge you for the towing or impound, as this is a matter of principle. I want to wipe the smirk off of Burmer's face. Okay, I consented to his plan. Thank you, Mike. No problem. Mike had a determined smile. I'm looking forward to getting your car back for you. I left Mike picking up the phone and trying to get through to Mayor Whitcomb. While I was a little shocked the police department had kept my car, I could see it was a strategic move. It was obvious that Burmer knew I was investigating between my missing car and nearly being driven over yesterday. He wanted me to be scared and to stop. That wasn't going to happen. I called George Kershaw for an update on what he had found as I drove to the town hall. Hi, George. It's Ivy. I was wondering how far you had gotten through the invoices. With the help of Topher's team of accountants, we are almost done, replied a confident George. We've marked at least 40 invoices as being faked or inflated. The amount of money over the past two years being drained through the police department from the town of Oaks Crossing is at the half-million threshold. Half a million dollars? I repeated in surprise. How long has Burmer been on the police force? Was he there when the invoices started to be switched? No idea, an apologetic George stated. I'm sorry, Ivy, I just don't know. That's okay, I assured him. I will talk to Warren and see if he knows. I'm also going to try to get you to audit the books of some other departments in Oaks Crossing, if I can manage to get a hold of them. I think this embezzling might be town-wide. If Burmer is taking money from numerous departments, we could be talking millions of dollars missing from the town, concluded a grim George. Exactly, I confirmed, which is why we need to stop him. Arriving at the Oaks Crossing Town Hall, I decided to give Warren a call before tackling the mayor. Hey, Warren, it's Anita, I greeted him. Anita, I can't talk to you right now, Warren told me. This isn't a good time. Okay, can I ask you a quick question, I wondered. You know, I think you are taking this relationship way too seriously, said Warren. Excuse me? I was a little lost about what Warren was saying. I just need to know when Burmer came to Oaks Crossing and started on the police force. I know it has been about two years since we first met, but we've only been dating for a little while, continued Warren. I feel like you're constantly breathing down my neck and watching me. I can't do anything without your marking on it. I don't want a girlfriend who's so controlling. You need to get a life outside of me. Warren had emphasized breathing down my neck, watching, controlling. His words clicked into my mind and I asked, Burmer is on to you, isn't he? Exactly, exclaimed Warren. With all the stress at work and at home, I just can't do this anymore. I think we need to take a break, Anita. This was why he had gone through the effort of getting another girl to pick up the cake from the Tasty Treats bakery, a diversion for whoever had been watching in the police car. Warren believed his movements were being monitored by his fellow policemen. Then we will take a break, I agreed. Call me if you need something, Warren. Warren heaved a sigh of relief before talking to someone else. She hung up on me. Can you believe it? I heard the click as he ended the call. Warren had been brave, getting me as much information as he could when he was surrounded by corrupt police officers. I couldn't fault him for wanting to lay low, especially when the last police officer to go against Burmer was now in prison. 
The good news was Warren had intimated that Burmer had been on the force for two years since the beginning of the invoices being falsified. Putting my phone away, I went into the town hall, hoping to get more answers. I went directly to the clerk's desk, hoping to get an appointment to speak to Mayor Whitcomb as soon as possible. I would like to talk to Mayor Whitcomb, please, I stated, standing in front of the clerk's station. Ivy, I don't think that this is a good idea, began the clerk, looking furtively around the lobby areas. What do you mean? I frowned. During our last talk, the clerk had seemed like she was going to be helpful. I wondered if something had changed her mind, or perhaps someone. Mayor Wickham is busy with the election, she told me. Grabbing a pen, she scribbled something down on an edge of a paper. He can't see you now. This is about the election, I told her. I need to speak to him. It's urgent. I can't help you, she remarked airily as she ripped the piece of paper she had written on. At that moment, I heard Wickham's voice clearly. I turned to find him discussing something with another member of the council. Not wanting to waste the moment, I marched up to them. Mayor Whitcomb, I forced a smile. If I could have a moment of your time. Whitcomb looked at me in surprise and cleared his throat uncomfortably. Miss Thurman, if this is about the cupcakes, I assure you I paid in full for your services at the barbecue fest. It's not about that, I assured him. It's about a more pressing matter. I would love to speak to you in private if I could. Miss Thurman! The clerk huffed as she came over and joined our little group. I'm so sorry, Mayor Wickham. I tried to tell her that you were all booked up and didn't have time to see her. Ivy Thurman, I have heard a lot about you, the man who had been conversing with Wickham said, extending a hand. Kenneth Salter. Nice to meet you. I automatically took his hand before I realized that this was the man who was the treasurer of the Oaks Crossing Town Council. His eyes were unfriendly even as he smiled and squeezed my hand a little hard. Miss Thurman, Mayor Whitcomb looked at Salter with a bit of alarm. I really don't have time for this. I have a town to run. Please leave. This is urgent, I insisted. It's about the town. I promise I won't take up much of your time. I simply can't talk to you today, remarked Whitcomb. Security? Salter snapped his fingers at the large security guard who was stationed at the doorway, which led from the lobby to the town council offices. I told you before, you really need to go, admonished the clerk. She grabbed my arm, propelling me along. You're practically a stalker, the way you always want to see Mayor Whitcomb. Excuse me? I asked, shocked and a little annoyed by her attitude. I pulled my arm out of her grip. I just need to talk to the mayor. Ma'am, the burly security guard said as he approached us, you need to leave. She was just going, inserted the town hall clerk as she gave me a little push. You heard the man. You aren't wanted around here. I blinked in surprise at her hostility. Looking around the security guard, I could see Salter take Whitcomb by the shoulder turning him back toward the offices where Boggs stood, arms crossed and smirking at me. The security guard grabbed my arm and I yanked it away. I'm leaving. Good, the town clerk practically spat at me. I will escort you out, the security guard gestured that I should precede him out of the building. Scowling, I complied. Once we had reached the front steps, the security guard felt compelled to add, Don't come back. I'll call the police if you do. Ignoring him, I got into the SUV. I waited until the security guard had returned to the building. Once he had, I opened the scrap of paper the town clerk had pushed into my hand during our altercation. Chapter 16 I unfolded the small scrap of paper. Scrawled on it was two words, a name, James Carmichael. It was obvious Boggs was now in control of Town Hall. I didn't know what he had told Whitcomb, but the man was afraid of Boggs. I wouldn't be getting any information from Whitcomb or any access to other financial data from Oaks Crossing through him. It appeared I needed to talk to James Carmichael. I remembered meeting James at the reading of the will for Ethel Murley. He was on the Parks and Recreation Board of Oaks Crossing. He was a quiet, gentle man who owned a farm just outside of town. He also had other assets in town, including the house that Luca had been renting beside Tawny Tilbury. The Carmichael family was an old one, as old as the Miltons who had founded Oaks Crossing. 
Pulling out from the parking lot, I drove through Oaks Crossing. As I cruised along the street, I could see a multitude of Vote Tawny Tilbury signs out on people's lawns. It appeared our last-minute entry into the election was gaining a great deal of support. Turning a corner, I glanced in my rearview mirror. A police car made the turn behind me. Glancing at my speed to ensure I was being within the town speed limit, I put on my blinker and made another turn at random. The police car followed me. Oh, my word, I breathed. The police were following me. How was I supposed to meet with anyone or do any investigating when I had a cop tailing me? Pulling into the food mart, I parked in a spot. The cruiser drove slowly past and took a parking spot at the end of the lot. Grabbing my purse, I went into the grocery store. The cop stayed in his vehicle. I pulled out a cart, throwing a few random groceries in it as I called Molly on my cell phone. Molly? Hey, Ivy, replied Molly. Did you know there's a cop sitting outside of the campground? Thelma told me she had a police escort all around town as she was doing errands this morning. This was starting to get scary. No, I didn't know. I have one who just followed me to the food mart. Hey, Ivy, greeted Chaz Bison as he came to the same aisle as me. Nice day to get a little shopping done. It is, I replied. Molly, I have to go. You were talking to Molly? asked Chaz as he watched me hang up on the phone. Yes, I answered. Chaz, could you help me out? Sure, agreed Chaz readily. You might want to know what you're agreeing to first, I mentioned dryly. There is a cop in the parking lot right now. He's been tailing me. I would like to lose him. Chaz thought for a moment and gave me a assessing look before nodding. That's easy enough. <laughs> really? I frowned in confusion. I haven't even figured out how to go about getting away from the police car just yet. Chaz smiled. I have. Moments later, Chaz had paid for and bagged up a cart of groceries. I was scrunched into the middle of the shopping cart, bags all around me. If the teenage cashier thought I looked ridiculous, she didn't say a word. Chaz just chatted like it was the most normal thing in the world to have a woman hiding in a grocery shopping cart. He pushed the cart and me out of to his pickup. Chaz was unlocking his doors when I heard him speak. Morning, officer. It's afternoon, the dour voice corrected him. Chaz had a chuckle. I see it is. Nice day for some shopping. We're having a camp out tonight at the Mighty Oaks Christian Campground, so I needed some extra food. If you would like, you're more than welcome to join us. Bring a friend if you'd like. As you can see, I have plenty of food for the event. Have you seen Ivy Thurman? the officer asked, ignoring Chaz's invitation. Yes, a truthful Chaz replied. She was inside getting groceries. I saw her in aisle eight. Is there a problem, officer? No, no problem. Have a good day, the officer replied. I could hear footsteps retreating. Chaz grabbed a couple of bags, putting them away in the backseat of the double cab. Chaz's low voice came to me. Wait a moment. Chaz continued to unload groceries as my heart fluttered in terror. Nothing about what we were doing was illegal in the least, but I was still worried the cop would see me. I held my breath, counting to ten before murmuring, Is he gone? One moment, whispered Chaz, who was coolly loading groceries as if he had nothing better to do. He glanced over, then reached into the cart to help me. Now! I grabbed the side of the cart, clambered over the rim to get into the back seat of the truck. Sinking in the space between the front bucket seats, I tried to calm my breathing while Chaz calmly loaded the rest of the groceries. He then shut the door, locking the truck before returning his cart to the cart corral. I resisted the urge to pop my head up and check what the cop was doing. What if he had seen me? He had been right beside the grocery cart when he had been speaking to Chaz. While I had been covered with reusable grocery bags and groceries, there might have been a gap where he could have noticed me. Even though the cruiser was on the other side of Chaz's pickup truck, he might have seen the flurry of activity while I jumped into the truck. Stay down. Chaz got into the truck, putting on his seatbelt with deliberate slowness. He started the truck and gave a wave to the officer before pulling away. You waved at him? I asked incredulously. I wave at everyone. If I didn't wave, it would be out of character noted Chaz as he put on his blinker. He waited for a car before safely exiting the parking lot. He's not following us. You can get on the passenger seat now. I sighed in relief. You are amazing, Chad Bison. Chad gave me a grin. Where do you really need to go? To James Carmichael's place, I informed him. 
Thank you for helping me. Don't worry about it, commented Chaz as he took the long route around town, making certain we weren't being followed before driving to the long lane of the Carmichael farm. Have you met James before? Once, I explained. At Ethel Murley's will reading, she had left some money to various charities around town. He's a nice fellow, mentioned Chaz. I met him a few times. He is a bit of a hermit and rarely gets off to the farm unless it's for his charities or board activities. Well, I need to talk to him. I pulled out the scrap of paper showing Chaz. The clerk at the town hall gave me this. I'm hoping James has some information about what is happening in Oaks Crossing. Chaz nodded. Would you like me to come with you? Then I can give you a lift back to the Happy Camper Resort. I would appreciate it, I replied. I hadn't thought that far ahead, wanting only to escape the cop who had been following me. Chaz and I walked up to the old farmhouse. It was large and comforting, with a landscaped lawn and large vegetable garden to the side. A porch swing graced the large veranda. There were large, mature trees in the yard, a couple of old, large bank barns out back. Wooden fences surrounded lush pastures. It's a very nice place, I commented as Chaz knocked on the screen door. Footsteps came down the hall. Soon, James Carmichael was at the door. The thin, bearded man watched us with steady brown eyes. Can I help you? I hope so, I replied. The clerk from town hall gave me your name. I'm investigating what is happening to the financials of Oaks Crossing. I think money is being stolen from the town. I understand you are on the board of Parks and Recreation. James paused for a moment. You should come in. We followed him through the immaculate and antique cluttered house to the back where a quaint, old-fashioned kitchen received a great deal of light from large windows. James gestured for us to have a seat while he put a kettle of water onto the stove. A cat wove around Chaz's feet, and he scooped it up to pet it. James pulled out some mugs, then sat with us. How do you know money is being stolen from the town? Detective Luca Ramond was investigating the matter before he was put into prison by the new chief of police, I told him. I have some of his notes. I also have evidence the police department has been embezzling funds. The theory is the money isn't just being stolen from the police department, but other areas of Oaks Crossing as well, including the Parks and Recreation Department. You are a member of the Parks and Recreation Board, aren't you? Yes, quietly admitted James. I am. Do you know anything about the missing funds? asked Chaz. Or have any access to the invoices of the board? What are you going to do with the information that you find? James questioned, assessing us. It's not like you can go to the police. There are a number of officers who are involved in the financial cover-up, and have a vested interest in keeping the matter quiet. For a moment, I wondered if the clerk of the town hall hadn't wanted me to question James Carmichael, but instead had been warning me about him. Perhaps he was in on the whole scheme. We'll go to another police department, suggested Chaz. One outside Oaks Crossing. Perhaps the state police. Someone has to do something about this. We leak it to the press, I decided, eyeing James to see what reaction he had to the idea. I have the name and direct phone number of a reporter for a large media outlet. Once we have enough proof, we can leak it to the press and no one will be able to cover up what is happening here. No offense, Miss Thurman, James examined me as he spoke. How do I know I can trust you? You can trust me, Chaz noted. We've known each other for years. I have never done you wrong, James. Here's the reporter's card. I fished it out of my purse, setting it on the table. Take a picture on your phone. If I don't like the material, you can. The kettle whistled. James got up, pouring us tea. He set the hot kettle on a cold burner. I have a copy of the P&R books. They're a couple of weeks out of date, but there are inconsistencies. I'm not an accountant, but I know there should not be invoices for businesses which no longer operate. I also know the fund for P&R are far less than what they should be at this time of year, especially since we've been doing several budget-saving measures. Are the invoices for closed businesses? I asked, zeroing in on the proof to help our case. Yes, confirmed James. George Kershaw has been practicing accounting for three years now, 
Yet last year's audit of the books was done by his firm, according to the invoices. That's brilliant, admitted Chaz thoughtfully. It looks like the audit was done by a reputable firm, and they can pocket the money for a service which never happened. They're using the same method to pilfer money from the police department budget, I informed them. We can prove it. We have the invoices and have talked to all the businesses involved who have given copies of their real invoices to the accounting team we have investigating. We just need to be able to prove how many other departments are affected and who is involved. And after you figure that out, what happens? James still appeared to be on the edge of trusting me. We leaked the proof. Hopefully the state police can be involved and the people responsible go to jail, I told him. As an added bonus, Detective Armand is cleared of any wrongdoing and was released. Luca is innocent, remarked Chaz. Okay, nodded James. Wait here a moment. I nervously waited for James to return. For all I knew, he was informing Burma of what we had said. I hope we can trust James. Of course we can trust James, Chaz looked at me in surprise as he drank his tea, still petting the cat who purred contentedly. A few moments later, James reappeared. He handed me a USB stick. Tony Jefferson is the treasurer of the P&R board. It's his job to securely record expenses and keep the books in balance. Tony has to be in on the scheme. This is a copy of what I took from Tony's office. He is currently campaigning not only to keep his treasurer position, but to replace the manager of the board. Are people allowed to do that? I asked as I put the USB stick in my purse. Have two positions on the board? It's unusual. But there is a precedent, admitted James. It's been done before, so it is allowed. I have it, a female voice yelled in triumph as the screen door to the back of the house opened and shut. We all turned to see Mary Albany's shocked look at our presence. She blushed, adjusting her glasses and smoothing her plaid skirt, as she palmed the USB stick she had been holding aloft like a prize. Hi, offered Chaz into the awkward moment. Mary cleared her throat and touched her brunette bob. I wasn't expecting you to have company. They dropped in. James came forward, taking the USB from Mary. Is this what I think it is? Mary smiled, joy lighting up her whole face. It is. He went out of the office, and I had the perfect opportunity, so I copied the books. Mary Margaret Albany. You could have been caught, accused James in a concern. I wasn't. Mary murmured, chastised. Then she held her head up and straightened her spine. He doesn't suspect anything. Really, who would think meek and mild Mary stole something from them? Who doesn't suspect anything? I couldn't stay silent any longer. Curiosity burst out of me. I wanted to know what was on the USB. What did you steal? I copied the financial files of the town of Oaks Crossing, announced a smug Mary. She shot James a look, and no one is the wiser. It was a huge risk, admonished James. One you should not have taken. They're taking from our town, James, retorted Mary. My mother was a Milton, and you are Carmichael. We have a responsibility to Oaks Crossing and the people in it. The full financial books of Oaks Crossing are on the USB? I inquired in shock. This was a complete bonus of being at the right place at the right time. I'll make a copy for you, decided James. He gave Mary a lingering look. We aren't done speaking about this. She crossed her arms and raised an eyebrow. James, Carson, Carmichael, if you think for one moment you can tell me what to do, you are wrong. For a moment I felt bad about Topher. It was obvious that James and Mary would make a good couple. They were of the same age group and appeared to be fast friends, possibly more. I wondered if Thelma had known that when she set Topher up with Mary. Then again, maybe James needed a little competition to figure out his feelings, like Luca had. James held back on whatever he was going to say, leaving us to make a copy of the USB stick. Mary grabbed a mug from the cupboard and poured herself some water out of the kettle, despite the fact it was no longer hot. I see Socks likes you. Socks? echoed Chaz. Oh, you mean the cat. She's particular about who she likes. Mary said softly before dropping into a chair. How did you get a copy of the financial books, I wondered. Mary smiled. I was talking to Kenneth Salter. I asked for a larger budget for the animal shelter. We need a new roof on one of the buildings. 
In the middle of our conversation, Salter was called away by Councilman Boggs. I figured it would be at least a few minutes before they resolved whatever Boggs wanted to converse about, so I used the time to make a copy of the financial records. Fortunately, Salter had left the screen open, so I didn't even need to guess at passwords. I just copied the files. When Salter came back, he told me I was a Milton descendant, so if I wanted a new roof, I should go beg from my relatives. He is such an ignorant man. I made a mental note to never underestimate Mary Albany. Wow, said Chaz in admiration. A foolish risk, muttered James as he gave me a USB stick with the information on it. You could have been caught. I wasn't, repeated Mary, taking a sip of her tea. You should have more faith in me. I have seen you try to keep a secret or a lie, replied James. It's not exactly something you're good at. Mary just rolled her eyes. Will you be able to find out if there are any inconsistencies in the file? questioned James. I nodded. Topher and George Kershaw are helping with the accounting angle. They'll find anything that looks like it was forged or tampered with. Then we can add that to our proof of what is happening. However, I'm not certain how we're going to find out if Eugene Towns is involved. He's on the education board. There might be embezzling there as well, according to the clerk at the town hall. I have no reason to talk to Towns, admitted Mary. She looked at James. What about you? James grimaced. I could talk to him about perhaps making a donation to the scholarship funds. However, we would need a sizable distraction to give me time to download his files. And that only works if we get lucky again and the screen is unlocked. What are the chances he would have his screen unlocked? wondered Chaz. Probably not good, I sighed. We can try, but I doubt it will happen. Everyone has a lock screen that is password protected. Then we're at a dead end when it comes to the educational department, noted a grim James. All the other departments are so small, I don't believe they have been stolen from. How did you figure it out? questioned Chaz. Ivy found out through Luca Armand. What tipped you off? I have a head for math, quietly admitted James. I keep a running tally of a number of things in my head without meaning to. He is a genius, inserted Mary. He won a scholarship from Harvard and a bunch of other schools. James turned them all down to stay on the farm. Hush, Mary, James said without any rancor. The tips of his ears turned red, and I wonder if he was embarrassed by his intelligence. My parents weren't well at the time. My place was with them. You could have gone since, pointed out Mary. Been a math professor or something. I prefer being here, shrugged James. This is home, which is why I don't like to see people stealing from my hometown. What do you mean you keep a running tally? I asked for clarification. What is the approximate raffle total at this month for the Flower Club? Questioned Mary with a confident smile. Uh, five dollars per ticket. The last ticket count was 15,000 equal to 75,000. Is a 50% split, so the prize stands at 37,500. James didn't even blink at the math. What amount of money is in the shelter account? Questioned Mary. Considering it is the 20th of the month and you've done your weekly shopping, plus gotten your monthly orders in, there should be $912.63 in your shelter account, responded James. You're off by two dollars, quipped Mary. Shipping went up. James looked at me. I'm guessing, based on the repairs you've made to the campground, you have approximately $2,333 left of Ethel Murley's money. Give or take a little. I blinked in surprise. You're twenty dollars out. Yet I'm close enough. James gave a self-depreciating sigh. It's a bad habit of mine, one I've never been able to turn off. That's how you figured out they were stealing, nodded Chaz. It's a gift, James. Maybe, a reluctant James said. If my calculations are correct. Boggs and his friends have taken nearly five million dollars away from Oaks Crossing in just under two years. If they get full electoral power, they could do a lot more damage and no one would be able to stop them. We're not going to let that happen, I promised. Chapter 17 As soon as I got back to the campground, I found Topher in the tent area. Handing over the two USB sticks, I let him know what they contained. This is great, affirmed Topher as he grabbed his laptop and we headed toward the office to get good internet connection. I can send all the information to George and the accountants, 
They've been working together and are coming up with a solid case against Boggs. Good, I nodded. However, we are having problems getting the information we need from the education board. What sort of problem? wondered Topher. We can get a person in to talk with Towns with a legitimate excuse. We can distract Towns. Yet, if the laptop is password encoded, then there's no way we can just copy the files we need to, I explained. That is a problem, agreed Topher. He pulled out his cell phone and dialed the number. Hey, Ben, can you still break passwords? Topher, I don't hack computers anymore, the disembodied voice of Ben gently warned over the phone. Since when? questioned Topher. Since several departments of the United States government told me if I wanted to remain a regular citizen, I should behave myself, replied Ben. Otherwise, I might find myself voluntold to be a recruit to one of their more secretive programs. Oh, a disappointed Topher said. That's too bad. I was hoping you could break us into the Slimeball's computer so we could copy some files. As fun as it might be, I can't. I'm already on a few dozen watch lists. I do anything illegal in the computer world, and no one will ever see me again, a regretful Ben stated. Sorry, buddy. Not a problem, sighed Topher. We'll figure something out. If you need any other help with the slime ball, let me know, offered Ben. Will do, promised Topher as he ended the call. Ben is a hacker? I asked doubtfully. I remembered the guys Topher had brought along with him to the campground, and I couldn't see any of them doing nefarious activities. They all seemed so nice, nerdy, and sweet. He used to be, replied Topher, opening the door of the office so I could go first. Once he hacked into the entire school system, just before the yearbook was set to be sent to the publisher. We changed all sorts of stuff, and when it was published, the school was not impressed. I believe we switched out the prom queen and king's pictures to the worst ones we could find on the internet of the pair of them. A few other somewhat harmless substitutions were made. Oh dear, I grinned. I bet you were in a lot of trouble in school. Straight-A students, protested Topher with a grin, and before you ask... Ben never changed any of our grades, despite how many times John asked. I laughed, petting Cupcake and Cookie as the two doggies came over, stubby tails wagging. Hi, Conrad. How was your day? Cop started following me around, grunted Conrad as he wrote a word in the crossword puzzle of the newspaper. It was a regular circus. Cop following me while I followed Eugene Towns around town. That must have been something to see, Topher plugged in the laptop and got to work. "'You know, I have been thinking,' commented Conrad, setting down his newspaper. "'All we need is enough proof to implicate Boggs, Burmer, and those with him. We don't need everything. All we need to do is start an investigation by the big guys. The state or the FBI can carry on our work as long as we get Burmer and Boggs, plus get Detective Armand out of prison.' "'Maybe we do have enough evidence,' I mused, depending on what we find on the two USBs I got today.' I better get the files to the accountants, remarked Topher. Then we can see if we have enough to get an investigation going through official channels. I hope so, I murmured. I left Topher working on transferring the files. Conrad said he would lock up the office after they finished, so I grabbed Cookie and Cupcake for a walk. Somehow it was even hotter than it had been before, despite the sun being blotted out with dark clouds. The air was still and muggy. Finally, it felt like the often-promised storm might finally come and break the heat. Hi, Ivy. Bee loaded a box into the trunk of her car. She squinted at the sky. Oh, dear. I was hoped to get this done before it rained. I hate driving in the rain. I could come with you if you would like, I offered. Where are you going? To the community center, explained Bee. I borrowed a few things for the protests. They need to get back today, as tomorrow there's a dinner. Would you like me to drive? I asked. "'Thank you, Ivy,' sighed a relieved bee. "'I would very much appreciate it. "'I don't know why, but driving the rain just isn't my thing. "'I've been that way ever since I got a license. "'Let me bring the dogs to my trailer, then we can go.' "'I tugged on Cookie's leash. "'Oh, let them come with,' responded Bee with a smile. "'They can keep us company.' "'We loaded up the last of the boxes, and Bee handed me the keys. "'Cookie and Cupcake wandered to the back seat, "'looking out the windows as we drove.' I brought B up on the details of the case. Sounds like you have something solid. Are you going to reach out to the state police? Questioned B. State police, the reporters, anyone who will listen, I sighed. As soon as George and the accountants can figure out if money has been taken from the parks and recreation as well as the Oaks Crossing books, 
we can get other people involved. I pulled up to the back parking lot of the Oaks Crossing Town Community Center. B unlocked the back door and put on the lights as I grabbed a box from the trunk of the car. So what's the deal with you and Herb? I teased a little. Are you dating? B blushed. We're spending a little more time together. People my age don't date. <laughs> Why not? I asked curiously. I thought Thelma and George were dating. Dating is for young folk, responded B as she opened the supply closet. It has all sorts of expectations. I don't date anymore. In fact, I don't think I ever really dated. I thought you were married, I frowned a little. How do you get married without ever dating? My husband, bless his soul, was my friend, explained B. We never formally went out on a date or anything. We were in our twenties. He broached the topic of getting married. Everyone else of our acquaintance was, so we thought we should too. You didn't love him? I wondered as we grabbed more boxes. I certainly did, replied B. Love just came later, after we were married. We had a good time, my John and me. I digested this, wondering what it might be like to marry someone you were simply friends with. I suppose a lot of people did it, and I wouldn't hold the idea against them. Friendship was a solid basis of any relationship. You won't have to worry, B gave me a crafty look. There is a spark between you and Luca. Hey, I put the brakes on her line of thinking. Luca and I just figured out we like each other. Neither of us is looking to get married. It doesn't take long to know if someone is the one you're going to be with for the rest of your life, warned B with a smile. Cookie growled as I set another box in the supply closet. I looked at her in surprise. What is it? The little dog continued to look out of the supply closet door, growling low in her throat while Cupcake hovered behind me. Do they hear something? wondered B as she set her box on a shelf. We both listened as voices came to us. "'Think they own the hydro company leaving the lights on,' a man said in disgust as the front doors to the community center were opened. "'I tell you, these old ladies are entitled.' "'They're also voting for Tawny Tilbury,' another voice was annoyed. "'What sort of town bylaws give the opportunity for someone to join the mayoral race so late in the election? "'It's just stupid. That is one of the first things I'm going to fix around here.' A man laughed. "'Right after we robbed the town blind.' I carefully nudged the supply closet door until it was almost closed, motioning for B to turn off the lights so the men wouldn't notice us. Peeking through the crack in the door, I saw Burmer, Boggs, Towns, and Jefferson at a table, each with a box. Mark up the ballots. Put them in the ballot box here, and during election day, we just add it to the group, remarked Boggs, ensuring we all get the positions we deserve. B gasped beside me. They're rigging the vote! Cookie growled again, and I quickly picked her up, putting a hand on her muzzle. "'Did you hear something?' asked Towns. The man looked around. "'We're a salter anyhow.' "'He had something going on with the wife,' grumbled Jefferson. "'A man is whipped,' huffed Burmer as he used a ballpoint pen to scratch an X on a ballot. "'Have you met Mrs. Salter?' chuckled Towns. "'All I can say is I'm happy I'm not married to her.' Grabbing my cell phone out of my pocket, I carefully extended it out the door, taking photos of them marking ballots. Cookie shifted in my arms, causing me to almost lose my grip on my phone. I tried to grab the little dog so she wouldn't fall, but she leapt forward, barking. "'What is that?' questioned a suspicious Boggs. "'Oh, dear,' breathed B, clutching Cupcake's leash. "'Get behind the boxes!' I hissed at her. "'Hide!' "'Too late!' an angry Burmer opened the door and flicked on the lights. Quickly I shoved my phone behind my back. "'Well, well, who do we have here?' smiled Boggs as he advanced on us. "'The ever-intrusive Miss Ivy Thurman and one of her senior sleuths, spying on us again.' "'We were just returning some tablecloths,' mentioned B in a trembling voice. "'You expect me to believe that excuse?' snorted Counselor Boggs. "'When you and your band of people have been following us around town for the past two days?' "'You had the police following me,' I pointed out, pulling on Cookie's leash as she snarled at Burmer. "'B and I will be leaving now.' "'Don't think so,' Burmer put his arm in my way, blocking the doorway. "'I think you've interfered in things enough.' "'As you've said, people have been following you around town.' I looked to Boggs, trying to talk my way out of this, even as my fingers skipped along the screen of my phone behind my back which means there are people outside the community center right now who know that I am here. You need to let us go. 
I ran those people away with threats of stalking earlier this afternoon, smiled Burmer. No one is following us. No one knows that you are here. What should we do with them? Obviously, they've seen us marking the ballots, added Jefferson. You just couldn't leave it alone, could you, sighed Boggs. You put Detective Armand in prison, I retorted. I had to get involved. Perhaps you should have picked a different town, one where the citizens aren't as close or concerned with each other's welfare. Maybe, nodded Boggs. Or maybe Burmer can just dispose of you and my problem is all taken care of. B gasped. You sound like a poorly written villain. I think we could arrange an accident in the rain, decided Burmer. Everyone would understand the unfortunate accident of a senior citizen driving through the storm and accidentally going off the embankment at the turn just outside of town. Killing us isn't going to change the fact that you're going to lose the election and go to jail, I told him. We have evidence the financial records of various departments in town have been tampered with and money is missing. You can't cover it up. Impossible, laughed Boggs. You're bluffing. I'm not, I said confidently. There are invoices which are forged. We have an entire accounting team looking at them, piecing together how much you have stolen. You're kidding, breathed Boggs in surprise. Which departments? casually asked Burmer. Does it matter? I asked, entirely uncertain why he had asked. It does, firmly stated Burmer as he pulled a gun out of the holster on his hip. He pointed it at B. Which departments did you find the records for? Parks and Recreation. I carefully stepped in front of B, the police department, and the town of Oaks Crossing. We have the financial records for those departments and can prove the embezzlement. Who has the records? Boggs wanted to know. What accounting team? George Kershaw and the accounting team who works for Topher Welland, who is a corporate lawyer, I explained. This is bad, a nervous Jefferson said. If this gets leaked out, we could be facing prison time. We need to do damage control, growled Boggs. Yeah, nodded Burner in agreement as he thought. Jefferson, get something to tie these two up with. What? Jefferson blinked in surprise. Do it, yelled Burmer. Go with the original idea, decided Boggs. Make it look like a car accident for these two. Then we can figure out how to make this work to our advantage. Wickham was embezzling. Towns was in on it, decided Burmer. So was the former chief of police. We caught them all. We will be the heroes. Jefferson held up a roll of duct tape. What do you mean you caught Slater? He will have to be prosecuted, nodded Boggs. It is unfortunate, but we all knew the risks. What about me? wondered Jefferson, becoming suspicious. They have the books from my department. Does that mean you're going to arrest me too? I can tell you right now, I'm not going to go down for this alone. I'll take both of you down with me. No, you won't said Burmer, as he turned, firing the gun. B shrieked, and Cookie lunged forward, biting Burmer in the leg. He kicked out at the dog, but Cookie evaded him. Run! I grabbed B by the arm and tugged hard on Cookie's leash, hoping to get away in the confusion. Stay right where you are! shouted Burmer. It was followed by a gunshot, and B froze automatically, making me stop as well. You can't shoot us, I reasoned as Burmer pointed the gun at us again. Not if we were supposed to be in a car accident. It wouldn't look right. How are you going to explain shooting Mr. Jefferson? wondered B. He resisted arrest, said Burmer flatly. He had a gun. It was unfortunate. Boggs looked down at Jefferson with a grimace. He would have ratted us out. How are you certain neither of you will rat the other one out? I wondered, playing for time. The minute your backs are turned, you could be throwing each other under the bus. Duct tape them, ordered Burmer. I'll see to the accident. We'll have to postpone the election, since I'll be arresting Whitcomb. Then I will be acting mayor of Oaks Crossing, declared Boggs as he grabbed the duct tape. He came forward, grabbing my hand. What have we here? A cell phone? Who were you calling, Ivy? I honestly didn't know who I had called. I just hoped someone would recognize what was happening and call for help. Or better yet, rally the troops and come. I stayed silent as he looked at the screen. Warren? Do you know a Warren? Boggs looked to Burmer. He is some rookie cop at the station, scoffed Burmer, wet behind the ears. Is he going to be a problem? questioned Boggs. No, decided Burmer. 
Tape their hands. Boggs ended the call and pocketed my phone. Put out your hands. B and I reluctantly complied, letting the councilman tape our wrists together. Vermer ushered us out into the back parking lot at gunpoint. The wind was picking up, starting to blow hard, and every so often a raindrop fell from the black sky. He pushed B into the back seat of her car. Open the trunk. Why? I asked. I took out B's keys and deliberately fumbled, then dropped them. Oops. Pick them up, an impatient Burmer said. I reached down for the keys, scanning the area for a storm drain to throw them down as Burmer hit the button to open the trunk. Unfortunately, the lot was just pavement. Hey, you can't do that, I protested as Burmer grabbed Cookie and Cupcake by their harnesses, putting them into the trunk of the car. Get in the car, Burmer ordered as he shut the truck lid on the two barking dogs. It won't make any sense if my dogs are in the trunk of the car. I would never put them there, and everyone knows it. I slid behind the wheel. Anyone who sees the accent scene is going to know that. I own the police force, Burmer reminded me. Where your mutts are won't be a concern. He sat in the back seat next to B, holding her at gunpoint. Drive. Boggs will follow us. I need my hands untied, I told him, trying to insert the key with trembling hands. It's not going to happen, grunted Burmer. Drive nice and slow. I'll tell you where to stop. I knew where he was thinking of taking us. There was a steep embankment just outside of town. The road had no guardrails, and it would be easy enough for a vehicle to go off the roadway in bad weather. A wind gust blew at the car, shoving it over the yellow line, and we weren't even out at Oaks Crossing yet. Burmer, you don't have to kill us, B spoke up. We're just two silly women. Who's going to listen to us? Burmer had an unamused laugh. Face it, this is the end of the line for you both. I was going to have to wreck B's car, I decided. Better to hit something and thwart Burmer's plan than to go flying down into a gully and not even have a chance at living. I was giving myself a pet talk to work up the nerve to hit a tree or maybe the Oaks Crossing sign as we were leaving town, when a huge burst of wind tore off the crafty corner sign and it careened into the hood of the car. I hit the brakes. Oh, my word! The sign was embedded in the metal of the car hood, sticking up and blocking my view. Go outside and pull it out of the car, growled Burmer. Are you kidding me? I squeaked as the gun pressed against my shoulder. Go, he roared. I can't. I burst into tears, sobbing. My hands are tied. I have a broken ankle. The wind is too strong. The sign is too heavy for me. For pity's sake, Burmer growled. He got out of the vehicle and fought against the wind, trying to get the sign out of the hood of the car. Hold on, B. I immediately sobered and put the car in reverse. Flooring the gas pedal, I tried my best to steer while looking at my mirrors. I will lock the doors, gasped B as she undid her seatbelt. He's not getting back in. You should wear your seatbelt, I admonished as the rain suddenly let loose from the sky, coming down in torrents. I'm not very good at reversing even with two hands not duct taped together. In fact, I could barely even see with the street lights shining. The rain was coming down so hard. The wind buffeted at us again, and that was when the car ran over someone's recycling box, which hadn't been properly stowed away before the wind flung it around. The old Buick lurched at a funny ankle as it hit the hard plastic, then stopped, a back wheel up in the air, tire spinning. "'Oh, dear,' murmured B as the flashing lights of a cop car pulled up behind us. B hadn't had time to lock my door, and so it was whipped open, a flashlight shining into my face as I held my taped hands up in surrender. "'Don't shoot!' I cried. "'Please!' Ivy? It was Warren from the police department who opened the door to B's car. After cutting our duct tape bonds and rescuing Cupcake and Cookie from the trunk of the car, he hustled us to the nearby coffee shop that was still open to sit out the storm. Where's Burmer? asked Warren. I don't know. I motioned up the street. We left him part way up the road. Boggs was supposed to be behind us in his car, but I didn't see him. Maybe he got lost in all the rain. We caught Boggs at the community center, explained Warren before he called in Burmer's suspected location over his radio. Is that wise? I questioned. What about the police officers who are with Burmer? The state police are in charge now, explained Warren. I'm in contact with a couple of state troopers to try to get them to investigate what's happening here in Oaks Crossing. When you called and I knew you were in danger, I turned it into a conference call with the state police. With everything Burmer and Boggs said, plus the attempted murder of Mr. Jefferson. We can put them behind bars for a long time. 
"'Jefferson isn't dead?' the surprise would be wondered. "'He's very lucky,' said Warren. "'Or unlucky, if you remember he will be going to jail as well. "'We also have the financial records, "'which prove they were embezzling funds from the town,' I informed him. "'And they were going to fix the election so they could win.' "'I think all their names are about to be pulled from the ballots,' "'grinned Warren in satisfaction. "'When will Luca be released?' I asked as a clap of thunder shook the air. "'It might take a couple of days,' replied Warren. "'Once the evidence is processed and the state troopers realize it was Burmer "'and not Detective Armand who messed around with police department finances, "'they'll let him go.' "'I nodded, relieved at his assurances. "'It's over, then.' B wrapped an arm around me. "'I leaned on her, hugging Cupcake and Cookie to me. Chapter 18 The next day the townspeople of Oaks Crossing came out to survey the damage the storm had wrought. Some houses were missing shingles, some businesses were missing signs, and a few trees had taken out some hydro lines, creating power outages. At the Happy Camper Resort the entire kayak shack was gone, blown out to the lake. Fortunately, that was the extent of the damage Ivy could see beyond some branches down. All the campers and tenters were okay perhaps a little soaked through, but otherwise okay. The new roofs held up, and the swimming pool was full. Overall, they hadn't fared that bad. I'm sorry it didn't work out with Mary, I commented to Topher as I helped load his gear in the rental car. I'm okay with it, nodded Topher as he stuffed his sleeping bag into the trunk of the car. She was a nice person, but there wasn't any spark. I'm going to miss you, I mentioned. I fully intend to come back for next year's reunion with the guys. He did offer the family discount, remembered Topher with a grin. You have Ben's number to use if there are any more glitches with the booking program? I do, I nodded. Thank you again for all your help. When does the boyfriend get out of prison? he asked. I laughed. He's not my boyfriend, at least not formally yet. Luke is supposed to be released this afternoon with all charges dropped. Good. I'm glad for you, Topher shut the trunk. Can I have a hug goodbye? Of course. I reached out to give him a hug. You take care of yourself. Topher released me and with a wave got into the car. Soon enough he was driving out of sight. It's too bad he and Mary didn't hit it off, frowned Thelma as she came over. I wonder why it didn't work out. I think Mary has her heart set on James Carmichael, I casually mentioned. Thelma's eyes lit up and George shook his head. No interfering. "'Just need a little push,' murmured Thelma with a twinkle. "'No.' George rolled his eyes and wrapped an arm around Thelma's shoulders. "'We will see you at the celebration, Ivy.' <laughs> "'See you then,' I agreed. Checking my watch, I saw I was running a little late. Warren and the state troopers had found Burmer, who insisted B and I had tried to run him over. Fortunately, with having heard Burmer's plan to kill us over the phone, the state troopers weren't believing him. Topher, George, and the accountants from Topher's law firm had found the falsified invoices easily since they now knew what they were looking for. They gave over all the evidence and their conclusions to the investigators who put the entire Oaks Crossings police force on suspension until the investigation was complete. The election was also postponed until further notice, much to the relief of Mayor Whitcomb, who apologized for not cooperating with me since Burmer had threatened his family. Salter was also taken in for questioning. It was expected charges would be laid soon in the case. James Carmichael had nailed the number on the head. In just under two years, it was suspected the five men had stolen just under five million dollars from Oaks Crossing. Each of the five men involved had added an unearned million dollars to their bank accounts. Grabbing my purse and keys, I dropped Cookie and Cupcake off at the office with Conrad, who was squinting at the computer as he took a reservation by phone. He gave me a thumbs up, and I waved. Getting into the SUV, I was headed out of the campground when I received a call from Tawny Tilbury. I debated answering as I didn't want to be any later than I already was, yet I decided I owed Tawny for the many things she had done for me. Fortunately, Luca had Bluetooth and my phone was already connected to a system for hands-free driving. I hoped Tawny was going to ask a simple question for the upcoming celebration in town for Luca's return. "'Hi, Tawny,' I smiled as I answered. "'Oh, dear,' replied Tawny. "'Ivy, could you come over? I will be just a moment. I know I'm asking a lot for the day Luca is supposed to return, but I know you will understand exactly how to deal with this.' "'What is it, Tawny?' I asked. "'Are you certain it can't wait?' "'Winifred is in trouble,' 
Tawny's trembling voice came over the phone. I can't get at her. Please, would you come? The poor cat is trapped. I sighed. I knew I would be upset if something were to happen to Cookie or Cupcake. Glancing at my watch, I knew I was going to be late. Okay, I will be right there. Thank you, gushed Tawny. I knew you were just the person to call. Changing my direction, I headed into Oaks Crossing and made my way to Tawny Tilbury's home. Driving into her laneway, I shut off the SUV and hopped out carefully. Tawny? I asked as I pressed on her doorbell. There was no answer, so I knocked loudly. Dear! "'I'm in the backyard,' called Tawny from the side of the house. "'I suppose I should have told you when you were on the phone.' I quickly joined her as she headed around the side yard to the back. "'You said something about Winnie being trapped. Is she okay?' I knew just how much Tawny valued her prize-winning Persian cat, Winifred. She loved the house cat and would be devastated if anything happened to her pet. "'Winnie? Oh, Winnie is perfectly fine, dear,' Tawny blinked at me with owlish eyes. I frowned, wondering if Tawny's mind was slipping. You said on the phone there was something wrong with Winifred. I think you said she was trapped. I lied, smiled Tawny. What? Why? I looked at her in disappointment and some confusion. I don't understand. I thought I should save you the trip up to the prison, chirped Tawny. It wouldn't be very nice of me to let you drive all the way to the prison to pick up Luca when he isn't there. What do you mean he isn't there? Now I really was concerned for her well-being. I was told when his release was. Warren came by and got me a little early, a male voice said. I thought I would surprise you and get you to myself for a few hours before we have to meet up with everyone in town. I turned around to see Luca smiling at me. For a moment I was completely speechless. I think I will get some tea and biscuits, decided Tawny, tactfully retreating to her home. Surprised? asked Luca, holding out a hand. Very, I managed, taking his hand and letting him draw me into a hug. I closed my eyes, leaning against him, and just enjoyed knowing that he was safe. Okay, sighed Luca, you can say it. I grinned, tilting my head back. I told you so. I told you all the wonderful people in the community of Oaks Crossing would help me get you out of that awful prison. I absolutely told you so, and you should have had more faith in me. Are you done? He quirked an eyebrow thought about it for a moment before shaking my head. Not likely. Luca nodded. Then how about we make a trade? What sort of trade? I asked suspiciously, still appreciating being in his arms. You can have one more I told you so, and I will take you on a real first date, bargained Luca. I shook my head. I think we would have a first date anyways, whether or not I gave up my I told you so rights. True, Luca said thoughtfully. How about you giving up the I told you so, because I have been offered the position of chief of police, and I can on occasion, if the circumstances warrant it, perhaps consult with you for your opinion on cases? I bit my lower lip. I would never be able to say I told you so again, not even a variation of it? No, resolutely replied Luca. Are you taking the position? I questioned. I think I'd better take the job, dryly stated Luca. Considering how the department has been run, I can see the need to improve things. Mm, deal, I smiled happily. We had a kiss to seal the bargain, which led to more kisses. Then we reluctantly stopped when Tawny called that tea was ready. We should have tea with her, noted Luca. You secretly do like old people, I remarked as we slowly made our way up to the house. Some day... We will be old people, he commented in return. We could live in the campground, I mused, teach the grandkids how to bake, fish, dive off the dock, and go kayaking. You think we're going to be together that long? Luca opened the door for me, a twitch of his lips telling me he was amused by my ramblings. Why not? I shrugged with a grin. It could happen. There will be a new kayak shack, though. The old one blew over in the storm last night. "'Please don't tell me you found a body under the floorboards,' sighed Luca as he followed me into Tawny Tulberry's kitchen. "'Why would you think I would find a dead body under the floorboards?' I huffed. "'You seem to find things,' he mentioned dryly, "'or they find you.' "'Well, I haven't checked under the floorboards yet,' I murmured, thinking about the possibility. "'There could be buried treasure under there instead. That would be nice. Then I would have all the funds I need to finish fixing the campground.' I thought the campground was doing well, inserted Tawny as she poured the tea. 
It is, I nodded. Business has been picking up, and if we stay in budget, we should easily make it to next season, where I can really start putting things back into rights with the seasonal income. Luca watched me as he took a biscuit. Yet you still want to check under the kayak shack now. You know I do, I laughed. You put the idea in my head, and now I want to know what might be there, don't you? Tomorrow, said Luca firmly, taking my hand in his. We will look tomorrow. Let's just enjoy today. Thank you for listening to Barbecue Blunder. You can find the ebooks, paperbacks, and audiobooks on Amazon. Josephine Bindma also has other books there as well, with romance and cozy mystery. Happy listening!